Welcome to PanOS 8. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at PanOS 8. I want you to become familiar with the web user interface. So when it comes to creating those rules, those objects, applying your policy, you're going to know exactly what you're going to be looking for as far as administration and management goes. We're also going to be taking a look at the ACC or Application Command Center tab as well as the Monitor tab. Those two tabs will provide you visibility onto your firewall traffic. You need to know what's going on on your network, right? It's not just setting up a policy and forgetting about it. You need to see what's actually being applied to, how the user traffic is actually looking from the firewall standpoint. So those two tabs are going to be very important to understand that you're properly monitoring your firewall the, and you're enforcing the rules that you just configured. I'm going to do a lot of troubleshooting and don't worry, we're going to go in covering those two topics. Those are very big topics because most of the environment that I've been working with, they set and forget. And I want to make clear to everyone that is listening to this video that security is not set and forget. Security, it's a constant improvement. You never set something and forget about it. So that's why those two tabs, ACC and monitoring, are going to be very important. Okay, so let's get started. In this video, we're going to start looking at the PanOS web user interface. We're going to be discussing the object tab, the policy tab, the network tab, and the device tab. Each one will have a specific function and specific settings. So you need to become familiar with all those sections so you can properly manage and configure your Palo Alto firewall. Okay, so let's take a look at the first tab. We're going to go into the object tab. and the object tab, we're going to take a look at the addresses, the services, and the object groups as one of the biggest, I would say, most important items on that particular tab that you're going to be configuring on a day-to-day -day basis. Alrighty, let's get started. Let's go ahead and log into the unit. I just deployed this as a brand new Palo Alto virtual machine. We're just going to type our username and password, and it's configured by default. Once you log in onto the firewall, you're going to see a message saying that you got to change that admin credential, right? And make sure that you do. Please do yourself a favor and change that admin password. I'm just going to go ahead and log in. Once we log in onto the firewall, we're going to be presented with the dashboard. On the dashboard, you're going to start seeing general status on your unit as far as CPU usage, memory usage information about their management interface, what version it's the firewall running, as well as system logs. So you are going to have visibility into this platform. But don't worry, we're going to learn this in another section. Next on, let's go ahead and move into objects. In the objects tab, we're going to have the addresses, and this is where you're going to have to configure those addresses in order to assign them to your respective security policies. In your addresses, you're going to be able to add IP addresses, individual IP addresses, or most commonly known as host addresses, subnets, and ranges of IPs. So with that said, you're going to have the option to create either multiple individual IP addresses and nest them onto groups. So you have the option to create individual objects and then add an object group and then nest every single address object inside of that. Same with services. So if you have a individual ports, but you want to classify it as a set of ports based on your application and your environment. So if you have a custom application that only talks on those ports, you create those individual service objects and then you create a group and nest everything inside there. We also have the security profiles. On the security profiles, you're going to be able to configure the next generation firewall features. So if, for example, you want to have your traffic inspected for antivirus, you just create a security profile right there, and then you attach that to your policies. All right, let's go ahead and continue exploring PanOS. Let's click on network. In the network, we're going to be able to configure the interfaces. Your layer two interfaces, layer three interfaces, assigning IP addresses to those interfaces, this is where you're going to be able to configure it. Same with zones, inside, outside zone, virtual router. So where you're going to be adding your static routes or turning on the BGP or SPF as your dynamic routing protocol if you're using it, this is where you're going to be configuring it. Same with uh, tunneling. So all your IPsec tunnels are going to be configuring from this particular session. Same with uh, global protect. So global protect, this is 
Palo Alto's SSL VPN service. So all of your users are going to use Global Protect to connect firewall. Okay, so moving on, let's click on device. Let's take a look at the device tab. On the device tab, you're going to have the management and operation settings on your Palo Alto firewall. You're going to have the option to configure high availability. If you want to cluster two Palo Alto firewalls into a cluster, this is where you're going to be configuring that. On the setup tab, you're going to configure your management interface. So the interface that we're using to administer this firewall, this is where you're going to be configuring that. In operations, you're going to do your normal reboot and shutdown of the device. So you need to properly or gracefully shut down your Palo Alto firewall. Basically, in the device tab, you're going to have also the option of doing your admin accounts. So if you want to provision admin accounts, you are going to be able to do it from this section. In the user identification tab, this is where we are going to connect Active Directory to your Palo Alto firewall. So if you want to have user-based authentication from directory service, this is where you're going to be configuring that. Or if you have local users that are not necessarily part of AD, you can create local user accounts in this particular session in the local users tab. Also, this Palo Alto firewall, when it comes to dynamic updates, this is where you're going to be executing those dynamic updates onto your unit. Uh, so the device tab is mostly composed of all the management operation settings on your Palo Alto appliance. Alrighty, let's go ahead and move on. Uh, let's take a look at the policies tab. In the policy section on your Palo Alto, this is where you're going to be configuring the security rules, the NAT rules. So, for example, if you need to translate from the outside to the inside, inside to outside addressing, this is where you're going to be doing that. Same with security policies. We want to allow traffic from one zone to another zone. This is where you're going to be configuring that rule. So, this section is very important, and we're going to go deep into covering every single setting. So moving on, let's take a look at the two final sessions for this video, the ACC tab or Application Command Center tab, as well as the Monitoring tab. We're going to take a look at each one individually. When we click on the ACC tab, you're going to be presented with a real-time application-based monitoring. Your firewall will be able to show you any suspicious activity that has been sourced from a specific application on your firewall. Okay, so let's click on Monitor. In the Monitor tab, you're going to be presented with options to see how your firewall is analyzing, inspecting, and monitoring that traffic. You're going to be able to tell traffic that is sourced to zone, bound from a source zone, for example, to a destination zone. From here, you're going to be able to tell a specific user is going where he's not supposed to be going, all of that from this particular section. In this video, we're going to take a look at the dashboard and all the visibility that it can offer to us while managing our Palo Alto firewall. It provides general information about your firewall, such as the management IP, the software version on the firewall that is currently running, if it had performed recent updates, and user activity. So your administrators, if you have multiple administrators on the, your staff that are managing your Palo Alto or your firewall environment, from the dashboard, you're going to see that login activity and also if any configuration changes were performed. So it's very powerful and we're going to go on to all those details in this video. Our topics for this video are going to be, number one, we're going to customize the dashboard experience. So when you log in onto your Palo Alto, you're going to see a couple of widgets that are set by default. So maybe you don't need them. You can actually remove them and you can tweak and move and customize that dashboard to whatever your preference is. So we're going to go through that. We're also going to look at how login activity per user looks like from the dashboard. And also we're going to understand how to interpret those system log events. So that's very important for you to understand. And finally, we're going to take a look at the widgets. We have some cool options that you can add and, you know, to keep customizing that dashboard. So those will be the main topics that we're going to be discussing in this video. So let's go ahead and get started. Once you log in onto your Palo Alto, you're going to be presented with the dashboard. And as I mentioned, the dashboard is very customizable. For example, if you don't want to take a look at your data logs from the dashboard, you can just simply click here and remove that. If you would like to have the config logs 
presented right in the middle. We're just going to click this and move around so you can rearrange your objects. And like I said, you can customize this to whatever your needs are. Say, for example, you want to make sure that the login admin activity is presented on your far left corner. We just move this and we're set. So again, it's very, very customizable and easy to work with. Let's go ahead and uh, let's see how that user login activity looks like in real time. I'm going to create two admin accounts. I'm just going to go real quick into device administrators. I'm going to click add admin one as the name. Just set a default password for now. I'm going to make sure that he's a super user. I'm going to click OK. Let's add another one. Admin 2. On your Palo Alto, every time that you do a change, you got to commit. Make sure that you remember that because it's not going to take effect. Every time that you make a change, you have to commit those changes. So let's click on commit. And once we finish, we're going to use one of those admin accounts. We're going to log in onto the firewall and we're going to make a change. And then we're going to take a look at how the dashboard shows us that login information. So the changes are committed. Let's go ahead and uh, go real quick. Let's click log out. Let's go ahead and use that admin account. Okay, I'm logging in as that new admin. Once I'm on the dashboard, I should be able to see a login session being recorded on the logs. And once you log in as a new user, you're going to be presented with that, do you know, welcome screen. And sure enough, now I have the new admin account presented onto the dashboard as a log in timestamp. Let's go ahead and create an address object and we're going to call it dashboard test. And this will be a summit address to a slash 24 on 10, 10, 0, 0. Uh, click OK. And remember what we have to do in order to make it apply and to make it effective. Let's go ahead and click commit. Commit once more. So now I'm going to show you what that log admin has just performed from a configuration standpoint by taking a look at the config log. Click back onto the dashboard. And sure enough. So if you take a look here on your config logs, and you know what? We now know that we can move this around. So let's go ahead and put it on the left side and let's take a look at that real quick. So as the default admin account, I just created admin one. I created admin two and guess what? This admin one that I just created, created an address object into the default virtual system, which is virtual system one. And I will be covering what virtual systems are on a separate video. Here it goes. My dashboard dash test address object. It was created around this time. Then after that, admin one just performed a commit action, which basically sets the configuration active onto the firewall. Pretty cool, huh? So that gives you an idea of how flexible it's the dashboard and when it comes to taking a look at the monitoring activity on your firewall. Let's go ahead and uh, let's take a look at the widgets. The widgets are actually very cool. And I haven't told you, everyone that is watching this video, I'm actually running a cluster, Active Active Palo Alto cluster here. And there's a cool widget that allows you to see that cluster status in real time. So once you are on the dashboard, click widgets, system, and then you have the high availability widget. Let's go ahead and click that. And now we're going to know that we have an active, active, highly available cluster already working on this Palo Alto setup. And just for convenience, I have Palo Alto 2. So this is Palo Alto 1, which is my active primary cluster member and uh, PA2 as my standby. So how do I know that this guy is my standby? Again, widgets, system, high availability. And here we are, active secondary. So you see the dashboard, it's uh, very powerful. And uh, you want to play with your own Palo Alto and make sure that you understand this because it's going to be your best friend every time that you need to troubleshoot a firewall issue. So right now, as I mentioned, I have a highly available active cluster. And I can see that between my two Palo Altos, I have a synchronized running config. All my next generation firewall features are matching the version across the two units. So everything is showing here as green. Same with my HA ports. And, and we're going to have a separate video talking just of how HA works. And we're going to set this from the ground up. So don't worry, guys. We're going to touch this on a separate video. 
So we're going to know that all those HA ports are up and running. Um, and, and then we want to take a look at what will happen if I were to restart one of my Palo Alto members. So let's go ahead and do a restart of PAO2, which is this one. And in order for you to do a restart, you got to click device, operations under setup, reboot device, and we're going to hit yes. And right now we're just rebooting PAO2. I'm going to go back onto PAO1, and we should be able to see that it helps lost communication with PAO2. So let's go ahead and wait a couple of seconds. And there you go. Right now, my cluster of two Palo Altos, the second unit, because I just invoked a restart on PA1 uh, in the dashboard, I can see that the second unit has lost communication onto the cluster. If we take a look at the system logs and we refresh, Sure enough, we can see that um, the HA connectivity just went down. Uh, so again, a very powerful tool when it, when it comes to troubleshooting. So you want to make sure that you become very familiar with it. Finally, we're going to take a look at very beneficial widget, which is the interfaces. So if we go on to, again, widgets, systems, interfaces, in this widget, I'm going to be able to see in real time what's the status of your physical interfaces on your Palo Alto. And again, if your Palo Alto is hosted at a remote data center, how do you know that the interfaces are actually up or not? This is the way to do it. You add a widget. Again, we went on two widgets, system, and then we select interfaces. And you're going to be able to tell that if any interface for some reason went down, you're going to see this in red. Gray means that it's basically disabled or it's currently down. So you're going to know that the PA you know, has an issue on a specific interface by just adding the widget onto your dashboard. Alrighty, so there you have it. We went into the dashboard and we saw how to customize the dashboard, how to move your widgets around, how to add widgets, how will system log events will look like, and finally how to rearrange things on the dashboard so it looks uh, the way you want it to. So that basically in a nutshell uh, gives you a good detail of how the dashboard interaction to the user is going to be. In our previous videos, uh, we took a look at the web user interface in PanOS 8. This video, we're going to be focusing uh, our attention into the console. Like any uh, network device, you at some point we will be using the console to perform some basic troubleshooting and configurations that you might not be able to perform out of the GUI. We are also reviewing the request, show, and test actions in PanOS 8 console. This will provide you the tools that you need if, for some reason, through the GUI, you're not able to resolve an issue, and you need to do some deep dive debugging onto your appliance. So it's a very important topic that we need to take a look and understand so we can efficiently manage our firewall. I'm a firm believer in console-based administration of network devices, but when it comes to firewalls, because you have so many objects, so many rules, so many settings, it can become a little bit cumbersome and complex to maintain through the console. And thankfully, Palo Alto's PanOS 8 web user interface is very, very intuitive. It's very summarized. It's well-structured. It's not like other uh, platforms that I work with where you basically need to travel through the whole GUI in order to make a simple object. Palo Alto's web user interface is well-structured, but still, there's cases where you're going to need assistance from the console. For example, you have a site-to-site -site tunnel that is having issues, and you might need to bounce it, meaning that you got to you know, bring it down, bring it up. You can go through the web user interface and you know, right-click and disable and re-enable, but you're better off going through the console and doing a test. And we're going to see what test does and uh, how it can help us perform troubleshooting more easy than just doing it from the web user interface. We're also going to take a look at the request, which is basically telling the Palo Alto, hey, we need to do this function. We need to execute, for example, a system reboot. That will be a request that will be sent through the Palo Alto console. We're also going to take a look at the show commands. If you're already familiar with other network platforms, the show commands are basically to take a look at any information that you might need. And it's very straightforward to do it through the console. In PanOS 8 console, we need to get familiar with the CLI structure. And it's basically the same thing as any other network device. You have the action, you have the section that that action has been applied to, and you have the element inside the section that you're going to apply the action to. 
You got that? <laughs> so very simple, action, section, element. Action, in this case, we have show, section, we have system, and element. What do we want to see from the show standpoint? It's going to be the system information. So it's very straightforward, same like any other or most network devices, structure like that. So you have first the action, then the section, and then finally the element. So in particular, we're going to take a look at show. How can show commands will help us to find information that we need inside the firewall and request. So we're going to instruct the Palo Alto to perform a command execution by using our function, which is in this case, it's going to be request. Okay, so let's take a look at the console. Let's pull this in and log in our credentials. Once you log in, and in my case, I'm actually console into Palo Alto PA01 in my HA cluster. As my previous video, we were working on an HA cluster, so I am basically doing an SSH connection onto my management IP, which in this case is 47. So that's why you're going to see if your console session is going onto a cluster member, you're going to see next to your username, right? This will be your username at host name of your firewall and then member the firewall in this case we're connected to the active primary so let's take a look at doing some show commands for example uh, we talked about doing show system and then you can press the question mark and you're going to get a sub menu of elements so you can select from here in my case if i want to see the information of my system i just type info i'll press enter and I basically have exactly the same thing as I have on my dashboard in the general information tab. So I have my management IP. I got my default gateway. I got my host name. If I press the space bar, I can continue seeing what do I have. So it shows that I'm running A.1. So just for you to see that we can retrieve stuff that we know that is on the web interface, but we also can retrieve items that are not shown on the web user interface. So again, show commands are very useful when you're trying to find something that you're not able to find on the GUI. Chances are I'll have to hidden that information in the console. So if we press show and then we want to see what session we want to show information for, let's take a look at high availability. I can also just do a copy and paste because I love copy and pasting. So we'll right click, show availability, and sure, I need an element. So we're going to press the space bar, press question mark, and we're going to see what element do we want to do a show status of. Let's take a look at the state. So let's select this, paste, and it's telling me that I am currently active active and I am the active primary unit of this cluster, and this was retrieved for the last six hours I've been into that state. I can also, again, take a look at options that you might not see from the high availability dashboard widget, but you can see through the console more easily. I can find this information out of the HA settings inside the device tab, but again, as you saw, it's more efficient to do it through the console. You'll get that information faster if you're troubleshooting something and you need that information right away. So that's why it's very important to get familiar with the console. Okay, so now that I show you the show command, again, you definitely need to practice this. You can play with all show options that you have on the, on the console. You definitely need to practice with all show commands that you have. We're going to talk also doing a request. So if we have case for a firewall that, you know, for some reason, the web user interface is not responding. And I've been into cases where Palo Alto's, not on A.1, but pre A versions, the web user interface was crashed. So I was not able to get into the web user interface. So for example, a former reboot, if you have an HA active active or active standby environment, you can gracefully shut it down without impacting because services will fail over onto the secondary or standby unit. So let's take a look at doing a restart. So we were previously logged in into the console on my active primary unit. We're going to go ahead and bring the console on PAO2 and we're going to use the command request to request a restart of the secondary unit. And then we're going to watch on the primary unit how that goes. Let's go ahead and uh, bring the console for PAO2. I'm going to go ahead and maximize my console session here. And we're going to do a request, restart, system, and we press enter. Right now, my command is actually telling me or advising me that I will be disconnected from the session after I invoke the restart. And obviously, that will be the case. Let's hit yes. 
and right now PAO2 will be restarting. If we go back onto PAO1 and we can see the message here, the system is going down for a reboot. We can go ahead on PAO1. Let me bring PAO1 back. Let's go ahead and ping the host. And we're going to ping the management interface of PAO2 to confirm when, once it's back up. Right now it's pinging, but you should be able to see that in a few seconds, PAO2, I should say, is going to basically drop out of the network. So once it's down, we should be able to check high availability and confirm the state. Okay, so now we can see that there is no more responses from my ICMP. In this case, I'm doing a ping request to PAO2, so we can see that the console is no longer showing an active status. So let's go ahead and uh, check the high availability by doing the show high availability state command. We hit control C, show high availability state. And sure enough, uh, we can see here that we're running active active. Active primary, this is the one that we're logged in right now. We'll press the space bar and sure enough, we have a heartbeat ping failure on the second unit that is currently being restarted. So that gives you an idea of how to take advantage of the request and show by doing a simple line command syntax and you should be able to perform some management functions. Okay, moving on to our final function, we're gonna take a look at test. Test is a great way to perform some troubleshooting and verification in case you're seeing some issues in your firewall environment. Say for example, you created a NAT rule but you want to make sure that it's working properly. With test, we can uh, to a protocol to confirm that it's able to connect to. For example, if you have a web server sitting on your DMZ and you're opening port 80 to the outside, with test, I can confirm that I'm able to hit that port because the NAT rule is in place and it's allowing the traffic as it goes through. In my case, with this particular model, I'm going to be showing the demonstration. I don't have a NAT rule because that's going to be discussed in a separate session. But we can do the same test as if we were just probing any internet website. So let's go ahead and uh, perform the test. I'm going to type test, HTTP, server, and then we'll hit question mark. And you have the option to add the address or port if you have a custom port. In our case, let's add the address and let's say Google, right? And we're going to probe against the protocol HTTPS. So we'll type HTTPS. And then sure enough, because this file was able to talk to the outside, I was able to confirm that I have reachability to 443, which is HTTPS going to Google. This will be the same case if you were to point to an internal server on your environment or a resource that is open on the DMZ. You can use the test function to perform that. So you can test and make sure that it's working correctly if you're seeing troubleshooting. So you can isolate the firewall to be one of the possible causes. Also, we can use test to bounce a site to site tunnel, as I mentioned in the beginning of this video. So I'm going to show you real quick how to do that. I created a test site to site object in the firewall, but I don't actually have connectivity. I'm just going to show you how it's done. Let's go ahead and test, and we're going to type VPN. Then we're going to bounce phase one. So it's going to be the IKE. SA, and then we're going to select our gateway. And then once we press the question mark, you're going to be presented with all the gateways that are configured on your firewall. And in this case, I created one just for demonstration purposes. I'm just going to copy this, I'm going to paste it. And then by doing that, Palo Alto basically does a initiation in phase one. In this case, is the key negotiation. Let's go ahead and uh, do the same for IPsec. Go ahead and uh, just delete this. And in this case, we're going to do IPsec. And then we're going to select the tunnel. And then the packet IPsec, which is our demo tunnel. Copy the whole thing. And press Enter. And that basically allows you to troubleshoot connectivity by just doing this test command, which is very handy. And it saves a lot of headache at the long run if you're having issues with a tunnel not coming up or not establishing connectivity you can confirm that the tunnel is actually active or not this video we will take a look at our palo alto firewall management overview setting out our management interface is sometimes a task that is overlooked in not just firewall but other network appliances i've had the opportunity to implement palo alto's 
in many, many network environments. And one issue that I came across every time, or I would say most of the time that I've been performing this type of task, it's seeing that the management interface was pretty much reachable from all across the network. I had the opportunity to work on an environment that it was actually enabled from the guest Wi-Fi. Can you believe that? Anyway, we're going to be discussing how can you prevent that by creating management profiles and assigning them to the right interfaces. And we also will take a look at the management interface. The management interface is not only just to manage the firewall, it performs much more than that. So we will take a look at the management interface on all Palo Altos, as well as setting up local administrators and assigning rights by adding them to the respective administrator groups. Okay, so let's take a look at that out of band management interface and let's see where the actual location is going to be on most Palo Alto firewalls. Okay, so you're currently looking at two Palo Alto front panels. We got a PA5260 and we also have a PA3250 down below here. I want to show you where that management interface is currently located. If we take a closer look at the PA5260, uh, you're going to see dedicated MGT. That's your management interface. On all Palo Altos, you're going to get a dedicated management interface. If we take a look at the 3250, so let's take a look at the 3250, you're going to see it right here. So every single Palo Alto will come with a dedicated management interface. If we take a look at the chassis version of the Palo Alto. In this case, we have a 7080, but most other chassis will basically have the management interface located on the same location, which in this case is going to be the supervisor blade. So let's take a closer look and you should be able to see it right here. There you go. That's your management interface. And this, again, this usually it's on the supervisor interface. So you're going to see the management interface on the supervisor module. Okay, so there you have it. We covered the management interface on the physical appliance itself. Let's take a look at the management profiles. Okay, so once we logged in onto our Palo Alto, we're going to click on network. We're going to go right below here, interface management. Click there and we're going to click add. There we're going to be presented with this window, which is basically the interface management profile. This is where we're going to create that profile. Real quick, we're going to see a couple of options that we're going to go through. Administrative management services. This is basically the type of port or servers that you're going to be allowing with this management profile. Usually I'll go HTTPS and SSH because those are secure sockets. So make sure that you have secure or not. Try to avoid telnet HTTP. Just go SSH and HTTPS. A network service, we can have a ping, meaning that if you want to monitor that interface for up and down with your monitoring tool, you must enable ping. HTTP OCSP, we can enable that. However, for this particular training, we're just going to focus on the basic management services and network services that we can enable on the interface that you're allocating this profile. SNMP is mostly needed environments. If you're probing using your management tool, a monitoring tool, you should definitely enable SNMP. If you were going to enable a captive portal or a specific splash page for anyone that hits that particular interface, this is where you're going to be enabling. If you want to have user ID based service attached to that interface, we are going to be enabling from here and we'll discuss this particular setting on an upcoming video. On your right, you're going to have the permitted IP address list. And if you remember on the beginning of the video, I was discussing that we had a customer that he basically, the whole firewall, he was able to hit the management interface pretty much everywhere on the network. So again, on the Palo Alto, you have flexibility of going very simple and configure a list of IP addresses or range of IP addresses or subnets that are allowed to hit those management ports. So in this case, if we have a particular subnet that we want to allocate, enable access to the HTTPS interface as well as the SSH, console access, we can do it through just adding the permitted IP list. So let's go ahead and click add. And in this case, I have a 10 network. So for example, it's a 10 slash 24. I'm going to add it here. Let's call it our first management. And by the way, I like naming my management profiles with the settings that I'm adding onto them. So I know 
that if I want to select uh, between multiple management profiles, I know exactly which one I'm going to select. I don't need to take a look at what type of setting will that management profile enable. So in my case, I'm going to do uh, MGT, which is management, and then we're going to label it HTTPS, SSH, which we enable SSH, ICMP, and SNMP. And that's it. So basically, once we select from our list of management profiles, if we have multiple profiles, by just looking at the name, we can know exactly which one we're going to be using based on the case. Let's click OK. And there you go. You have this one. We're going to go ahead and uh, apply it to an interface. So we're going to go to an interface. Let's select Ethernet 1 slash 1. And let's configure that to be a layer 3 interface. And uh, let's go ahead and assign a management profile. So once you change the interface type, and again, we're going to go into networking on a separate session. But just for this video, I would like to show you how basically it's done. Click on layer three, and then you can actually configure the IP addresses here and all the zone assignments and router per se. So let's go ahead and click advanced. And right here, you're going to be adding that management profile onto the interface. Click here, and there you go. We have our management profile, and we're going to apply it to that interface. And as part of our training, let's go ahead and uh, add an IP on this interface. So let's call it the 10.10.01.24. So there you go. So right now, with this management profile, on interface Ethernet 1 slash 1, we're going to be able to head 10.10.01 via HTTPS, SSH, we're going to be able to do ping tests or ping probing, which in this case, ICMP probing. And then we're going to be also able to do SNMP queries. So there you go. Once you make sure that you have that allocated, we're going to click OK. And final thing in order to make it active, commit. So basically, that's it. Once we have the management profile assigned to the interface, that's all you need. Uh, you're going to be able to access HTTPS management, SSH management by applying the management profile on that particular interface. Okay, so in our final topic of this video, we're going to take a look at local administrators and how can we delegate specific rights by creating administrator roles. In your network, you might have multiple people performing configuration changes and monitoring your network appliances. When it comes to firewalls, you definitely need to delegate the roles to the right individuals. And this is where we're going to be configuring admin roles to perform that. So let's go ahead and click on device. And right here on admin roles, this is where you're going to be configuring that. By default, you're going to see three um, default admin roles. So if you click the first one, you're going to see that this admin role profile, which is the audit admin, will have rights to perform logging monitoring function on the, on the firewall. So he's going to be able to log in, but only perform those specific functions. So anything that is enabled uh, showing a green check mark, it means that he's entitled or she's entitled to perform. Everything that is on X, it means that I am not allowing that with this particular profile. So anyone that you assign, a particular role profile, you're actually providing the rights for that particular user. So if we scroll down, you can see that is enabled for a, a global menu, which in this case is a device, but then right below, he's only allowed in the device tab to work on the lock settings. And inside the lock settings, he's only allowed to manage the lock. So if we go onto the drop down menu device, meaning that we're here on the device, lock settings, meaning that it's this particular section right here. And inside that lock setting, this audit admin profile is only allowed to manage the logs. So he's not able or she's not able to do any configuration whatsoever, just manage the logs. So again, you can see also he's um, he has or she has additional rights, but it's mostly a monitoring admin. So in this case, it's the audit admin. But if we click cancel, let's take a look at our second one, crypto admin. He will have also, she will have also the same kind of rights. But in this case, he's able to perform IPsec tunneling. So he's going to be able to perform or configure, I should say, IPsec tunnels. So anything that is related to the tunneling section and our network side, he will have access to that or she will have access to that particular section. So I just want to show you that you can be very granular when it comes to permissions, specific user accounts.
So let's go ahead and create a custom one, okay? I'll click on cancel. I'm going to click add. Let's create an account that the individual will only be able to perform network changes, but nothing else. So meaning that he or she will be able to click the network tab and configure everything inside the network tab, but nothing else. So let's go ahead and uh, set the name. I'm going to call it Network Admin. And let's allow it to go to the dashboard. We're going to allow this role profile to access ACC. Same with monitoring. Let's also make sure because he's a network admin, I don't want this individual to make any policy changes. So let's take that out. Same with objects. I'm not allowing you to make any changes on the object tab nor the policies tab. And then on the network, yes, we want to make sure that this individual, whoever gets assigned this role profile, he or she will be able to access the network tab and perform all those functions. So if we keep scrolling down, no, I don't want this profile to have access into the device settings. So let's remove that, remove the privacy setting. And yes, he will be able or she will be able to validate a configuration change. He or she will be able to save and commit let them be a global management for system alarm he or she will be able to perform changes on the global side come online uh we can delegate to be a device admin that's it nothing else because if we have a super user account he or she will be able to make all those changes are, are not allowed in the web ui he's going to be or she will be able to do that through the um, command line or we can just say, oh, you're just a device reader. So that's it. Just to do some show commands. And that's it. We don't want anything else. Click OK. OK. And now that we have that, we're going to go ahead and create an account so we can allocate that administration role onto it. Click on administrators, add. We're going to call this John Network Admin. We're going to add a password. And then we're going to make it a role based administrator. So by clicking role based, we're going to be able to use our admin role onto it. Click on role based. And then we're going to select that profile, network admin. Click OK. And finally, click commit. There you have it. Now, John, using that particular network account, he's going to be able to do network changes, and that's it. He's not going to be able to do anything but network changes. And that's how you delegate rights to your staff. So they, each individual will manage the firewall independently without, you know, not having conflicts or, or even worse, providing access to a section that a specific administrator should not be allowed to. Okay, everyone. So we just began section two. In section two, we're going to be looking at objects inside our Palo Alto firewall. They're there to be utilized. And uh, if you take a closer look at the picture that I'm showing, imagine yourselves getting a call at 2 a.m. in the morning. Oh, you got to love those calls. And seeing that some of your junior engineers, they put a policy on your firewall. And you as a senior security engineer will need to wake up at 2 a.m. in the morning because your Asia customers or your Asia team is not able to access the SQL server or the SQL server is not able to talk to your web server which is sitting on the DMC. You realize that your colleague put a policy day before and he did not document on his change request form what was the source IP nor what was the destination IP. You wake up at 2 a.m. in the morning after that nice phone call from the network operations center telling you that the SQL services for the web application are down. You log in onto the firewall and you take a look at that beautiful policy table and you will look like the picture on your right. Yes, you're going to be astonished because you will not know at 2 a.m. in the morning which one is the SQL server. Well, let me tell you, I've been there and I want you to know that you need to use address objects and group them using object groups. The reason why, if you are going to be waking up at 2 a.m. in the morning to troubleshoot something as 
convoluted as that policy table, I don't think you're going to have a very good day the next day. So this is what the section is for. For you to know how to take advantage of addresses and address group objects. So let's begin. Okay, three topics that we're going to be discussing in this video. Number one, creating address objects. We're going to create a couple of address objects. We're going to classify them properly. Uh, that IP will no longer be an unknown IP. We're going to use that to provide an identity. We're going to be organizing also those address objects with address groups. So if you have multiple devices that are related to the same application, you might want to create an address group and add all those address objects so you know that they are belonging to that particular group. And finally, we're going to look at limiting the human error and complexity thanks to using those address groups in our policies. Uh, what I mean by that is instead of you making a policy each time that you need to allow or restrict some traffic, you just need to add that particular IP into an object and add the object onto an existing rule that already has the group. So don't worry, we'll take a look at that and you're going to be understanding that in no time. Okay, the purpose of this video is for you to understand what are address objects and how can we take advantage of them on the Palo Alto firewall. This is the scenario that we're seeing right here. We have three servers on the inside. Those are the IPs of those servers on the inside. And we got three servers sitting on the DMC. Those will be our wet front end servers. We have a customer. This customer has an e-commerce website. And this website, it's sitting on those three servers that are listening for outside requests. Those three servers are actually reaching those three inside servers, which are the application servers. So the web server needs to communicate to the application server so the data can be transmitted back and forth to the customer. So you get that good old call at 2 a.m. in the morning and you got woken up because those web servers are down. The website is actually loading, but they cannot send and receive any application input. So the user is trying to input some data. The servers are giving out a 404 error, meaning that they cannot communicate to the inside. And you're like at 2 a.m. in the morning, you have no idea what or where or why those server IPs are there. You have no idea what's the purpose of them. And you also don't have any idea of what those IPs are that are configured on that rule as well. So this is where address objects are going to come into play. Those address objects are going to let you sleep a little bit more than two hours when you get that phone call at 2 a.m. in the morning. Let's begin the session by labeling each one. So we made some calls last night and we were able to identify what those IPs are. And sure enough, this will be the app one server. This will be the app two server. And finally, let me expand this a little bit. Okay. And finally, and we finally have the app three server. So now we know that those are the application servers for our e-commerce website. Let's go ahead and uh, move this a little bit. Okay, so we have app one, app two, and app three. Okay, now we have the three DMC web servers. We also know that each one is web one, web two, and web three. Okay, I just label our application servers because we at first didn't know what those IPs were for, but now we know that those are the application servers and those are the web servers for our e-commerce website. Now we need to configure those address objects and we're going to be allocating the IP address for each relevant object into the specific one. We're going to be allocating the individual IP on the application server address object. Same with the DMC. So let's continue with that. Okay, we are in the Palo Alto and we're gonna go ahead and click objects. Now we're clicking addresses. We're gonna click add. And let's go ahead and add that first server. App one, and let's get that IP address so we can add it here. Okay, so for app one, we have the 10, 211, 43, 44. Let's go ahead and add that IP into the object. I'm gonna copy this and let's paste it here okay so when you're working with address objects you have the flexibility of adding a whole subnet so if you can see here you can add the whole subnet inside our notation so if this was a slash 24 you basically can create this whole subnet here or you can add the individual ip in this case we're adding the individual ip for app 01 and 
you know what? We don't have just one application server. We're hosting multiple applications. So it will make sense to label this according to the type of application or the platform that the server is providing services for. In this case, we talked about that this is the e-commerce website. So we're gonna call it e-commerce app 01. I'm gonna press OK. Awesome. So we have the first app 01 server, and this is the e-commerce app 01. Let's go ahead and do the same thing. I'm gonna be doing exactly the same thing for the other app 02 and app 3. Okay, so I just did the second object, and this is app 2. I want to show you a cool feature that we can use in the Palo Alto GUI, we can create one object and then we can clone that and just change what's different and then keep creating more objects so we don't need to type constantly, right? So let's go ahead and click clone. And then it's telling me which object I want to clone from. In this case, I just selected two. So we're gonna press okay. And now we basically have a clone of the same one, which indeed has the same IP. But in this case, I'm gonna change this to be the last IP. So let's go ahead and this will be app three and we're gonna change this to eight. Press okay, awesome. So now we have the app server objects created on the Palo Alto and you can see everything is all neat with the application name and the app server number. We're gonna go ahead and press commit because remember nothing is effective until we press commit. Press commit and we should have those objects stored on the firewall. Okay, so commit completed. Now we need to do the same thing with the web DMC servers. Let's go ahead and create those objects real quick. I'm gonna select the first one. Let's copy the IP. And let's go to the Palo Alto and create that object. Okay, let's go ahead and add the, the object. And again, now we know that this is e-commerce web one. Go ahead, paste, and apply. And let me go ahead and do the other two, okay? Thanks to the magic of editing, I just created those three web server objects. I got the 25444, 44, 47, and 48. And those are the web servers that are sitting on the DMC. Remember what we have to do after we make a change? Commit. Okay, so commit has completed. Now that we have all those beautiful objects identifying every single IP, now we know what are they for. But wouldn't you like to, instead of having multiple policies, have one single policy that basically does the same thing? Isn't it easier to have a single policy that groups all those objects together? And you know that the policy for the e-commerce website is only one policy. So I think it's better to do it that way. That way it's easier to troubleshoot, don't you think? So let's go ahead and create an address group and let's nest each individual object inside the group so we then have a more clean policy on our security tab. Let's go ahead and uh, create an address group. Click on address group. And first, we're gonna create, the first group is gonna be our app servers group for e-commerce. So let's label that as e-commerce app servers and then now we're going to add those objects that we previously created click on add we got app one add again app two and add again app three press ok and now we got an address group with all our address objects inside that group this is the relevant object group for the application servers let's do the same thing for the web servers add we're gonna call it the same way because we want to make sure that we have the same naming convention. We wanna make sure that we follow a standard naming convention. So everyone agrees on the standard naming convention and no one needs to figure out any weird naming scheme that someone decided to put on an object. So let's go ahead and e-commerce again. This time it's web servers. Click on add and we're gonna select those three web servers that we created and we can press okay. There you go. We got our address objects and we got our address group objects and we're adding all relevant objects inside of that group. Do you want to see now how a policy will look like once we have this applied? Look at that. Do you notice a difference? I do notice a difference. It is clean, it is precise, and it's easy to troubleshoot. You now know that there's a single policy on your Palo Alto that provides traffic flow to the e-commerce app servers, to the e-commerce web servers. Same with policy that you want to create. So in this case, let's say we want to create a policy backwards. We're gonna do a DMC to inside. 
Right now, the application servers are going to be able to talk to the web servers if the traffic is originating from the inside. We want to do the same thing for the DMC. Let's go ahead and create the same policy. How will that look like now that we have proper organized address objects? What a difference. What a difference. Can you see the difference? Imagine if you did not have address objects or imagine if you do not apply address objects on your policies or address groups. Can you imagine the same rule duplicated backwards on the same policy table? Yeah, you're going to have a long night, trust me, if your firewall is looking like that. However, if you configure a firewall to look like this, you're going to have some spare time to sleep. I also want to show you why it's so important to create this type of policy where we integrate address groups and address objects. So let's say your application team told you that they expanded their application server pool, meaning that you now need to allow one extra server onto that address group in order for it to communicate to the DMC and sequentially, you know, to the web servers. In normal scenarios where you're not applying address groups onto your firewall, you're going to have another policy just for that server. In this case, we don't need to touch the policies. We just need to add that extra address object that we're going to be creating for the new server and just add it inside the address group. Let's go ahead and do it. They provided us our application server IP and we're going to create a new address object for that new server. Okay. We got e-commerce app 4 and they gave us dot 49 as the IP of the server okay now the only thing that we need to do is add this object inside the address group object click on add servers object group click add let's find the app e-commerce app 4 click OK let's click commit we did not only created the object we already allowed traffic to that new server we did not even need to go into the policy to modify policies whatsoever. You saw how awesome it is to build objects and have them working in your favor, meaning that you don't need to deal with policies. You just need to add the object inside the address group and automatically you're giving the rights that that server needs to have in order to communicate to the DMC. We haven't touched any policies. We just added the new application server inside the address group. That's it. The application is already there. Anything that is added onto that group, it's already applied to the policy. So you see, that's how you limit the human error and complexity by applying address groups to your policies. Now, that's what I call a professionally looking policy on a firewall. You see the difference? Make sure you apply it and trust me, you'll have more time to sleep at night. Okay, so we just covered the address objects and groups and uh, now it's time to talk about the service objects and groups. In this video, we're going to see a similar approach as we did on our previous videos with the address objects and groups. In this case, what you're seeing right in front of you, it's a, a service policy to allow access from the internet, in this case from the public WAN to our web servers sitting on the DMC. Usually those servers are going to be listening in specific ports. They can be the, the good old HTTP, HTTPS ports. We can have FTP service going to that particular server and we can also have custom ports. So we decide that application will talk using a custom port. We got to allow that on the policy going from the outside to the inside. The problem is, as you keep adding ports, in this case services, we are going to make our policy list longer and that will bring complexity into the picture. We don't want that. As we discussed on the previous video, we saw that having a complex policy table can cause a lot of issues when it comes to troubleshooting because you don't know what you're looking at. So this particular video is going to be focused in how can we shorten or make it more simplified our policy table. We want to make it more simplified. So in order for us to troubleshoot in the future, we have a very precise and clean policy table. We're also going to be adding TCP ports and custom UDP ports 
you might have an application that talks over a specific port that is not a known port. We're going to take a look at the Palo Alto uh, common ports. On the Palo Alto by default, you're going to see a pretty fine table of custom services that are added as soon as you power up the firewall and you start configuring it. So you're going to have already provisioned, allocated for you uh, some ports that are by default uh, set on the Palo Alto. But most of the time, those are not the only ports that you're going to be allowing from the outside. We're going to have also ports that are custom based on the application. So we decided to listen for a specific request over a custom port, a port that is not allowed. And you got to create a service object and add it onto the NAT, in this case, onto the inbound policy in order for it to be accessed from the outside. So access from the outside are enabling inbound onto the firewall. Problem is, you keep adding them and it makes your table longer and bigger. We are also gonna take advantage of service groups. On the service groups, you're gonna have the same approach as the address. We're gonna combine all those ports that are relevant to the application and put it in that particular service group. So let's get started. Let's take a look at this and it's gonna be very familiar. It's, it's basically the same approach as the address objects, but we're gonna add a little bit more of an understanding of how can we add those objects and use them efficiently. Again, similar to the address object video, our previous video in this section, in service objects and groups, we're going to be creating service objects. So if you have custom ports, TCP 8185, or you have any custom port that there's no object for it on the Palo Alto, we're going to create those custom ports and it can be a TCP or UDP. So it depends on what type of transport it's currently listening for. If it's a UDP packet or is TCP, we're just going to have that service object based on the type of service. Also, we're going to organize those service objects into service groups. Similar with the address objects, we're going to do the same thing with the service groups. So you can, so you can take a look and, and make sure that creating them, you allocate them based on the application. So create a group and organize them inside a service group. Save yourselves a headache. Please, this feature is available on the Palo Alto. It is there for you to use. Don't go crazy into adding individual ports and policies because you're going to start seeing that policy table growing. And it might be okay if you have 10, 15, 20 policies. It is not okay if you have 200 policies because then you have pages and pages of, of lines that in case there's a troubleshooting session that you need to perform or an emergency troubleshooting because something has been blocked, you're going to spend a lot of time. So I'm trying to help you on that. Make sure that you take advantage of service objects and groups and let's make everything tidy, everything organized, and everything persistent. Same with using service group. We're going to use that service group as we talked about. We're just going to make our policy table is shorter by organizing every single object into its own group. We're going to have, it doesn't matter the name that you add onto the, the group. It can be named based on the application. It can be named based on the server farm group. It can be named based on whatever you want. As long as you know, based on your naming convention, that that belongs to XYZ service, that's all you need to know. You know that if you're logging in at 2 a.m. in the morning, remember the phone call? You know exactly what's that for. You're not trying to find or call someone at that time because you don't understand what ports are what or you don't understand this name of this. So also the names are very important. So it's not just creating service object, it's making a name for it. Okay, alrighty, let's get started. Okay, as we did on our previous video, we're going to click on object and we're going to go ahead this time and we're going to click on services. We're going to make custom port for each service that we need to allow from the outside to the DMC side. So we have a NAT rule, the destination NAT from anything that is public will hit our DMZ zone and from the DMZ zone it's going to hit the specific port that we're going to allow by creating this service object or if you want to make it more familiar a port object. Let's go ahead and we're going to use the example as we had on our slide. We got two server groups because now we're using address groups. Remember we're no longer doing we're IPs or random IPs, we're doing address groups. So we have e-commerce web servers and support web servers. And we have a list of ports that you can see on the right, TCP, UDP ports, and plus, plus we also have the default ports, FTP, HTTPS, and HTTP. On the support web servers, if you can see, I bet you that right at the beginning, you were not able to tell, and you thought that all ports were very similar. They're not. 
if you see we got just changing digits so I want you to see that if you don't apply having objects into groups it's very hard to troubleshoot because the ports might look similar and at 2 a.m. in the morning everything looks the same so make sure that you understand how to create those services how to create the service group and group them and organize that policy table properly okay let's go ahead let's do the first one 12221 TCP this is a TCP port 12221 we're gonna show this one we're gonna do the same thing for UDP and basically the other ones are gonna be just the same let's go ahead and click add and in this case let's call this one 12221 obviously it's a TCP port okay source port if and this is remember in TCP we have source port we have destination port so we have incoming traffic and outgoing traffic and you want the machine to talk over a specific port or the machine by default will talk over a specific port this will be added into the source port in this case because we're getting a destination on NAT so we have to allow the port inbound in this case we have a destination NAT we have 12221 open inbound on the server so anyone from the outside is going to be able to hit 12221 TCP by just adding this as a destination port we're going to go ahead and two, 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 one. We'll click OK. Now we got that first one. Let's go ahead and do the second one. Second one was five, three, two, two, UDP. And in this case is UDP. Again, it's destination because we want traffic inbound from the outside. They're going to hit that port because that port is listening on the server in, in the DMC. We're going to click OK. And we got two. OK, let me go ahead and do the other ones so we can fast forward the video. OK. OK. Thanks to the magic of editing, I just made all the objects. So we made the UDP objects and also the TCP service objects. And I also made the FTP object because by default, the Palo Alto will not have FTP created as a service object. But you can see we have two predefined services, the HTTP, HTTPS. Why is that? 480 and 443. Those are very common ports. You're going to be using that in most of the policies so that's why the Palo Alto will, will bring that already predefined for you now last thing I have to do is create a service group and let's group them by relevant application so we know that everything that is inside that group belongs to that particular application and the flexibility of using service groups and service objects is that we can combine those objects and use them into in multiple groups so I, I'm not limited to using them per group I can use it multiple groups let's go ahead and do it I'm gonna go ahead and click on service groups I'm gonna click add and the first one was bound to the e-commerce web service okay we're gonna click add and we're gonna add the ports that are relevant for our e-commerce web server destination net rule so FTP also have this common port here we also have five three to two we also have 81 81 we also have 84 84 and finally let's take advantage of the service objects are by default on the PA service HTTP and also HTTPS now we'll basically click OK and all right we got our first service group let's go ahead and create our second service group okay so we got our second service object group created one last item that I want to show you which indeed is very cool say for example you have a group of servers that might also use this set of ports exactly the seven ports in this group but two extra ports you can create the service object group right and add every single individual one but you also can have a group nested onto a group you want to see how this is done let's go ahead and let's make a service this is a, just a custom service 8787 TCP but it also needs all the ports that are on the e-commerce website so we created this port now we're gonna create a service group and we're gonna call that the app web servers right so you have a mobile application that hits those web servers on the DMC we're gonna click add look at that so we mentioned that we need to have exactly the same ports that we have on our e-commerce web server but you don't need to go ahead and create a brand new every single individual port that is on the e-commerce web servers you can add the e-commerce web servers basically nesting onto a group and just add the additional port that we need for that particular web server so let's click on e-commerce and we're just going to add that new port 
and we'll click OK. There you go. So now the AMP web server has the particular port that is only relevant for this set of servers, but it also has all the ports that belongs to the e-commerce web servers. You saw how cool it is to take advantage of that type of nesting when it comes to address objects? Policy table will definitely be shorter. Okay, so once we're done, what's left? Do you have any idea what we need to do once we configure anything on the Palo Alto? Yes. Commit. Remember that. Always commit after making a change. If not, it's not applied. It's not effective. There you have it. Very simple, right? Make sure that you use servers, objects, and groups. Configure those policies to be very, very simple to understand, and you'll save the time and hassle of dealing with a troubleshooting issue if you need to jump in and assist in any possible issues on your firewall. Do yourself a favor and configure that and allocate all device IPs and address groups. Configure service object, add the ports for your applications. That firewall policy table looks just like picture. Everything completely organized into address objects, service object, and object groups. Okay, everyone, as we continue our journey into the Palo Alto's Pan OS 8 interface, we're going to start looking at one of the next generation firewall features and it's the fact that you can classify network traffic inbound or outbound from your firewall based on applications how cool is that huh you can have policies that are applied to inbound or outbound traffic based on application so the palo alto is able to inspect that packet as it flows through the zone and is going to be able to tell what type of application it's matching the traffic for and you can put some rules for it for example you can put a rule to block access to the facebook application you can put a rule to allow access to netflix but deny to hulu you can put a rule to only allow windows updates to certain subnets on the network you can put another rule to allow the C-level executives access to every single website, every single application, but deny to the rest of the environment. And you know what I'm saying. So we're going to take a look at all that and uh, we're going to get some application objects created. Now that we know how to apply groups, we're going to classify application objects into groups. So if we have a set of predefined applications that our environment wants to allow to a specific user or a specific group of people, we can create a group and then add all those applications in and we only make one single policy. Again, remember, we want to make as clean as possible our policy table so we can troubleshoot everything easier and we can see the issue or we can understand what's going on as far as traffic flow in and out from the firewall without too much effort. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, so let's create some application objects. Let's go ahead and click on objects. Let's click on applications. Once you're in the applications menu, you're going to be shown a table, or I should say a list of all possible applications that you can be identifying on your policies in your firewall. We can begin with the category. So the Palo Alto breaks down applications into categories, business system, anything that's related to business case usage, for example, any services like O365, you know, Office 365, any mail service that is outside, it most definitely will be shown on this category. Uh, same with collaboration. If you're doing voice like Skype or you're doing instant messaging, it usually falls under collaboration and such. This is how Palo Alto classifies their applications. They can classify by category and inside the category, you got subcategories because this might have dependency upon any other services. So that basically is how the, the PA will, will be classifying that particular application. You also have the type of transport. Is it a browser based, meaning that are you going to be accessing that application using your web browser? Is it a client to server, meaning that you have a client application running on your machine, going to communicate to the server as it's going to provide the service? Is it a, just a network protocol, meaning that it doesn't necessarily have an application on the back end? It's just a network protocol that uses to communicate between your device and the outside resource. 
or as a peer-to-peer, -peer, meaning that you're collaborating in a peer-to-peer -peer network. Most of the case, this is where a lot of file sharing services or BitTorrent falls into, because uh, it's a peer-to-peer. -peer. Everyone collaborates the environment, that type of network uh, I'm talking about when it comes to peer-to-peer. -to -peer. Very handy. By default, the Palo Alto will have its database service. In this case, it does reference to their uh, Palo Alto security, threat security um, cloud platform, in this case, uh, with Wildfire, um, they do analytics when it comes to threats and classified traffic, or I should say applications or websites based on risk. If the risk is high, you're going to get a number five, meaning that you should not allow traffic outbound to those resources. If it's one, it's the lowest, it's safe for access. Also, characteristics, if there's custom information or if you want to give specific identity to those applications, characteristics are basically a way to do it. We're going to take a look at how to create a application object. And when I mean by application object, those are all application objects. Those will be the Palo Alto database application objects. So those application objects are provided by the Palo Alto cloud database. If for some reason you don't see an application that you need to identify that it's available on the Palo Alto database, you're going to need to create a custom application object. And this is how you tell the Palo Alto, hey, look for this particular characteristics in your traffic, in, your tra in the firewall traffic flow, and then find specific details so we can tell the firewall, hey, if you see something like this, treat it as application XYZ. Meaning that if you have an application that is not identified already in the Palo Alto database, meaning a custom application, maybe something that you wrote and it's running on your environment, chances are it's not on the Palo Alto application database. So you're going to be creating a custom application object to provide identity to the firewall so the firewall can properly identify that traffic. Else, if you don't do that, Palo Alto might show the traffic as unknown. And when you put global policies to block malicious websites, sometimes you also block unknown, and then you might be blocking something that not necessarily as malicious. It might be something that is just not classified and uh, it can cause a lot of issues. So this is where creating application objects comes into place. So we're just gonna click on that. And say, for example, we're gonna do a quick example here. We have an application that talks to a database service and in this case the inside to the dmc it's going to reach our dmc server in this case a web server but the web server needs to talk back to the database server but we need to classify the traffic from the database outbound to the server so if for some reason it needs to query the web server for something we can tell the palo alto hey this is this application make sure that you allow it and this is how you basically put it on the firewall so let's say database, or we can call it something very catchy, a custom app. And if you have the name, you can type the name, one. And then we're going to say it's part of our business systems. In this case, it's an application that is used in our production environment. This is operations. The parent application. Okay, so say, for example, that application needs to talk to a cloud SaaS operator, software as a service operator, and it's been hosted in Azure. You can tell on the application object, hey, this application depends upon Azure or AWS. If you like Amazon Web Services, you can tell the application, hey, this application need depends upon that cloud service. In this case, let's do AWS and we can also specify Azure. That's the case. So say, for example, it needs access to the AWS side or it needs access to the Azure side. So we can type Azure. And then we can basically tell the application, hey, it's dependent upon the Azure service to function. We're going to also provide the subcategory, I should say, that falls under the global category. So on my business system, this is actually my marketing application. So it falls as the business system category, but inside my business system is subcategory. The risk, I know is a risk, it's one. And then technology, it is a web application. So in this case, it's browser-based. With that said, I can efficiently provide an identity to the application. There's more to it. For example, if we know a specific port, that application talks to intrazone traffic, so it will need to talk intrazone, you're going to have a way to identify if you have already the port that it's going to try to communicate to. Say, for example, it uses a port, and that destination port will be, and we can make something up, 546. We're basically telling the firewall, if you see anything that is outbound going to 4546, treat it as this application name. 
And that's how you can apply a policy to allow that and avoid the Palo Alto of not identifying it properly and blocking it because it's treating it as an unknown application. Anything that is default, even so if you have a web application that it's port 80 or 443, then you don't need to do this because it's going to fall under the service onto the HTTP, HTTPS unless you add signatures. When you add signatures, on top of being an HTTP, HTTPS, you can create a custom policy that even though that is HTTP, HTTPS, which I am allowing, I am adding a signature so it can differentiate from any other application. So if I have an application that I'm not necessarily, I want to allow, but it's HTTP, HTTPS, which is allowed globally, then I can have a signature added. And that's where all those application objects, they're already identify for you so you don't need to worry about that because they're most definitely going to be using SSL 443 or they're going to be using port 80 so if you need to identify some other method to identify the application and that's where signatures come into place you just grab something that can identify that application an attribute that the firewall can see once the traffic is flowing and then oh yeah I see this on my packet it means that this is this application, even though that is port 80 or 443 as yes, HTTPS, I have a specific signature. I am allowing HTTP, HTTPS, but I have another rule that it says that if, if it matches this particular application, I want you to block it. This is where signatures come into place. And you can find any uh, attribute to make a signature effective. So for example, if you have an HTTP header, meaning that you know the complete URL, that once it hits that resource, you're going to see that flowing on the firewall. So the firewall will be able to see that on the packet. You can add that as a signature. And then the Palo Alto will know that, hey, if you see that URL address, I want you to treat it as this application. And this is where you can add that as a condition. So you can create conditions. You can create multiple conditions. And here, yeah. So you have pattern match. And you can basically classify the traffic based on a particular pattern. Context. So this is where we tell the Palo Alto where to look for that specific information on the packet itself. If you have Wireshark, you should be able to find those particular information on the packet. So say for example, and we're just going to make something real quick here. I have my header and my header will say, okay, so I am looking for this is my website and this is just .com. We're looking for www.thisismywebsite.com then we'll know that this belongs to this particular application. So anything that matches, this is my website.com. And again, this is just me showing you a, an example. You can call this as a signature. This is identifier. We can call it identifier for my custom app. And that's how the Palo Alto will know that, oh yeah, I see the HTTP header that it's showing as this is my website. I know that it matches this identifier, this signature. Okay, let me treat it as this custom app. And then you can put a policy and just add the object and tell, hey, deny or allow. And then anything that hits that particular website, even though that you're allowing HTTP, HTTPS, you're going to block it. So that's how you basically classify traffic that cannot be classified based on default applications. Alrighty. Okay, so let's continue. Just click on cancel. This was just an example. Let me go ahead and uh, show you how you can classify any other traffic. So say, for example, you want to talk about Netflix. Okay, so say, for example, let's take YouTube, for example. Say your policy is not to allow YouTube as to be reached or to be accessed from the outside for your internal users. And you need to put a policy that blocks YouTube. Okay, so the first thing, you're going to click on application groups and you're going to create that group of services that are dependent so YouTube can open. We're going to click add. We're going to type the name and that says YouTube. This is my application group name, right? And then inside here, we need to add everything that is dependent upon YouTube. How do you find out what's dependent upon YouTube? Okay, this is where Applipedia comes into play. We're going to go to Applipedia and we're going to see what is dependent for YouTube to function properly. Okay, everyone. So on our previous video, we took a look at creating application objects and groups. And we ended up that video discussing that there's a key item that we got to discuss in order to properly configure application groups. If you want to classify traffic or identify traffic on your Palo Alto firewall based on applications, if you want to enforce access or deny access to a specific application, 
there's very much likely that you need to add dependencies for a specific application. So if, for example, we want to block Netflix or we want to allow Netflix for a specific set of users, or we want to create an application object and add that into the application group, most certainly we will need some dependencies that particular application object, in this case, the Netflix application object will not have. This is where application research center or applipedia comes into place. What is the application research center? This is Palo Alto's central database of any um, application. I will call it the directory of where the Palo Alto firewall downloads and gets the update of all known applications, or I should say applications that were registered in the Palo Alto Networks Application Research Center database. So in order for Palo Alto to identify and police the traffic based on an application, it needs to understand what kind of information will the packet include. And then based on that information, we can assign an identity, in this case, and a specific application name, so we can know that the Palo Alto just saw this type of information in the packet, so let's treat it as this is application XYZ. Um, so Palo Alto continues to update this on a daily, weekly basis, and there's times where you might need to have some dependencies added for a specific application in order for you to block it or allow it. Say, for example, Netflix. We want to allow Netflix, but there's a pretty good chance that Netflix is dependent upon another application or another service. Let me explain. Netflix has uh, movies, and if you're familiar with Netflix, if you're out of the United States where I am from, Netflix is a paid video streaming cloud service that streams movies, documentaries, anything that has to do with, uh, with films. And this includes showing the information about a specific movie. So for example, you want to watch an action movie. The actual movie, once you click on the poster or the icon, I should say, is going to show you information about that particular movie. Well, that information may be pulled from another site as Netflix does not have that hosted on their, on their data centers. It needs to query Google, for example. So if you create an application group for Netflix and you don't add Google as the dependency, Netflix might not be able to load because it's going to say, well, I'm, I'm able to reach Netflix data centers, but I'm not able to reach Google to pull the information about a specific movie. So the application will basically crash or it will not even load. And this is what we hear. We're here to take a look at Application Research Center or Applepedia and then identify what dependencies we might need to add to a specific group so we can allow the traffic and the application object and group will be properly configured and it will be efficient or I should say it will be effective once you apply the policy. So we're just going to get started and we'll, we'll review Application Research Center and we'll go from there. Let's go ahead and Applepedia, paloaltonetworks.com. Once we're on applipedia.paloautonetworks.com, this is, by the way, this is free. This is completely open. This is where you're going to be finding that information that you need to create groups. So we're going to search YouTube. We're going to press enter. And sure enough, if you can see by just typing YouTube, there's so many dependencies of YouTube. So there's other websites that they use YouTube to show their content. So if, for example, you decide to block Quick or block those sites, for example, Flexwagon, Dailymotion, if you block it, but then YouTube is still allowed, they might not go to the website, but you might be able to access the videos. In our case, we see that we want to block YouTube. Okay, so YouTube, it's basically, this is the global object. Inside that object, you have every single dependency for YouTube, okay? So let's go ahead and see. So right now we have YouTube and this includes posting, which is collaboration, YouTube TV, YouTube TV streaming, YouTube base. And you're going to see everything based. This is like the default or like the primary object for an application. But guess what? This is what I was talking to you about. Depends on other applications. So even though that you, for example, want to allow YouTube for certain individuals, but block for everyone else, you got to make an application group and not only add all those dependencies for YouTube, but also you need to add Google base because it depends on Google base. And this is why Applepedia will be your best friend for this case. You're going to find out what dependencies are needed to allow or deny YouTube. So in this case, it's telling us that it's Google base. 
So now I know that once I add YouTube, I also need to add Google Base, right? So that tells me that Google Base is a must in order for YouTube to work properly. So let's go ahead and uh, go back and we're gonna add YouTube. We're gonna type YouTube, okay? And we're just gonna add this, which basically adds everything that is below the subcategory. So basically everything that is inside YouTube is gonna be added. So we're just adding YouTube. And then remember, we went to application, Applepedia. We then want to see what's dependent for YouTube. And then if you click base, it depends on Google base. So let's go ahead and add Google base as well. Oh, by the way, do we need dependency upon the other ones? Yes, but remember, I told you everything that is base, it usually everything that is de dependent on the application, it depends on the base. So everything that's dash base will be the base service that needs to be added in order for everything to work for that particular application. So in this case, YouTube dash base will be your base application object that you need to add in order for everything to work. So we should be good. Everything is dependent upon YouTube base, but then YouTube base is dependent upon Google base. So that's why you need to go to Applepedia and they call it the application research center, but I call it Applepedia, you know, sounds more cool. And then you find that information there and for sure that you know that that policy was going to work because of dependency. So let's go ahead and add that. And we now know that we need to add Google base. So basically we type Google and we should be able to see that Google base right here by adding those two. Now we can for sure know that this group is going to work properly. Now we just need to make a security policy and add this as my application and either allow it. So once you have that, you're going to have a policy that you know is going to work because it, all dependencies for that YouTube group are added. So that's in a nutshell. We're going to look in section three. We're going to create some security rules and we're going to do one of the rules is going to be meant for application groups. And why not do it with this particular YouTube group? I'm going to show you how to create an application policy to allow traffic for a specific group of people because we're going to look at user groups and user objects. So we're going to make a user object and then we're going to make a user group and then we're going to create a policy to allow a specific user group in your network to reach YouTube and then everyone else is denied. So this is obviously something very important. And what did we forget to do after we create something or we configure something on the Palo Alto? Commit. Alrighty. We took a look at address objects and groups, service objects and groups, and application objects and groups. And we cannot finish section two by discussing user objects and groups, which are going to be very important on your firewall security policies. You want to set policies based on user accounts. You want to specify which groups will be allowed to reach XYZ application, XYZ destination on your security policy. So you want to make sure that you classify your users into groups. And then you can also import LDAP groups, meaning if you have in an environment where you're running directory authentication based services, such as Active Directory, you're going to be able to integrate that to the Palo Alto and do a remote uh, user lookup from your AD environment. So if you have a couple of uh, groups inside your Active Directory environment, you can apply those groups onto your firewall policies. And for example, if you want to put your staff specific, for example, HR or accounting into a specific group that will be allowing more access than regular HR or non-accounting users, a preferred policy or a provide them more access onto the destination. So if you have a local user that not necessarily it's AD integrated, meaning that either it's going to be a temporary user, you don't want to allocate a, an AD account to this user, or simply you don't want to have them a part of AD, you can still configure a local user on the Palo Alto and still apply policies for that particular user. And we're going to take advantage by doing that, uh, implementing, for example, Capture Portal. So Capture Portal is a great way to enforce or police web filtering or web access to a specific destination by asking the user to input his username and password. And if the user is, doesn't have an account on the group that is allowed onto the policy, they're not going to be able to go and access that. But in this case, we're going to configure those user objects and groups. In another section, we're going to actually configure that capture portal, but this is a great start 
so you can understand how can you take advantage of user objects and groups. Okay, so as you can see on the slide, we're gonna look at creating local user objects. We're gonna make remote user objects based on LDAP integration. So we're gonna integrate with Active Directory and we're going to use those objects that were created in Active Directory and use them on our file policies. And finally, we're gonna nest our users into groups. So if you have a particular group that will have more access than another group, you can create uh, separate policies, one for a group that has full access and one that does not have that. Alrighty, so let's begin. Okay, so once we log in onto the Palo Alto, we're gonna click on device. We're gonna go into the local user database. And this is where we're gonna configure local users on your Palo Alto. Those are users that are not necessarily in your AD or directory services server or forest. Basically local users that you still want to provide them access to specific resources, but you know, everything is gonna be configured um, in a tight security policy, which you're gonna add that user group onto the policy and provide them access to a, a specific resource. So let's go ahead and click on users. And we're gonna click on add. And we're gonna type this username. So let's create two users. One user will have more access than the other one. So let's call privilege user one, or in this case, let's call it prefer user. Okay, let's set up a quick password. Let's enable that account. And then let's make the other one restricted. Also, let's make a password. Okay. So we just made two users. One user is a preferred user. The other one is a restricted user. This preferred user is gonna be able to go to basically every single website. This second user, which is restricted, basically following the internet usage policy in the company, this guy will be assigned a restricted user account. So his account will be restricted user. So now we need to make two local user groups. Uh, one, every single user that's gonna be a preferred user, we're gonna add that into that preferred group. And then every single user that is behaving badly is not actually following rules in your environment, you're gonna add that into your restricted group. So let's make those two user groups. Start with prefer group, and then let's add that user that it's our preferred user. Any user that is inside this group will be preferred, or in this case, will be allowed to go to every single website, okay? Now let's make another group, and this case will be a restricted group. And now we're gonna add that restricted user. Okay, so now we have the local users, so those are two users that are just local users. They're not actually in my LDAP environment. They're just local users on the firewall. And then we created local user groups, meaning that those are groups for all my local users. So again, if I am not integrating this with LDAP, I just need some local users. I don't really need to integrate it to AD. This is the way that I will be doing. Once I have that group, I can make a policy and say, for example, source preferred group. So in this case, we're gonna say, anyone from an IP standpoint. So if we go to policies, and let's say for example, and so in session three, we're gonna talk about security policies, but in this case, I'm just gonna show you this on a quick demonstration. So we're gonna click on add, and then once we click add, we're gonna type the name of the rule. In this case, it's gonna be prefer access to internet. And then we're gonna say source coming from our inside of the network, any source address from the inside. But in this case, we're gonna select that user group. So let's go ahead and select that preferred group. So any user inside that preferred group is gonna be matching against this policy. If I am not in that group, I am not gonna be a match against this policy. I will need to follow my policy order in the Palo Alto. And then destination, we're gonna say outside, and then anything on the outside. And by the way, this is just a test. I'm not actually saying that this is the right way to do this particular policy, but for this demonstration, I just wanna show you how it's done. And then we'll basically allow, we'll click OK. So now you can see that I have a preferred access group to the internet. Everyone from the inside that matches inside this user group is gonna be able to the outside, every single website. And then once we finish with this, we can then do the other one for the deny. So we're gonna click on that, and then we're gonna do the deny. In this case, we're gonna do this restricted, okay? And then in this case, the same zone because they're coming from the inside. Only difference, we're gonna add that restricted group as our user coming from the source, destination, sending that restricted group to the outside, but then I am only allowing them to go to a.a.a.a. Meaning that I am only allowing that particular group to hit that destination. Then if I am not matching any other rule below that, then I'm basically gonna be matched against the global deny, which is gonna drop the traffic. And then application service any, and then we're gonna allow. So now 
this restricted group is only able to hit that particular destination. And you can do this for any type of traffic. And not necessarily is this internet, I'm just giving that as an option. But for example, if you have a set of web applications that are sitting on your DMC and you don't want that restricted group to hit that, this is the way you do it. You just allow uh, the preferred group to every single destination or the list of services or servers that you have on your DMC. And then you put a rule for the restricted groups so they don't go anywhere. And again, I will be discussing security policies in a more detailed manner. So for this case, I'm just showing how to use local users and groups. Okay, so once done, the last thing, obviously, let's commit. Okay, everyone, so we just took a look at making some user objects and groups in the local Palo Alto database. Okay, everyone, in this video, we're going to do LDAP integration in our Palo Alto firewall. We have an AD environment. You no, know, that's where all your users are currently using to authenticate um, to your environment. You've got an Active Directory environment. And we're going to integrate that to the firewall so the firewall can do policy enforcement based on username. Step one, we're going to create a service account, and this will be a username on your Active Directory environment that will be used by the Palo Alto to query that information. So the Palo Alto will basically do a call to the AD domain controller, and it's going to pull that information, and then based on that information, it's going to be able to enforce the rules. So once you put that user account into a specific security policy, Firewall will basically do an LDAP query, and it's going to find that information and see if there's a match for that user in that particular group. For example, if we put a policy into a specific group, then the Palo Alto Firewall needs to see that, that user is requesting to access a specific destination, and it's matching against the policy, then the Palo Alto will query and see if that user actually is a member of the group that that is added onto that particular security policy. Alrighty, so let's begin. And by the way, here on the slide, we have the two formats that you can create, or you can basically tell the Palo Alto firewall how the user attribute will be looked upon. So SAM account name means that you're just going to have that uh, username and then user principal name will going to have basically an email format. So it starts with the username at domain name and that will be your fully qualifying domain name. So we're going to have those two options and we're going to work with SAM account name, but it's going to be the same with the user principal name. All right, so let's begin. Okay, so I'm going to start by showing you that I created a couple of security groups. So I want to show the benefit of having AD integration. I will be configuring some security groups in Active Directory. And then in Active Directory, any member of that group will be applied a specific policy in our Palo Alto. So now that you're going to see that I have those security groups onto on AD, I'm going to classify traffic based on user groups. And then every member of that group will be enforced upon that specific policy on the Palo Alto. So if we take a look here real quick, this is one of my domain controllers. And by the way, our domain name will be padomain.local. So that will be our Active Directory Forest name. Inside that domain, I have my user OU, organizational unit. I, in this particular OU, I make three groups. One of them will be the full access. That group will basically be group that will have access to all internet. It's going to be on filter. It's going to be on restricted internet access. Every member of the HR staff is going to be able to go to specific servers that I have on my DMZ. And then I also have restricted internet, meaning that if I have groups of uh, people inside that group, they're not going to be able to go anywhere because on the Palo Alto, I'm going to put a policy that will block traffic based on whoever is member of that group. Finally, I am going to make another group in AD, which is going to be the firewall admins group. Every member that is inside that admins group is going to be able to manage the firewall. So they're going to be able to go into the firewall and make policy changes and do management on the web interface. And again, we need a service account. So this will be a specific user account that will be used to synchronize the Palo Alto. So the Palo Alto can perform LDAP queries into my local PA domain that local domain. We have a service account. We're going to use PA domain SA, and my account name is going to be Palo Alto LDAP SVC service account. I basically did an abbreviation on that. So it's going to be Palo Alto LDAP SVC. So you want to pay attention to this because once we go to the Palo Alto, I'm going to use that user account to perform the sync. Okay. And then again, we have a couple of groups, HR staff, full access, firewall admins, and restricted. 
So those groups will be applied a specific firewall policy. So any member of that group will be enforced onto a specific security policy. Okay, so and let's go ahead and, and start configuring the Palo Alto and do that LDAP integration. Okay, so here in our Palo Alto, we're gonna click device and we're gonna click LDAP. So once we go into the device tab, we're gonna scroll down, we're gonna click on LDAP, and this is where we're gonna add our domain controller. So let's click on add, okay? And we're gonna call this VPA domain. That's our name. And then we're gonna add my domain controller inside this profile name. This will be PA domain DC one, which is my domain controller number one. And here's, we're going to type that IP address 10 10. In my case is 45. That's my service IP. Now we're going to make an active directory. So on the server settings, we're going to change the type from other into active directory, because in our case, we have in Microsoft active directory based environment based distinguished name. We're going to go ahead and do a binding. So once we have that, we are going to select our fully qualified domain name. So let's go ahead and uh, do the binding. And we mentioned ourselves that the service count was labeled Palo Alto LDAP SBC that PA domain dot local. And then I'm going to go ahead and uh, if you can see, I'm doing it in user principal name, because remember in the beginning of the video, I was mentioning about two forms I'm doing it. I am doing basically user principal name for my binding purposes password and let's type my password and then we're just going to press okay so we got a binding right now what we need to do is make sure that the palo alto can use that service count which is palo alto ldap svc at pa domain local right and then once we confirm that that it's able to talk then we can do a query and and see if well, we can find more information about domain and we can pull the user group okay let me take a look and see if the pa was able to do a query and i should be able to see a base dn so once i add this information i should be able to see a base dn take a look oh yes there you go so so now i know that i'm actually able to pull that information and this is the base distinguished name which basically is the forest name which is pa domain dot local and then let's just press okay so let's go ahead and click authentication profile now we're going to click on the add and let's make it the pa profile one this time we're going to do a ldap profile let's select our pa domain sync ldap name and then we're going to do the login attribute so this is where we're going to tell the Palo Alto what type of format do we want on our username. In this case, I can go, if I want to see emails as my username, so every user needs to put his user account in email format, then I'll type user principal name, capital U, capital P, capital N, UPN, or I can do same account name. And then in this case, you're going to see which letters are going to be in uppercase. And by the way, this is very important. It's case sensitive. So if you don't type the right capital letters, this will not work. So let's type Sam and you can see A M A all uppercase count and then N in capital N name. Okay. So that's basically Sam account name. And then now in advanced, we're going to say allow list and we're going to say which member of that group, which groups can we pull out of the AD environment? In this case, let's say all the groups. And then from there, I can actually be specific on my policy. So I just want to see every single group in the AD environment but then I'll select which ones do I want. If you only want to select a specific group from LDAP, then you can restrict the profile to only select those specific groups. But I don't care because I really can pull everything and then on the policy, I'll select which ones do I want. So let me go ahead and just select all for now. Well, we don't need to do any type of additional factors to authentication to FA. So this should be good to go. Let's click OK. OK, so now, we're going to do an authentication sequence. So an authentication sequence, we're going to tell the Palo Alto what goes first. Do you want to make sure that the user belongs to a local user group first, or do you want to check LDAP first and then local user groups? Meaning that if the user has an account in the local Palo Alto, but it also does have an account in the LDAP environment, we want to make sure that the Palo Alto looks first in LDAP. If that doesn't work, then go and look on local. So it's basically you select what preference you want the Palo Alto to look upon at that specific user account. So let's go ahead and create an authentication sequence. And we're going to say PA alpha sequence. And then we're going to add the authentication profile. And then let's add the one that we created for LDAP. 
and now we need to add a new one. So let's go ahead and create that local authentication profile. Again, we did one authentication profile, which was LDAP, and now we gotta do another authentication profile, but in this case, it should be local. So let's click on add again. Let's make another one. Let's say PA auth profile two, and then this type is gonna be our local database. And then basically it's, it doesn't care what type of format, because in this case, I'm not gonna query LDAP. It's just gonna see their username that is on the local database. And then on advanced, I'm gonna select all group as check every single group that is on my LL list for this particular authentication profile. And then I'll click okay. And then once I have that, then I can use an authentication sequence to check which authentication form we're gonna to use to, to authenticate a user or, or grant access to a specific network policy. So if the user wants to go from inside to outside, then we have a way to identify that particular user. Let's go ahead and uh, go to authentication sequence. And then now, remember that we had authentication profile one, now we're gonna have the second one. So let's go ahead and click the second one. And now we know that this is the order. It first checks LDAP because that's auth profile one, and then it will check the local database. We're gonna click okay. Okay, so we have that. Now we need to make sure that we can pull those user groups. Also, very important, we want to make sure that we're having constant communication to our LDAP environment and in this case to our domain controller. So we can also do a monitoring policy for that server. So you click on user identification and here we can add the domain controller and we can know if the Palo Alto is able to query our domain controller. So let's go ahead and do that real quick. Okay, so let's type our server name. In this case is PA domain one DC one. And then we're gonna type the IP address. So 10, 10, 20, 45, we'll click okay. Now we got to commit, so if we don't commit, basically Palo Alto will not put this effective. So let's go ahead and click commit. Once we commit, we should be able to see that the Palo Alto is able to connect to the LDAP environment. Okay, and sure enough, there you go. We now know that, yes, user account is correct, is able to communicate, and it's showing that the status is connected. So we know that we're having good communication between our AD environment from the Palo Alto. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, see if we can pull some user group. Okay, so taking a look at the user identification, we're gonna go into group mapping settings. We'll click group mapping settings. And this is where we're gonna map those user groups from AD so the Palo Alto can take advantage of them and use them on the policies. So let's click on that. And we're gonna say PA domain group mapping. Let's select our server profile. In this case, it's the PA domain sync that we previously did on the LDAP session right below here. Let's click on PA domain sync. Okay. And now we can type the user domain name, but it's, you know, once we have the group class that this is what we want to pull out, then that should be it. But in this case, let's make it all clean. Let's make sure that we have all the information that we need to have on the group mapping. So let's type that domain name there. PA domain local, and now we're gonna go into the user group and attributes, and we know that the username it's it's gonna be look uh, upon the same account name attribute. Okay, and now we're gonna go into the include list, and sure enough, I can see that I am able to connect to my AD environment. So let's expand this. Okay, so now we have the OUs, and let's expand the users, and there you go, we have them there. Okay, so let's go ahead and add those groups in our Palo Alto. So we mentioned firewall admins, full access, HR staff, and finally restricted internet. Okay, awesome. So we have that. Let's press OK. And now we have a PA group mapping. Awesome. So let's go ahead and uh, make a policy and uh, we should be good to go. Okay, now we did that LDAP integration and we were able to see that the Palo Alto firewall can query our Active Directory domain controller, we should be able to make a security policy and enforce traffic based on those user groups that we have in our AD environment. So let's go ahead and do two policies. Policy number one, we're gonna restrict access to the internet for the restricted users or restricted internet group that we have in AD. We're gonna do another policy that will allow the full access group. So in this case, everyone that is a member of the full access group in AD will be able to go to every single website. Let's go ahead and do the first one. And again, we're gonna discuss security policies on an upcoming session. This is just to show you how to do it with user group. Let's go ahead and uh, click on security, click on add. And then once we click add, let's make the first rule. We're gonna say restrict internet, right? 
let's click on source and we're going to say everyone going from the inside going to the outside but in this case i want everyone from the inside that belongs to this specific user group then we'll go to the outside and then we'll set up an action let's uh, find it and see if we can add those to that group and sure enough now we can see that the palo alto is able to pull that information and we can see our groups in the palo alto for us to select so let's select restricted internet because that's our restricted internet policy we now know that everyone that is inside that group will no longer be able to go online I'm gonna say destination outside basically anywhere on the outside application will just leave a default same with uh, the service URL and category and our case will be a deny and sure enough now everyone that belongs to my PA domain AD environment in this case the restricted internet group is not going to be able to go to the outside so let's move this policy so it becomes effective. And again, I will be discussing the policy order of operations on an upcoming video. And then let's make the other policy, which is allow full access. So let's click on add and we're going to make another policy allowed internet or let's call full internet. We're going to click on source, click on add, same source. But in this case, the user group will be the full access from my PA domain. So let's click on full access and let's go and destination. We're going to go to the outside. And finally, application service is going to be the same. Action allow. All right. This is very cool. So we have first rule, restrict internet. Anyone that matches on this group is not going to be able to go anywhere on the outside. But then everyone that belongs to this group will be able to go to the outside. And then finally, we see the action. The first one is deny. The second one is allow. Okay. So the last thing to make this effective, press commit. And we are done. Okay, everyone. When it comes to a security appliance and in this case we're working with Palo Alto firewalls the most important aspect of this firewall and any firewall is how can you classify or segment your traffic and provide identity to that traffic and I think the most important aspect of any firewall is security zones and we're going to discuss how the Palo Alto firewalls are configured when it comes to zone we're gonna allocate our interfaces so if we have an interface that connects to our core switch on your data center and that core switch it's your internal network that most definitely will be your inside zone same with the outside if you have your ISP or internet service provider circuit that connects to the Palo Alto to Ethernet port 2 then that port 2 will be added onto the outside zone and that's how you tell that anything that wants to reach that interface or anything that comes from that interface will be treated as is coming from the outside. Same with the DMZ. We have servers that are sitting on the DMZ, which is basically a zone that it's kind of on the inside, but it's not necessarily completely on the inside, but it's also on the outside. So it's a zone where we're going to allow people from the outside to access, but we're not going to allow resources access completely the inside of our environment. So if something happens, something gets compromised as far as any servers that you have currently sitting on the DMC zone. By doing this, by segmenting that traffic into a zone, we can then mitigate that type of attack or threat. And same with servers. So we want to make sure that not necessarily we want to have all inside networks talking to our servers. So we can also allocate the server environment onto a particular zone. This is a key element of every firewall is to be able to uh, segment traffic and police. So if you want to go from one zone to the other, you got to be allowed based on the security policy. So we're going to put those rules in place and the Palo Alto will take care of the rest. Okay, so let's go ahead and begin with our uh, zoning config. Okay, everyone. So let's go ahead and configure those security zones. Let's click on network. Let's click on zones. Let's go ahead and click add. Okay, so once we're with our zone configuration page, let's take a look at the options. We have the name of the zone. This is, will be your zone name. Let's make the outside zone for our first example. We got our outside zone log setting, meaning that do we want to send any activity from that zone to our syslog server or any server that we're doing a polling monitoring from on the Palo Alto? We're going to configure that thing here. But in this case, we're not going to do that on this video. Okay, type. Very important. So type. We got a couple of types uh, that we can tell the Palo Alto, hey, type of traffic or the type of network traffic actually that falls on that particular zone is either a virtual wire. We're going to discuss virtual wire and what it is upcoming video. 
layer two, meaning that it's basically a zone that allocates a layer two traffic or does not have routable traffic. It falls onto a specific VLAN interface. So for example, if you have a zone that not necessarily I want to be a routed zone, it's just a pass-through zone. We can configure it as a layer two here, or if we want to allocate a specific VLAN to that particular interface, then we definitely can configure this a layer two on this particular section. We have layer three. Layer three obviously is the most common one. This is where we allocate layer three interfaces onto this particular zone. And finally, we have the tunnel. Tunnel is when you have a SSL tunnel, a IPsec site-to-site -site tunnel, and then you want to apply a zone to it. So you can tell this comes from customer A zone. So for example, if you have, you partner with XYZ company. So let's say company A and you have a tunnel with them and you can make this a zone. And then the type is going to be a tunnel because this is how you get to that zone, uh, to that company via a tunnel. So that's, this is how you basically allocate that. In our case, basically doing the outside, we're going to type outside zone and then we're going to change this to layer three. Okay. Once we're done, we're going to press okay. And now we should be able to do the same thing for the other ones. Okay. Let's do the same thing for the inside and the DMC. So I'm just going to go ahead and configure that and we should be good to go. Both of them are going to be layer three zones. And, um, uh, and we're going to finally allocate the interfaces once we are done with this. Okay, and thanks to the magic of editing, we have the two additional zones. We have the DMC zone and the inside zone. Let's now allocate that interface. So we're gonna tell the Palo Alto, everything that is plugged in onto this particular port, let's treat it as the outside or the inside or the DMC. So let's do the first one. So let's click on the outside zone. Now we're gonna allocate an interface for the outside zone. And we're gonna say that, you know what? Let's use the first port. Uh, so port one, interface one on the Palo Alto will be connected to our internet route. Let's add the same thing for the inside. Let's go ahead and just add that one because this is just a router. Let's click okay. And now we have the outside zone that comes from this particular port or interface. It will be treated as outside traffic. Let's go ahead and click inside and do the same with the inside. In this case, my inside interface will be ethernet port two. And you're gonna see this, this is sub interfaces and we're gonna discuss sub interfaces on our next video. We're gonna discuss all the interface type. So let's select ethernet port two and we're just gonna click okay. And now we know that port two belongs to the inside. And then finally on the DMC, we're gonna say port three is the DMZ zone. So if we have servers connected to that switch, they will belong to the DMZ. We'll click OK. And now that we have that configured, well, all of them are layer three, we should be good to go. Now we should be able to apply policies to traffic that is coming or going to those particular interfaces. And we can treat the traffic as if it's coming from the outside. It means that anything that is going out to that interface, it means that it's going to the outside or egressing. So you have two terms. So we have two terms. And by the way, if you're pursuing the PCNSE or Palo Alto Networks, a certified network security engineer, on your exam, there are going to be uh, questions that are going to mention the word ingress, which begins with I, ingress. And let me go ahead and type it in front here so you can understand what we'll be talking about. So let me go ahead and open my notepad and let's discuss uh, those two terms. Ingress, okay? We have ingress and we also have egress. Let's mention the difference between ingress and egress. So your user, it's coming from the inside going to the outside to go to the internet. That is an egress from the inside zone. So user, or let's call it Bob, he wants to go to the internet. So Bob is actually going out of the inside. That means this is egress. He's actually leaving the inside zone, right? But he wants to go to the outside. So now Bob is actually ingressing the outside zone. You got that? Okay, so egress, you're actually going inbound to the outside. So you're actually going in the outside zone. So this user is actually entering the outside. He's actually entering the outside zone. Egress, he is exiting the inside zone. He's actually leaving the inside zone. That means that it's egress traffic. Okay, so let's make sure that you understand that.
and this is how traffic flow happens on the firewall ingress i am actually entering my zone egress i am leaving my zone Alrighty. and to uh, do a little bit more clear i'm actually entering the outside leaving the inside so we know egress i am leaving my zone ingress i am entering my zone right. hey everyone so let's begin this session by discussing and showing and explaining how to configure those interfaces so we want to connect the firewall onto our network so we got a couple of options that we can choose from depending on your scenario so we're going to take a look at doing layer two interfaces we're going to take a look at doing layer three interfaces tap interfaces look back and tunnel interfaces and finally when we're ready to do HA pairing, meaning that we're going to have two firewalls in a cluster setup, we're going to make some high availability interfaces as well. Okay, so let's get started with layer two and we'll go from there. Okay, a layer two scenario. So say, for example, you want to have the Palo Alto enforcing traffic, but you don't necessarily want to be a routed hub. You don't want the Palo Alto firewall to become a routed hub, meaning that in a layer three perspective, your users will need to hop into the Palo Alto in order to get to somewhere else on the network. But you still want to enforce rules and traffic. You can do that by applying layer two interfaces. And the way you do that is by configuring a specific set of VLANs that you want to allow communications to and from on that particular port. And for example, you have a switch that wants to talk on another switch on the same layer two VLAN, then you can put a Palo Alto in between and enforce the traffic and monitor the traffic and set some policies for it. So let's go ahead and configure a layer two interface. Okay, once logged in onto the Palo Alto, we want to click on network. We want to go to interfaces and inside the interface, we have our ethernet interface tab. Let's go ahead and select one of the interfaces and let's take, for example, ethernet one slash one. Go ahead and uh, select this interface. Once we have the interface window option, then we're going to change our interface type to be a layer two interface. Let's go ahead and select layer two. And now we can either assign that to a specific VLAN or we can just leave it as a layer two and then add sub interfaces with multiple VLANs. So in case you have a trunk that you're allowing to pass multiple VLANs, you don't necessarily need to allocate a specific interface for a specific VLAN. You can take advantage of configuring sub interfaces for it. So let's go ahead and do that example. I am going to also allocate it into a layer two security zone. Again, we need to create a security zone that is main purpose is just to add layer two interfaces. And that's very important. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to show you how to make a layer two security zone. Just basically click on new. Let's call it layer two. Click OK. And now we have a security zone, which is our layer two in this case. Let's do the same thing for a VLAN. Let's uh, configure a VLAN. And you can see I already got a couple of VLANs there. So let's configure VLAN 20. OK. I'm going to click OK. Now we have VLAN 20 and it's on the security zone layer two. And we can enable LDP, but in this case, we're not gonna do so. Just for this purpose, I'm gonna show you how to tag a VLAN interface on that particular report. We'll click OK. And sure enough, once we commit the change, because obviously we need to commit the change so it becomes active, then this interface is particularly dedicated for VLAN 20. Okay, so if you want to have some interfaces, and this is what I suggest, you suggest take advantage of, of that trunk and configure a trunk and then create sub interfaces for each VLAN that you need to allow traffic for. So let's go ahead and make it a layer two without any VLANs assigned onto it. And then we'll make sub interfaces so you can see what I'm talking about. I'm gonna go ahead and click delete. And then once I delete, then I'm gonna just configure it again as a layer two interface. Okay, let's go ahead and select a layer two. And obviously the security zone will be on layer two, but we're not gonna add any VLANs. We're just gonna click okay. And now we're gonna add a sub interface and you can see the sub interface option down below here. We'll click there. And this is where you can actually assign the specific layer two tag on that interface. So in this case, we're gonna do 20. We'll go tag also 20 and then here we can actually assign it to the vlan instance which is 20 and again layer 2 you see now under this physical interface i have a logical sub interface doing dot one q trunking in this case i have a sub interface with dot 20 which is my vlan tag so if you can see here i'm tagging vlan 20 and I am actually assigning it to VLAN 20. So now I can even add a layer three interface inside this VLAN 20 VLAN instance. So I can go here into the VLAN and then I can add a layer three interface for it. So I can actually select my VLAN 20 
and then I can assign an IP if I want to. And also I can say 20, so make everything consistent. And then we'll basically press OK, and then I'll create that VLAN interface as well. So if you want to have a layer 3 address inside that layer 2, you can also do that. But I would recommend having just a layer 3 mode and then create sub interfaces in layer 3, which you can definitely do sub interfaces for VLANs in a layer 3 interface. And we'll show you that in a bit. Okay, so back where we are, we're actually checking that 20 here. And now we're going to do the same thing for 30 and 40. So we're just going to select our main physical interface and we'll create another sub interface inside that physical one. We're going to do 30, tag 30. And we're going to assign a new VLAN instance for this. In this case, let's call it VLAN 30. We'll press OK. And then again, add it to the same security zone layer 2. Well, with this. So, if for some example you want VLAN and 20 and 30 to talk to each other without having some sort of policy in between, then yes, it's fine. But I would rather have this on separate zones. The reason why it, this is the purpose of doing this, you want to have one particular VLAN assigned to one particular zone. So for example, if 30 is the VLAN for wireless, it will make more sense to create wireless VLAN 30 as my zone name and assign that to this particular sub interface. So that way you're actually isolating inner VLAN traffic. You're not going to allow those two VLANs to communicate each other unless there's policy for it. We're going to press OK. And now we have 20 and 30. 20 belongs to the layer 2 security zone. That was our, our example. And again, you should definitely label this according to what you want, you know, the purpose of it. So we're going to click on that, or we're going to say wired VLAN 20. And by the way, we should change this to be a layer 2. Okay, now we have a layer 2. Now we should be able to select VLAN.20 sub interface. And let's just change that to our wire VLAN 20 security zone. Now we know that 20 belongs to the wire VLAN security zone and 30 belongs to the wireless VLAN. This is an example that you can use to implement layer two interfaces. So once you're done, you just commit and we should be good. Just plug in a port and you're gonna have trunk. Make sure that the trunk is allowing both VLANs. And uh, yeah, you should be good to go. Once you have that, you should be able to make those security policies and enforce traffic between those two VLANs. Layer 3 interfaces, I believe this will be the most common deployment. With Layer 3, you basically assign a, an IP address to that particular interface. Or you can also, like our previous demonstration with the Layer 2 with sub-interfaces, you can make it a Layer 3 interface without any IP and then create sub-interfaces for each particular VLAN that is passing on that trunk interface. And this is one of my favorite ways of going. So for example, you have a port channel and you have two firewalls, or you have one firewall that wants to span across two different uh, switches. For redundancy purposes, you can build a layer three port channel and then create sub interfaces under that port channel. And once you have that, you can assign particular IP addresses depending on the type of networks that you're trying to communicate via the Palo Alto files. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, configure layer three and we'll do a layer three testing end to end and you'll see the results. Okay, when configuring a layer three interface, it's very simple. Go to network interfaces and we're gonna select an interface that we're gonna allocate an IP address and, and then we'll test connectivity to it. Let's take a look at one, two. So I have an, a switch connected to this particular interface and uh, we're going to configure an IP address on this interface and then we're going to connect to that switch and see if we can test and we can have IP reachability. So let's click on the interface. Once we click on the interface, we'll configure the IP. Select the interface type. In this case, we'll be a layer 3. We're going to assign this because now it's a layer 3 interface. We're going to assign this to a particular RTR or virtual router, and we're going to discuss virtual routing on another section. But every single layer 3 interface must be assigned to a specific virtual router so it can forward traffic to other interfaces. So that's how you have layer 3 connectivity between different networks. So let's create a virtual router just for this demonstration so we're not actually using the default one. Okay, so once here, well, we're just going to call it router1, and then we're going to press OK. And now we have our router1. So we're going to say that this is our inside interface. So we're going to create a security zone, or oh, by the way, we have one already. So we're just going to add it into the inside security zone. And this will be a layer three security zone because we saw that we can create different type of security zones. In this case, it has to be a layer three. 
Now we're going to configure an IP address for it. We're just going to click IPv4 or IPv6, depending on what type of network address space do you have on your environment. In this case, we're just going to configure the most common one, which is IPv4. We'll click Add, and let's type a new IP address. So let's say it's 10.20.0.1, and let's make it a slash 24. Press OK. Advanced. We can add a management profile. So remember on our first videos, I cover management profile. In management profile, we can set this interface as our management interface by just allocating a management profile that includes SSH, HTTPS. But I just wanted to make sure that I can ping, I can reach the interface. So I'm just going to select my management profile, which is ping. Okay, so we have everything, press OK. And now we have that layer three interface configured. And by the way, you can allocate address objects because now we know that we can have everything in address objects. So it's better for labeling purposes or naming purposes. So let's say this is our dev inside and then we can also type the IP address. And then this is a trash 24. It doesn't allow forward or backslash. It's, I'm just having a dash here. We're gonna type 10, 20, zero, one slash 24 and now because we have that then we can instead of typing the ip on the interface we can assign that address object as our interface address we're just going to select the interface okay we'll click ipv4 remember that i manually typed my ip here because i want to know what is that ip for i'm rather use the address object so let's just delete this we'll click add and sure enough, I have it here. Now, on my interface table, I can definitely see the name and the purpose of that particular interface. So now we have that. We have it assigned to a router. We'll press commit, and then we'll go on to my layer three switch, and we'll see if we can reach that interface. Once I have that interface configured, and I was able to see that it came online, which is showing my link state to be up, Let's go ahead and uh, test. I have one core switch here. And let's go ahead and uh, do a quick ping and see if uh, we got a response. So I have an interface in my core switch, which is 102002. And let's go ahead and do a quick ping and see if uh, we can reach the Palo Alto firewall. And sure enough, I get an ICMP response. So let's see if I take out the management profile out of the interface and the outcome of doing that. I'm going to go back into Ethernet 1 slash 2. Once I'm there, I'm just gonna remove the management profile of ping and we'll test again and see what will be the result. Take this out, none, okay. And then we'll press commit, commit, and sure enough, let's go ahead and uh, test once this is done. Yep, so I for sure am not able to ping because I just removed that management profile out of the interface. Okay, so with tunnel and loopback interfaces, we create tunnel interfaces so we can allocate a logical interface. If you have an IPsec tunnel, you're gonna have a tunnel interface where you're gonna either push traffic through and your virtual router, you're gonna select that tunnel interface and say, hey, I know how to get to this network. It's via this interface. In this case, it will be pointing towards the tunnel interface. I can create a loopback interface that will have an IP. This will be always on. So if, for example, you want to monitor something or you want traffic to be redirected to a loopback interface or you have a router process ID that need to allocate to your specific routing process, this is the way to do it. You configure a loopback interface and then you add that loopback interface onto your dynamic routing process, either is OSPF, BGP, etc. Let's go ahead and configure a tunnel and loopback interfaces. Okay, once on the Palo Alto, click on Network Interfaces and then click the tunnel and we're gonna make a tunnel interface. And imagine if we're partnering or we're peering with company A and then company A decided to build a tunnel between our company and them. So we're gonna build a tunnel interface. In this case, we're just gonna add a comment to my tunnel interface saying that it's company A. And then tunnel, we're gonna say because it's our first tunnel, we're gonna just add dot one to it. Virtual router, we're gonna assign it to our same router so both my inside network and the tunnel network can communicate. Security zone, we're gonna create a new zone and then the name of this zone will be our company A tunnel. We'll press okay. And now this belongs to this security zone so now I can have policies from my inside to this particular company A tunnel so I can direct or enforce traffic between those two destinations. IPv4, so if you're doing an interface mode tunnel, then you configure an IP address here, but in this case, I am not gonna work on IPs or tunnel configs yet. That will be a separate session. Advanced same, if you wanna ass assign a management profile to ping something remotely, 
through the tunnel, you can do so. But no, I'm just going to make the interface. Okay, once I have the interface, I can then go onto the IPsec tunnel and go ahead and once I am creating the tunnel, I can select that tunnel interface that I already created for it. So we can, right here, we can already select tunnel one. And then once we configure everything else, this will be the allocated interface for this particular tunnel. Okay, loopback interface, loopback. Click on interface, loopback. We're gonna add one loopback interface. In this case, let's call it loopback one. And this will be OSPF router ID. And we're gonna say, belongs to our router one and no security zone because this is just a, a loopback interface for our routing process. We're going to click on add and we're going to allocate an IP. In this case, I want the routing process to be 11.11.11.11, making something up. It's a slash 32 because it's a single host. And sure enough, we want to make sure that it pings. We'll press OK. Once I have that loopback interface, I can go onto the virtual router Select my router one. You already see that I have a loopback one assigned to it. So now we can configure that. Okay, once here, then I can say router ID enable in OSPF and I can type 11, 11, 11, 11. So now if I want to know that I have reachability to my, my OSPF instance, router instance, which is this Palo Alto firewall, then by pinging 11.11.11.11, I will make sure that I have reachability, which in this case is an always on loopback interface in the Palo Alto firewall. Then we'll press OK and we should be good. OK, HA interfaces or high availability interfaces. When you need to build a two firewall cluster, in this case, a highly available firewall cluster, you need to allocate some HA interfaces so you can build that synchronization between the two units. There's firewall models in the Palo Alto platform that they already come with a HA interface or multiple HA interface for this purpose. If you have a Palo Alto firewall model that doesn't come with that feature, you need to enable or change the personality of one of those interfaces to be an HA interface. And let's show you how this is done. Okay, back on our network interfaces section, click on Ethernet. And let's say we're going to make Ethernet 1 slash 3 HA interface. We'll click the interface and we'll change the interface type to be an HA interface. We'll press OK. And now it became an HA interface. So now we should be able to add this to our HA configuration or a high availability configuration. So we'll click device, high availability, and we can just click this setup here. And we'll enable HA. We'll press OK. And in our control links, and those are your HA links, this is where we allocate a specific interface. So if your Palo Alto doesn't have already assigned HA interface, you can change personality by doing what we just did and then assign that as your HA interface. Select here, and then we can assign Ethernet 3, which is your HA interface. If you don't make this an HA interface, you are not going to be able to see this popping as your options. You need to make it an HA and then you configure your HA uh, setting. Okay, and then finally, once you do everything, just press commit and you should be good. Okay, everyone. So in this video, we're going to discuss of V-wires and you want to take advantage of V-wires. And the reason why is, say you don't need to have the Palo Alto routing being a router hub. You don't need the Palo Alto to route traffic on your network. You just want to apply security policies for inbound and outbound traffic between a VLAN um, to the outside. For example, if you have a VLAN that wants to communicate to the outside, you want to apply specific policies to that VLAN. You can do it this way without having another router hub. In this case, Case, we're gonna perform some rewire configurations uh, we're gonna build a rewire sub interface because we want to take advantage also of not having multiple interfaces assigned to different V wires and the way that you do that it's you allocate a physical interface as a V wire interface and then you connect that virtually and that's the V wire so the V wire what it does is connects to physical interfaces and what you're doing in between it's adding a virtual cable like to say a virtual link that allows that to communicate so the firewall will work in transparent mode it will enforce traffic but your user or your network will not know that you're passing through a stateful firewall so with b wires i can assign sub interfaces or virtual wire interfaces onto zones and then i can put police to traffic i can put security rules between the two 
vWire instances. So we're going to do a demonstration of how you can do vWires and uh, it's very straightforward. So let's go ahead and begin. Okay, so this is our scenario. We're going to create sub interfaces in our virtual wire physical interface. So we have a topology here. We have one switch. This is our distribution switch right here. And we have, by the way, this is a school. So we have VLAN 10. All the students are actually in VLAN 10. So this access switch or distribution switch connects to all of our access switches and VLAN 10 communicates using this trunk interface that goes over Ethernet 1 slash 5 on the switch going to the Palo Alto on Ethernet 1 slash 2. This interface Ethernet 1 slash 2 is configured in virtual wire mode. We're going to configure this in virtual wire mode and then once we have that because this is a trunk we're going to make a sub interface and tag it on VLAN 10. So we then can police that particular VLAN whilst leaving the other VLAN still flowing without issues. So we want to make sure that we police VLAN 10 by creating a virtual wire sub interface on the same physical sub wire interface. And when it comes to virtual wires, this blue dotted line, this represents a virtual wire. So the virtual wire basically it's connecting or binding Ethernet 1 slash 2 virtually to Ethernet 1 slash 5. So I'm inside the Palo Alto, I'm basically bridging those two interfaces, Ethernet 1 slash 5 and 1 slash 2 with a virtual wire. So I'm actually cross connecting both of them, you know, connected logically. So, so they're actually connected using this virtual cable. Benefit of doing this is that now I can assign a zone to the ingress traffic, which is the traffic that comes from this interface, and then add another zone to this interface. So I can police traffic inbound and outbound of my firewall for VLAN 10. And again, there's no routing happening on, on the Palo Alto. This is completely transparent. This switch sees this switch completely transparent end to end. So for the switch perspective, they just see a patch going to this side. Obviously on the Palo Alto, we can prune protocol. So for example, you can allow LDP, but you know, block STP. So the Palo Alto can also filter that. But for this instance, we're just gonna go ahead and connect using a virtual wire, ethernet one slash two and one slash five. And then we're gonna make a policy that will allow this VLAN 10 to reach the core. And we're gonna have the default gateway for VLAN 10 configure on the core. So this switch will have an interface on VLAN 10 and this core will have the default gateway for the student wired subnet and this switch right here should be able to ping this default gateway once we build the virtual wire sub interface and we apply the policy to allow this traffic go through. Okay so let's go ahead and begin and we'll go from there. Okay like I show you on the uh, slide we have this distribution switch and this distribution switch is on VLAN 10. I have a sub interface, a VLAN interface on VLAN 10 and the IP address is 101002. I also have the core switch, which is 101001. And we mentioned that we have that going towards the Palo Alto. So the Palo Alto is right in the middle between those two switches, the distribution and the core. We're gonna go ahead in the Palo Alto, we're gonna configure virtual wire, we're gonna link those two interfaces together and we're gonna configure the policies and we should be able to have IP reachability end to end. Let's go ahead and go to the Palo Alto. And the first thing we're gonna do, we're gonna go to network interfaces and we're gonna select ethernet one slash two and one slash five. Those are my two interfaces. And if you like, we can go back onto the uh, visual diagram. And uh, like I mentioned, distribution switch, the IP is 101002. Core switch is 101001. And we have ethernet one slash two on the Palo Alto. And this is our ingress interface from my VLAN 10, the student wired VLAN. And my egress interface will be ethernet one slash five. We're gonna make both of them virtual wire interfaces and we're gonna apply the policies and we should be able to ping end to end between the distribution and the core switch. And that will tell us that we have reachability because we're allowing traffic on the Palo Alto. Okay, so let's go ahead and um, configure this as virtual wire. So we're gonna click on the interface. Once inside, we're gonna change the interface type into virtual wire. Okay, very important. When we're working with sub interfaces, 
the parent, and Palo Alto refers as the parent virtual wire interface, the physical interface that you're making a virtual wire, where you're gonna be configuring those sub interfaces, this is called the parent virtual wire. You're not gonna make any configurations, just make it change personality to be a virtual wire and that's it. Because you need to have the physical interface just in virtual wire mode, but no specific configurations to it. Only on the sub interfaces is where you're gonna configure the specific VLAN tags. It's very important. This is just an interface type, press okay. We're gonna do the same thing with five, okay? And once in, same thing, virtual wire. And again, nothing here, cause this is my parent, my parent virtual wire interface, okay. And now we should be able to make sub interfaces on one slash two and one slash five. So you're gonna do VLAN 10 on one slash two because we want to do the student wired VLAN as our first example. And then we need to do a mirror configuration of this sub interface here and here. So let's go ahead and make a sub interface by clicking add sub interface, add a tag of 10 and okay, IP classifier. When you're making a virtual wire interface, that is an untag interface, meaning that you're not tagging a specific VLAN onto it. You can add an IP classifier so you can say, well, anything that matches this particular IP address on the packet flow, treat it as XYZ traffic, and then you can police the traffic based on IP address. In our case, we're just making, tagging the VLAN, so anything that flows onto those interfaces and has a tag of 10, we're gonna just treat it as, as this particular sub interface. Now, we're gonna make a security zone. It will be related only to one slash two ten, and this will be our student wire ingress. And I'm gonna show you in a bit, so you can all connect the dots and understand how this works. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and, uh, configure a security zone and we're gonna make a virtual wire in a bit but for now we just want to configure the interfaces and then we'll go ahead and configure the virtual wires okay security zone and uh, in this case we're gonna make it student v wire because this is our ingress right we're gonna press ok and that's it press ok it again now we have the first one so we gotta do the same thing here because it's always is gonna be tagged from two and you gotta keep it the same way the Palo Alto will not be able to tag it you got to make sure that you keep it tagged the same way as it came in and needs to go out. So on five, add a sub interface, put dot 10, tag it with 10. Security zone, this is the big difference. We're ingressing in one two, but we're egressing in one five. So we're leaving the Palo Alto in one five, but we're actually ingressing. We're coming in the Palo Alto in one two. So this will be the egress for the student um, VLAN. Go ahead and uh, create another security zone. And we're gonna call this student vwire egress. We're gonna press okay. Press okay again. Okay, so now we have both of them configured with the respective sub interfaces. Now, we gotta make a virtual wire so we can connect them virtually in the Palo Alto with this cable right here. We're gonna make that blue dotted line and we're gonna connect Ethernet 1 slash 2 and 1 slash 5. How will that work? Number one, we gotta connect the parent virtual wire. Remember, the parent, this is physical interface that you convert into virtual wire mode. And then we'll also add the sub interface on another vWire configuration. So let's go ahead and do that, okay? So let's go ahead and click virtual wires. We'll click on add and name. We're gonna do the parent vWire. This is our parent vWire interface. The physical one slash two. You see, I am not selecting my sub interface. I am first selecting my physical interface. So we're connecting one slash two to one slash five. Link state pass through. This is very important. Okay, right now, if I do this, one slash five will become online. And if one slash two for some reason goes down, one slash five remain up. So your switch will not know that the other end of my patch cord because remember, we're doing a virtual wire between the two. They think that they're going end to end. The patch core is just going end to end. But by doing link state pass through, uh, enabling this, it will actually bring the other side down. So if my distribution switch goes down, the Palo Alto will see that this interface came down 
and it will bring this guy down again. It will disable this interface. It will tell the core, hey, you just lost that distribution. So it's going to show as the switch actually went down. And this avoids having the core up going to the distribution, but then the distribution is down and it makes troubleshooting a little bit more difficult. So this is very important. Press OK. And now we're going to do the same pattern for the second interface. Add virtual wire. And then this is our VLAN 10 sub interface. And then we're going to select now the sub interface, the ingress first, and then the egress. OK. And tag allowed, we don't need to add anything to tag allowed uh, because we're already tagging it on the interface. Press OK. So now we got the interfaces, the virtual wire connection. So we're connecting virtually 1, 2 to 1, 5. And then we're connecting virtually the sub interface 1, 2, 10, 1, 2, 1, 5, 10, sorry. And uh, yeah, once we do this, we should have that connectivity happening on the background. Okay. Now, in order for us to have connectivity, because we just isolated this VLAN 10 section to this VLAN 10 section, the ingress has been isolated from the egress. We're going to make some security policies for this. Go ahead and policies. And then on security, we're going to add. And again, we're discussing security on our next section. We're going to just deep dive into security policies. So don't worry about it. Okay. Name. We're going to say students to the outside because they want to go to the outside to the internet and they got to pass through the Palo Alto in order to hit the core switch. So we're going to go to source and at my zone. And we want to add that ingress student mv wire interface this is one slash two dot ten destination obviously the egress because we want to go out of the palo alto and then application everything else default and make sure that it's allowed click ok let's do the same thing for um backwards so if for some reason the core wants to communicate to this vlan interface and the traffic originates from the core side then you want to allow the same thing backwards so the egress becomes the ingress core to student VLAN 10 source this case will be the egress destination ingress we'll leave this as default we'll press ok and now we should be able to have everything in place and we should be able to ping end to end so let's press commit once that's done we'll give it a shot and we'll test okay it's done Okay, moment of truth. Let's take a look and see how that go. Let's um, let me pull my distribution and we should be able to ping 10, 10, 0, 1. Let's take a look at that. Boom, and we got reachability. Okay, how do you know that I'm actually passing the Palo Alto? Great question. Let's go ahead and um, go to the Palo Alto and uh, let's take a look. So, in every single security policy, you have a headcount on the end. If I was hitting policy or my traffic was actually matching this policy, I should be able to see this incrementing. It's zero, but let's do a refresh and see if that changed. And there you go. We're seeing a hit count of four. And I believe four is the total of ICMP responses that we got. So there you go. We got one, got two, three, and four. And if we go back to the Palo Alto, we have four and then let's uh, refresh and it stayed at four. So let's do another ping and see how that goes. We go ahead and up arrow. And now we have five head counts. We should have five. So one, two, three, four, five. Let's go ahead back and let's do a refresh and see if that incremented. There you go. You got five extra total of nine. So that's how you know that this rewire interface is passing traffic in and out. Now I want to do the same backwards. I want from the core ping my distribution and I will be coming from the egress and I will be going to the ingress. So I should be able to see this incrementing. And let's confirm. We don't see any increments. Let's go ahead and uh, trigger so we can see some increments happening. Go back here. And now we're going to ping dot two, which is my distribution side. There you have it. Now we have five ping responses. So by ICMP probes, let's take a look. Let's go back to Palo Alto. And uh, let me refresh. And there you go. Now we got the five. Easy, huh? Alrighty. So once this is done, you can continue doing the same, the other sub interfaces. And there you go. No routing whatsoever. It's Palo Alto is basically transparent. Once I have this, I just need to add my subnets and classify specific traffic and 
you know, the traffic or the path doesn't know that it's passing through a stateful firewall. So this is a very good way to police the traffic while keeping everything simplified. So in section four, we're going to begin discussing security policies. And this is the reason why you put a firewall in the environment. You want to isolate networks and put traffic rules behind each one so you can know what can go to what or you can enforce what is allowed to go where. In this case, what is allowed to go from this specific side of the network and what is allowed to go to this other side of the network. And this is why we have firewalls. This is the way that we enforce in and out traffic between different segments on our network. We're going to discuss how can you configure those security policies by adding attributes such as my source traffic. My IP address for the source network, that can be one option. My destination, I am going from my client network to my server network. I don't want to allow every single machine on my network to hit all servers. Maybe I don't need to. And this will provide more security on your environment if you police the network accordingly. So if we have accounting, why does the accounting subnet or the accounting users need to reach the marketing servers, for example? Or why do we need to have users on the guest network able to go basically to every single website? That's why we have a specific rule that we can say, well, guest network, but I am not allowing you to go to to this particular site. And this is why we're actually implementing a firewall. This is the benefit of putting a firewall in our network to limit the access of our end users to a specific resource, either it's on the outside or on the server side or wherever you call it a destination. So let's take a look at that. We're also going to take a look at something very important. It's very, very important that you build that policy table clean. Meaning, you know exactly what are you configuring and what's the purpose and make sure that you can nest objects together so you don't have a long policy table. And the reason why I tell that is we have something on the firewall, an issue that is called overruling, meaning that you might apply a policy to a specific destination, but then somehow you have a policy that is before that policy. And the way that the firewall enforces the traffic, it starts looking top to bottom, meaning first policy, I'm going to check. I am not matching that source or that destination. Then I'm going to check the second one and so forth. So it continues top to down. Problem is, if you have a policy denying a user going to a specific resource, either on the server environment, if there's a policy behind it that actually matches the same destination, it will overrule the one that you're denying. So the user will be able to go to the website or destination, in this case, a server, even though that you have a policy to deny it. So we have to take a look at security overruling, and that's a huge item that we need to discuss as well. Okay, so let's get started. Let's begin taking a look at the security policy tables, and we'll go from there. Okay, let's begin configuring those security policies and let's do it in a way that looks like the real deal. Like, meaning this is a day-to-day -day task for a network security engineer. You got to sign a couple of tickets and we're going to do each one of them and you're going to see how do you configure the policies based on the scenario. Okay, let's begin with ticket one. Please block the student wireless network from reaching the server subnet. I have a source network, the student wireless, and I need to block access to the server subnet from the student wireless, meaning that the students on the wireless network, they should not be able to hit the server subnet. So now we know already source zone, which in this case is the student wireless, and we also have the source address, 10, 10, 0, 0, slash 22. We also have the destination zone, and we also have the destination address. Okay, with that information, we should be able to configure that policy. Let's go ahead and do it. Let's go ahead and our Palo Alto. We're going to click on policies. We're going to click on security. And here is where you're going to do the magic. By default, the Palo Alto will have two policies Inter Zone Default and Inner Zone Default. Inter Zone Default, I am allowing, by default, Palo Alto will be allowing traffic as long as all part of the same zone meaning that you have multiple interfaces because you might have the client wireless interface on the Palo Alto where they basically route to the outside and they also have wired client subnet 
interface as well on the same zone. So I can group multiple interfaces and put them on the same zone. That traffic by default will be allowed. So I have a policy here. I am allowing that by default. And I have another one. In this case, it's the inner zone, uh, inner zone traffic. Inner zone default blocks by default. It will deny by default traffic between different zones. If I have you know, this will be your day-to-day -day activity to allow traffic because by default it's denied. I have to configure a policy to allow traffic between different zones. So let's go ahead and configure the first one. In this case, we'll be with ticket one. We're going to click security. We're going to click on add and we're going to create that first rule. Student, let's make a, a name that actually relates to the policy. Let's make something that we know it's going to help us if we need to troubleshoot. Student wireless deny to servers. Okay source i am coming from the inside my student wireless is from the inside zone this is where the zone, my traffic will be coming from source address i will need to add that student wireless subnet there we'll click on add from the policy rule section i can actually add an address object so if i don't have the student wireless in an address object then i can create it from here and again we cover address objects you want to make sure that you're creating policies using address objects and label them accordingly so you know what they're for like on new address and this name will be student wireless and you can add a description if you want in this case i have everything that i need on the name ip net mask and let's take advantage of that notepad and we're going to copy this line which is 10.10.00/22 go back to the firewall we'll paste it here we'll click ok now we have the source zone inside source address student wireless user i am just blocking the whole subnet so i'm not actually caring about specific users it's the whole subnet destination i am going to the server zone so i have a zone here destination zone it will be the server zone destination address add we're going to create another address object in this case will be the server subnet server and then again let's go ahead and uh, copy and paste select the address right here and then copy it and then let's go ahead and paste Click OK. Now I have my destination. In this case, is the server subnet. Application. Any application, because again, I just want to block full access from the student to the servers. Service. Very important. By default, the Palo Alto will assign this to be application default. In the application default, there's a list of services or ports that are allowed. So in this case, it's HTTP, HTTPS, etc. There's a list of ports that are allowed by default on the application default object. Or you can select any. In our case, we need any as our service URL category. I want to block any service regardless of what it is. Okay, so service, application default, very important. On your policies by default, we will have the application default setting on our service side. You want to make sure that you're setting this as any because this means that if the traffic is going, for example, to an HTTP, HTTPS site, that is an application default service port, meaning I will always go to port 80 if I want to go to an HTTP site. So if the source goes to that particular port, by default, the Palo Alto will see, well, that's application default, I'm going to allow it. Or if I'm going 443, which is HTTPS, that is application default, I am going to allow it or deny it. So whatever I'm putting on the actions and we'll go to the actions, I am allowing or deny it. In this case, I want to deny absolutely everything. So anything, not just application default, any. Because if I am trying to hit a custom port on the server side, this policy will not match. Because right now on the service, I'm setting this as application default. So if I map my traffic does not match the destination to be a common or default application port, I am going to allow it. This will not be blocked. So in this case, will be any actions. This is the fun part. Deny. And then we're going to log a session start or session end. In my case, I just want to do a log at session end, meaning that once the traffic, you know, the exchange between the source and destination happen, it logs the session to be completed. And then you can also send the log external log server or you can schedule policy to execute during a specific time of the day. In this case, during the weekends, I'm going to allow it, but I'm going to deny it during the weeks. 
So you can create a schedule object to do that. In this case, also, if you want to, the traffic matches this particular type of traffic, then consider this a class of service or quality of service and then apply a mark to it. So once it will get prioritized if you need to. In case we're just going to deny, we're going to click OK. Once we click OK, all we have to do is confirm that we have the deny statement, we have the destination address to be the servers, we have the source, and we have the source zone. And by the way, you can expand this if you want inside student wireless going to destination servers and the action is denied once that's done you just press commit and you should be good to go okay so the first ticket is complete let's do the second one we're getting complaints of employees watching netflix during work hours and it's causing our internet connection to crawl please block the employee subnet 10 25 23 from accessing netflix Oh, you're going to be the bad guy, but it's your job to block Netflix. Let's go ahead and do that. Okay, let's go ahead and configure that policy. Let's click on add. In this case, we're going to say employee subnet deny Netflix. We're going to click source. It's coming from the inside. Source address, I already made my object. In this case, is employee subnet. Destination. Outside. Destination address, any. We don't know Netflix public IPs, so we can just leave this in any because then I'm matching the traffic against my application object. In this case, I am going to select my application object. In this case, will be Netflix. And I already made a Netflix group because if you remember on our previous video, we discussed that applications, they're dependent upon other application objects, so I made the application group object here. In this case, we'll select Netflix service i'm going to let this in any regardless of what service i just want to block netflix and that's it service url category any action we're gonna deny you see two options deny and drop what's the action on deny block use app deny action drop silent drop send optional icmp unreachable Drop, it means that silently I'm going to drop the traffic. I don't have an action like deny does. And how do you find out what's the, the actual deny action? Let's go ahead and find that out. Let's go ahead and go to the objects, applications, and let's search for Netflix. And let's select the base. Now you can select anything, but in this case, we'll select the base. Once you select the base, on every single application description, object description, you're going to see this deny action. This is what's going to do if you set that as deny. In this case, it's going to drop and it's going to reset the session, meaning that the user will need to requery the session. But again, it will be dropped and it will be dropped and it will be dropped. In case you want to monitor the session because you want to log that activity, meaning that if you want to log the session, you need to then have a deny action so it can generate that, that drop message. And then based on that, you can block uh, or you can record the session. Let's click on close and let's go back to our policies. The object again, let's make the security, in this case, employee, wireless, employee, subnet, deny Netflix, source, inside. We already covered all this. Employee subnet, destination, I am going to the internet. In this case will be outside. And then this is the application where we select our Netflix application group. If you don't understand application group, I suggest you go and take a look at that video. It will explain why I need to make an application group. And service, we just select any. And I want to record every time that I match the policy. So in this case, I'm just going to have a deny. And then I can have a log to for that particular action. We'll click OK. And we should be good. Now we have a second policy, which is denying the employee subnet from going to Netflix. And this is my Netflix application, and you can see the actual application object here. Okay, so now we have uh, ticket number three. And for this and ticket number four, I made a little twist. Let's make it more interesting. You're going to see in a second. Ticket number three, the SLC Security Operations Center monitoring team dashboard reported more than 1,000 requests to one of our e-commerce servers, HTTPS portal, in a matter of minutes. The source address identified by our SLC came from Eastern Asia, and we only serve customers in the United States and Europe. Please block access to our DMZ from all internet, but allow USA and Europe. Okay. So we have a clear example of a possible DDoS or brute force attempt onto our DMC zone. And uh, we need to block access from the outside, but allow the United States and Europe. 
Let's go ahead and configure that. Okay, let's configure that policy that was required by the security team to make sure that we're not getting those attempts. Let's go ahead and click on add. Okay, in this case, we're gonna say outside to DMC, source add, my source traffic will be coming from the outside, from the internet. Source address, hmm, this is where we need to say we're coming from the US or Europe only. So it will be applied to the US and Europe only. Click on add and you can add a region. So if you see here, once we click add on the source address, we can scroll down and we can select the region where the traffic will be coming from. In our case, uh, it was mentioned that only the US and Europe or should be able to access the servers. So let's uh, find the US and you can go ahead also and type United States and it will sort. And we got the US here and let's click add again. And our next case will be Europe and we have uh, EU. So now we know that only traffic matching those source uh, the US and Europe will be allowed. Destination, in this case, DMC. Anything on the DMC, because uh, as long as it's coming from the United States and Europe, that's all I care. Application, any. Service, any. Or you can leave this an application default because they're basically web servers. Actions, and we're going to allow. Press OK. I have the policy, but guess what? It is not going to work. Why? Overruling. Remember we mentioned Palo Alto looks on the policy table from top to bottom. So the first rule the Palo Alto is going to see is outside access to web servers. And by the way, it's coming from the same zone, which is my outside zone, going to the same destination, and I'm allowing all addresses. So if I go here, I am allowing any address from the outside hitting the DMC. So now you wonder, no wonder why the whole planet can hit my DMZ because I have a rule on top of every other rule saying that I'm allowing every single outside address to hit my DMZ. And this is allowed. And this is why it's called overruling, meaning that once the Palo Alto sees this one and it matches that, so it doesn't continue checking the other ones. So this rule will never be applied. However, if you click the rule and you click and keep pressing the, your left click, you can move the policy all the way to the top and drop it there. And now, it's actually matching against the first one. So the rule that we configure, it will be the new rule that will be inspected to see if the traffic matches. Okay, but guess what? We're not done yet because we still have this policy down below that can still be applied to any other traffic. Because right now, if the traffic comes from the outside to the DMC, as long as I am part of that region, I am matching this one. If I am not matching this, meaning that I'm not part of this region, it doesn't mean that I'm stopped. No, actually, the Palo Alto will check the second one to see if I'm matching this one. And guess what? Yeah, I'm matching. So I'm still through. So the policy is not going to do anything because the second one will still allow traffic through. What you need to do is either convert this to the NI, or if you still need to allow, for some reason, a particular server to be reachable from the entire planet, but everything else, then you configure another policy and allow that, but deny this one. So in this case, we're just going to go ahead and click this policy. We can open the policy and make changes. And now we're going to say actions, deny, and okay. That's one way. The other way, we can just delete it. Why? Because remember, at the beginning we mentioned, we have an inner zone default policy. That policy denies by default traffic ingressing and egressing from different zones. So I don't need to put a deny. I can just let the Palo Alto continue down below, but you gotta make sure that nothing else matches this source and destination because then you might have an overruling here. So then you just let the Palo Alto do its magic and just go straight to the inner zone default and it will drop the traffic. Okay, so we got that done. Let's do ticket number four, okay? Our last ticket, ticket number four. Last week, after a policy change by another engineer, users from the marketing department were able to access the HR file server shares. Can you identify the root cause and remediate this issue ASAP? Okay, so let's take a look at our policy table. And um, it's saying that after a policy change, the marketing users were able to get to the HR file servers. So if we take a look at our policies, we can see that we have insight to internet overrule issue right here why 
we can figure out employee subnet denied to Netflix. So this rule block the employees from reaching Netflix. But guess what? Insight to Internet is before that, so it matches this one, so the employees will still be able to get to Netflix. What you have to do is drag this down. So the employee subnet denied to Netflix rule takes precedence. And that way you know that you're going to block access to Netflix, but still allow access to everything else. Okay. Let's continue on to that ticket number four. And I can see here that there's a policy access to server inside entire network servers server address object. That means that my entire network is allowing is allow access to the servers. And this is a very common scenario, folks. I actually see this happening everywhere and meaning that it's easy for someone to make something work instead of troubleshooting just allow the whole thing and then you have no purpose on the firewall because if you're doing any any there's no point of putting a firewall if you are going to allow any any between zones um, so this is a very common scenario you got to be very careful because this even though that you have a firewall you might not even be doing anything with it so we have to fix this in this case well we don't know what also it's allowed and again we want to limit the impact of this change our ticket was only to avoid or deny access to the HR from the marketing team so let's go ahead and um, configure that policy okay let's call this marketing deny to HR servers and source inside source address you know what I have my employee subnet because it's part of that the marketing the marketing it's sitting here but how do I know that I can classify based on the marketing this is where the user policy will come in place we'll click the user tab and then we're going to add a user group and remember on a previous video we have access to to our AD so we can classify the traffic to our AD environment so one way to do it it's grabbing the marketing team right and then adding this as our source user and then configuring the policy and then denying it so that way you're blocking the marketing team another way is because it's hr so someone else you know it's only hr should be able to hit that because right now if we put a policy for the marketing team if there's any other team that is not hr they will still be able to go to the server so it's better to allow what needs to be allowed than to deny every single subnet that it's not allowed to hit the uh, policy so you just make a cleaner policy table by only allowing what's allowed and then denying everything else let me show you real quick user in this case we're going to allow the hr staff to hit their servers destination in this case will be the servers and i have the add object here we can create a new one hr server and we can say this is the 10 30 0 10 32 because it's a single host or you can just leave this without click OK now we have destination address as my HR server application any and then in this case it's any or unless you know the file share protocol that you're using actions allowed okay so now we know that the HR staff inside the employee subnet they're gonna be able to hit that HR server However, I still have an overruling because rule two allows everything and this rule will not take place. So let's move this right one step below this one. And now I am allowing, by the way, I should rename this. Let's go ahead and rename that. Say HR allow to HR server. And then from the employee subnet, I am allowing the HR staff to go to the HR server as my destination. And let's go ahead and uh, configure another one to deny everything else. In this case, deny access to HR servers. Source, add, inside, source address, the employee subnet going to the destination, which is the server side destination address, the HR server. And then let's leave this in default. Actions, we're going to deny. Okay, and then make sure that it's denied. We'll click OK. And now we have that rule which will deny access to the HR servers. What we need to do to make this effective, because we still have access to servers, which we're going to allow everything, even though that I'm only allowing 
the HR to go to the HR servers on rule number two. Rule mo number three is it's going to allow every single IP on the network to hit the servers. We want to make sure that we deny access to the HR server. So let's go ahead and uh, move that policy right on top of access to server. And now we can say that anyone belonging to the employee subnet will be denied access to the HR server. Again, you want to limit the impact of this change because you don't know, first of all, what was done by the previous engineer, what was the reason behind it. But if you block unnecessary IPs from reaching a destination, you might disrupt production. So you don't want to do that. You want to, yeah, meet the requirements with the ticket was to deny access to the HR server, to the marketing team, but you basically made a rule to allow HR hit their servers and deny everyone else. So once every other member of the corporation needs to reach this HR server, they will be denied by this policy and they're not going to go and fall onto the access global policy. And there you have it, straightforward. And it's actually very important for you to understand order of operations, in this case, top to bottom. The Palo Alto will take a look at the policies from top to bottom, and it's gonna enforce the traffic by doing that. If you have a policy that it's overruling another one, you might see that you are still allowing traffic even though that you put a policy to block it. And chances are there's a rule on top of that taking priority versus the one that you configure. So you got to be very careful on that, but you know, practice makes perfection. So I actually recommend you to start practicing your security policies in a dev environment. So you make sure that you configure this accordingly and make sure that you also label your objects clearly and as well as the policy. So you know what they're doing. Okay. okay, everyone, in this video, we're going to take a look at routing context or better known as virtual routers. So this particular feature on the Palo Alto will allow you to separate routing instances. In a better term, you can have interfaces allocated to a router and quote router because it's still a router. The only difference here is virtually created on the Palo Alto. So you have two interfaces. One is sitting on the outside side of your network, in this case, the internet, or and the other one is sitting on the core side or the inside. And then you allocate that side of your network into router one. And then you create virtual router one. You assign those two interfaces together. And then those are members of that particular router. It's like, imagine yourself, as you have a router appliance or a hardware router and you're plugging those two ports in that particular router and then you create your route statements either you put static routes or you turn on dynamic routing such as ospf or bgp and you configure your routing statements benefit of doing this one you separate routing instances you have an easier way to troubleshoot routing because you're actually segmenting traffic in Palo Alto if you have an issue on the internet side you don't need to look at any other place the particular firewall but the router on the internet side if it's related to a routing issue second security so your servers most definitely they'll route the same way that the clients are routing on the environment but you don't want the clients to have direct access to the servers you want the clients to go through the palo alto and if you can take a look at the picture that i'm showing here on the slide i basically have two interfaces i have one interface and my core switch is plugged in into port 2 on the palo alto and this port 2 belongs to the router 1 which is the internet router Port 3 belongs to router 2. On my core switch, I have a routing statement or a static route saying, if I want to go to the internet, please send all traffic to the IP that is assigned on interface Ethernet 2. So now everyone basically will hop onto the Palo Alto and hit this router. And from there, you go straight to the internet. If the clients, they need to reach the servers, they'll need to pass through the Palo Alto firewall in order to get to the server. So what's the purpose of that? This is when we can apply security policies because I'm going to have two interfaces. The interface between my core and my server router, I can call it router 2 or the server router, it's sitting on the untrusted. So anything that arrives from this particular interface or the untrusted needs to have a security policy that will allow that to communicate to the trusted. 
and you see what's the benefit of having separate routing instances. You can still do it in this one, right? Do you want complexity as you keep adding networks and networks onto your Palo Alto? I don't think so. I will not like a complex environment. If I have those features available, I might as well use them. So this is the real reason you want to have different routing instances because you apply particular settings to each one and if you need to troubleshoot or if you need to make changes, you're not impacting the whole environment in one single change. You're only impacting what's only being used on this particular routing instance or this one. Another thing, I can have another core switch here and the clients are basically separated beyond my Palo Alto in order to hit the servers. This is also what is known on the common Cisco IOS and XOS world as a VRF, so virtual routing forwarding instances. So you create a VRF, you add the interfaces onto it, and you separate that traffic. If you want VRFs or virtual routing instances to talk between each other in the Cisco world, you need to create a um, route leaking. In this case, you create an ACL, you call a couple of subnets, and you perform route leaking, and that's how you can basically leak traffic between the two. Uh, we're not obviously discussing this on our training session, but we're discussing a very similar approach to segment that type of traffic. And then also you limit your routing table to be a smaller one, because also you don't want to have a long list of subnets and routing statements or routing adjacencies all belonging to one particular router. You want to make sure that you have that separated, and this is the reason why you want to adopt uh, virtual routers. So you will see now on my presentation, I will be configuring this environment. I will configure the inside side, going to the outside, and we'll have a interface configured and connected to port two. We're gonna have also another interface from my core connected to port three, and they're basically going to two different routers. Router one sends all traffic to the internet. Router two sends all traffic to the server side. So you now know that your servers are completely isolated via the Palo Alto. So any client, any guest on your network, any end device will need to have on the Palo Alto, head the server router, head the security policy in order to get allowed and, and go to the server side. So let's begin, let's take a look at that and we'll go from there. Okay, let's go ahead and configure our first router and we're gonna configure virtual router one and this will provide internet service to our internal users. So let's go ahead and begin with this one. In order to configure a virtual router, we're gonna go into network, we're gonna click virtual routers and we're gonna click add. Once inside the virtual router window, we're gonna select the name, in this case, we're going to configure that virtual router one. We're going to call it VRTR1 INET, which is our internet router. And then let me give you a quick walkthrough of what the options are. In general, we have the session where we assign the interfaces that are going to belong to this particular virtual router. In this case, if you have two interfaces, one facing the outside, one facing the inside, you're going to be allocating them here. Equal cost multipathing, if your environment needs to have equal cost multipathing, you can enable here, add the, the two interfaces and enable ACMP. We're gonna go here into static routes and this is where you add static routes onto this particular virtual router instance. If you wanna add a particular route pointing to an interface, you can add it here. So if we click add, in this case, say I wanna go to the outside and uh, this is my default route or the quad zero route and basically select Zero, 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 and then we can point it to a specific interface that belongs to the virtual router and this is we're going to be allocating the interfaces in a bit once we allocate them you should be able to select them from here next hop then we're going to tell okay in order for us to get to this destination this is my next hop on the interface that i'm selecting and that will send the traffic to that destination and then from there the forwarding router will take care of it I mean, distance, you know, depends on if you have multiple static routes and each one will have a preferred distance over the other. So we're going to be creating a preferred route versus the other. You can tweak this here. A metric, you can set metrics per route. And again, it's a way to do some routing customizations or do some sort of basic routing engineering in this case. Route table, in this case is a unicast route table. You can configure a multicast if you are routing multicast on the Palo Alto, you allocate this particular route as a multicast route. Bidirectional forwarding detection, if you want to enable BFD on the interfaces, so you have a faster 
reconvergence in case the interface bounces, you have a faster way to send that hello versus the normal second interval that it's by default. So you can enable uh, BFD here. Monitoring, if you want to monitor the path and then select, hey, this is the condition that I want to have in case this path when you know path a went down i want to switch to path b you can configure it and and then you need to have path monitoring enabled to for this to work so let's go ahead and um, continue if you want to do redistribution either static into dynamic uh, you can do it from here it has the options for both ipv4 and ipv6 enabling rip very old routing protocols. I will be surprised if there's still environments, internal environments using RIP, but you know, I've seen it all. So I most certainly will be able to see one. OSPF, same thing, very common. You configure OSPF. We're gonna be configure that on the server router. So I'm gonna show you how to configure OSPF. You have version two as well as version three. So we can select either one of them, you know, what your environment is currently running. BGP, you have the option of going full-blown BGP, and, uh, and again, you select Enable, and then you add the properties, and you're good to go. Multicasting, you can configure a local RP or rendezvous point for specific multicast. SSM, having, you know, interfaces, participating in multicast, all this is available via the virtual router. So every time that you create a virtual routing instance, it's a completely independent setting from the other virtual router that you already have. So every time that you create a virtual router, it's like creating a completely different virtual appliance and with individual settings. So let's go ahead and create the first one. And this is virtual router one INET. And in general, we're not gonna type anything because we haven't allocated any interfaces yet. So let's go ahead and just create the virtual router. And now we mentioned in our slide that we want to allocate interface Ethernet 02 to be the interface, inbound interface for my internal clients. So let's go ahead and uh, select interface 2 and allocate that to the router that we just created. Select interface 2. Very important, let's select this to be a layer 3 interface so we can add that to the virtual router. And then this is here where we select the new virtual router that we just created. So by doing that, the interface has been enabled in the particular routing instance. And then security zone, and we're gonna say this is our inside. IPv4, let's configure an IP address, and this IP address will be .1 on the Palo Alto side. On my core side, I already have this subnet with .2, so we're gonna configure that one on the Palo Alto. Let's type it in real quick. By the way, it's gonna be a slash 30. Okay, and then advanced, let me make sure that we have ping. Okay, so we have the first one and we're gonna click commit and we should have that routing instance or virtual router allocated with interface ethernet port two. Once we do that, we're gonna do now, particularly I have an interface sitting on the outside and I'm just gonna allow that to get a DHCP address because that interface sits on a DHCP enabled network. And we're gonna add that again. This is our outside interface and you can type a comment here, okay? And then let's make this the outside, belong to the same router, IPv4. And we're just gonna make it a DSCP client because there's one IP allocated to it. Make sure that we can ping it. And okay, we should be good on there. Let's hit commit. Now we have 10.100.255.1. I have a core switch that I already configured with dot two so let's take a look at that okay so that port it's dot two take a look real quick by the way i typed 100 this will be dot 200 just let me correct this real quick here that will belong to the inside to outside and then i have 100 which will go to the server side press commit and we should be good to do a testing to know that we're reaching the palo alto from the core switch okay so i'm here on my core switch so you can see uh, port 5 goes to port 2. Port 2 on the Palo Alto is that 1. Port 5 is that 2. So let's take a look and see if uh, we can ping it. We know that we're doing enter and reachability. So this is my local. And let's see if our uh, results. There you go. So I'm able to ping it. So that tells me that I got end to end communication between those two interfaces. So let's do some magic here. Let's now make that router talk to the outside. I have a dedicated outside interface and I just want to make sure that I can route to the outside. Okay, in order for me to route, I need to do a quick NAT. 
and we're going to discuss NAT on our next video. For this purpose, I'm just going to configure it real quick, and uh, we'll go from there. So let me go here quick and NAT, at, we're going to do a uh, source NAT. We're going to say outside, and it's coming from my source zone, which will be the outside, the inside, any source address, and we're going to do a dynamic IP import. We're going to select our interface, and this is my outgoing interface, and I'm just going to use the um, interface IP. And as a matter of fact, just apply the NAT. However, I don't have a security policy. So even though that I have both interfaces, the outside and the inside on the router, they're not going to be able to talk because I don't have a policy allowing those two interfaces, the inside and the outside to talk. And we can make sure that's actually accurate. So if I ping the outside, let's ping a.8.8, I cannot go anywhere. Make sure that I got the route. I do have uh, the default route, which points to that one but i can definitely not ping so let's fix that by putting a simple security policy in place and we should be good to go go ahead real quick configure a quick security policy let's call this inside to internet and then source it's going to be inside going to the outside and we'll just leave this on default we're going to allow okay and i'm just going to press commit and now we should be able to have communication to the outside. Okay, let's go ahead and give it a shot, see if uh, we're lucky. Yes, we are. So, very simple. We did our first virtual router, and this is router one. This allows our core switch to reach the outside between the inside and the outside interfaces. So we created those interfaces, we allocate them into the zones, inside zone and outside zone. We added those interfaces onto the virtual router, and then I basically created an ad rule and a secure policy and boom, I have reachability to the outside. Let's go ahead and do uh, the second router. This one will allow my core, this is my inside core switch, to hit the servers which are on a completely separate network. Okay, we, based on the slide, we already have this up and running. So we have that two and that one and I'm sending all the traffic and it goes to the outside via router one. Let's do the same thing for router two. Uh, let's go ahead and configure router two and we're gonna make the untrusted interface here and then allocate that to router two. We're gonna configure a subnet on the server side and we're gonna make sure that we can ping from the inside to the outside. But in this case, we're gonna make it a little bit more interesting. We're gonna put OSPF in between, we're gonna do a dynamic peering between those two devices, the Palo Alto firewall and the core switch. Okay, let's go back onto network, virtual routers, and let's create the second one, which will be a virtual router two. And let create that second router, which will face the servers. Click okay, we have it there. Now we gotta allocate the other interface, in this case will be interface three to the router two. We're gonna add that real quick. Go ahead and two interfaces. Let's select interface three. We're gonna make it a layer three. Remember, it has to be layer three. Let's assign that to the server router. And uh, we're gonna call this on the untrusted interface. So we know that this is the interface that wants to go to the servers, but it's the untrusted because it's, it's coming from the client core. IPv4, we're gonna allocate an interface for this one. And based on our slide, it's gonna be 30. And uh, in advance, we're gonna make sure that we can ping that interface. And you know, we should be good to go. Let's hit commit. And let's give it a shot and test that I can reach this dot one here on the server side. Okay, so I do have the dot two address that faces the server router. So you can see it here and it's connected to port seven. Um, so I have dot two, I should be able to ping that dot one. So let's give it a shot and see uh, if we're lucky and this is a local one and let's see if we're, we're lucky enough there you go we are able to ping from the core to the Palo Alto I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, configure OSPF I'm gonna do a basic configuration I'm gonna enable that interface that is facing the Palo Alto as a point-to-point -point OSPF a network point-to-point -point interface and I'm gonna be doing the same thing on the on the Palo Alto and enabling OSPF on the other side my router server router and uh, let's go to OSPF. We got one. We add we're gonna add the area. This is where we allocate the area. In our case we're just gonna do the backbone area and it's inserted in a wildcard fashion. So you gotta type it in wildcard. Let's make it just a normal for now. 
uh, range interface or range, you want to allocate the subnets that you want to advertise here on the range. And on the interface, you enable OSPF to listen uh, for hellos on that particular interface that you allocate here. We want to do that with port 3. This is the port that is participating in the router 2. We're going to enable it. If you want to make it passive, you can enable it as passive by just clicking here. And our link type, because my core is point to point, we want to make sure that we're setting up a point to point here. And this is how you can tweak OSPF hellos and dead and retransmits and whatnot. You can tweak it here if you need to. Metric, authentication profile. So if you want to do OSPF, a secure OSPF, like have MD5 hash between your two switches, you can do it from here. And uh, priority and bidirectional forward detection, you can configure those profiles here as well. Click OK. And now we have the interface here. We'll press OK. OK again. And we're going to press commit. Now I should be able to see an OSPF adjacency popping on the core switch. This will be the Palo Alto, which is router ID.1 appearing with router ID.2. And then we're going to take a look at the Palo Alto and see if we also can see more information about the OSPF peering. Let's go real quick to the core. Let me show IP OSPF neighbors. And yes, I just got an adjacency. My neighbor ID is this is the Palo Alto has been established and uh, by via Ethernet 1 slash 7. Let's take a look from the Palo Alto side and see how that looks. And right here on my virtual router section, you select runtime stats. And this is where you're going to see adjacency forming and you're going to see any dynamic routes that are learned over that peering. Click on more. And uh, we see that we have a peering between my local interface and my core switch. So I have a way to see an OSPF that I have a neighbor. There you go. So this is my core switch. And if you click here on my OSPF, I have my neighbor address, which is that two and I'm that one. This is the one that I configure on my local virtual router. Close. And now let's add another interface. And this will be the interface that belongs to the server side. And I just want to simulate that I have another network. So in this case, I'm just going to make a loopback and assign that to this particular subnet. And then I'm going to advertise that in OSPF and the core switch should be able to see the route. So let's go back onto the core and let's take a look right now. You can see I only have directly attached interfaces learn over my core switch. Once I have that subnet, that loopback address, advertising OSBF of the Palo Alto, I should be able to see that OSBF uh, route right here. So let's go ahead and configure that real quick. Let's go back to the Palo Alto. Okay. And let's create a loopback interface. One, and this will be the server subnet or server one. In this case, we're going to assign that to the virtual router, uh, server router. Security tone, this will be a trusted device so this subnet or this host belongs to the trusted zone ip4 add and we're going to allocate an ip this ip we said that it was going to be 10 to 55 01 and let's make it just a single slash 32 for now and let's make sure that we can ping it so we can test that we're able to connect to it okay so we should be good to go click okay now i need to add that into ospf Let's go enter virtual routers, the server router. Let's go to OSPF and let's select our existing area, configure area right here. And let's add that new interface, which is a loopback. And in Palo Alto, you cannot have it as an active. It has to be a passive interface. So we just need to enable this, but this is just for this demonstration. For loopback interfaces, you have to make it as passive. And then we'll press OK. But now, because it's passive, I need to advertise the subnet that interface is currently sitting at. I'm just going to create a local area or a local network that I want to advertise. In this case, it will be that one slash 32. That is my loopback address. If I want to make a slash 24, I can do so and it will still fall on the range. And I want to advertise that. And again, this is if you have a network that you want to advertise but the interface that it's sitting on, it's not necessarily participating in OSPF. This is the way you just add the range onto your OSPF process and boom, it should be showing on the uh, core switch. Click OK, press OK, let's commit and uh, we should be good to go. OK, finally, let's take a look at that. There you have it. So now we know that we're seeing 10.25501 
via this path, which is my router one. But I am not going to be able to ping it because I still need a security policy to allow the traffic between the untrusted and the trusted. Let's take a look if we can ping that address. And sure enough, we cannot ping that address. So let's go ahead and fix that by making a security policy. Go back to Palo Alto, policy security. We'll click on add. I'm going to say untrusted to trusted source. Add untrusted destination. Trusted application will leave as it is. Actions and we're going to allow. And uh, we have the policy there. And we're going to press commit. And then we're going to test ping and see if uh, we can reach now that loopback interface. Okay. Let's go ahead and ping, and uh, we should be able to see a head count incrementing here. Back on my core switch, press the up arrow, and sure enough, we can ping, and now we should be able to see a head count incrementing on the Palo Alto. And sure enough, those are my five ping responses. There you have it. Simple. It's a little bit of practice, but it allows you to have complete isolation between your network segments. So if you want to isolate the server environment from the clients and have the Palo Alto enforce policies between those two network segments, you can do it by allocating different virtual routers. Again, you can do it without a, with a single virtual router. Do you want to have a lot of route statements on a single router or do you want to have everything more clean, more granular? In this case, it works very good also when you implement virtual firewalls. And we're going to discuss virtual systems or virtual firewalls. This is a mandatory item. We got to have a virtual router allocated to each. And we're going to take a look at that and how do you leverage that routing virtual router service that Palo Alto offers. Okay, everyone, in this video, we're going to be looking at performing NAT on the Palo Alto firewall. In this case, we're going to do destination NAT, a very, very common task we do on firewalls. We have our scenario here. In this case, we have a client with a public IP. And we have a web server that is sitting on the DMZ. This network cannot reach my client because it's on the outside. Private address spaces are not routable to the outside, in this case, to the internet. So we need to perform a destination NAT in order for this client to reach this particular server because it's hosting an application uh, publicly available. We need to create a destination NAT policy and also a security policy to allow that client reach that particular web server. So we're going to create, first of all, our NAT object. Once we create that object, we're then going to have that particular inside address allowed from the outside end in order for my client to hit that particular web server. So let's go ahead and begin uh, configuring destination NAT. Let's go ahead and configure a NAT rule that will allow communication from the outside to that web server. Go ahead and click on policies. Let's click on NAT and then we're going to click add. Let's type the name of the NAT rule. In this case, will be web server one and we're going to call it destination NAT. And we mentioned we're coming from the outside, right? We're going to the DMZ, but this is a tricky part here. In Palo Alto, destination is still the outside because the IP that we're pointing from the client side, it's the outside public IP, not the DMC. So you got to be very careful when you configure a destination NAT on the Palo Alto because you want to go to the destination that the public IP is currently sitting at. So in this case, we're going to the same destination. And I know it, it looks a little bit confusing. In reality, it makes sense. You're going to a public IP as the destination. So you're coming from the outside, but you're still hitting at a public IP that is sitting on our outside network. And this is where translation will take magic. Once we convert that into the private IP, then it will forward onto the security policy and then it will traverse the zone. So it will traverse from the outside to the DMZ in this case. And you'll see it in a bit. Destination, zone, outside, destination interface. You can select a specific interface that that traffic wants to hit on the outside. But in this case, we're just going to leave it as a any. It's just going to select any available interface and see if either one of them will match the destination, either based on a route. So you might have a route going to that actual destination via a particular interface, or else you just let the Palo Alto, you know, find the match and, and select that particular interface. Uh, source address. Any, 
coming from the outside. We don't know what's the uh, source address of my client side, so we're just going to leave it as any. Destination. Okay, destination will match the public IP because remember, we're going to the outside zone and the destination on the outside is still the public IP. So in our slide, we mentioned that it was the 40.33.22.10. The 40 and that is my web server's public IP and this is the IP that we're gonna allocate and we're gonna point it to the actual server on the DMZ and then translated packet okay so we have the source address translation and in this case we're doing destination on the second video we're gonna do source address translation destination address translation translation type dynamic IP or static static it's basically a one-to-one -one NAT we're mapping the public IP to the specific inside or in this case DMZ IP. So we want to do a static on this case. Translated address. This is where the actual server's private address will, will be translated to. This case will be 10100010. Port. If you want to map a specific port, in this case PAD or doing port address translation, you can map to a specific port. In this case, we're just going to do a one to one NAT. Any port to, you know, from any source, we're just going to map it to this particular as long as it hits the web server. So we're going to the web server. No matter what destination port, it's just going to translate using a one to one basis. And we're going to go and click OK. OK, so now we have the uh, rule there. We have the source zone and destination. Both of them are the outside. Sure, because you're coming from the outside and you want to hit an IP that is still on the outside, right? However, once it hits this, the Palo Alto will see, oh, well, going to the outside and this is my IP, but I do have a rule that if you want to get here, let me forward you to this actual translation, which is DMC web server's actual IP. Okay, so we have that. Second part, we want to allow the security. This just does not translation. This just translates the address. It does not allow the traffic to go through. So you got to make sure that you configure one, the NAT rule, and then the security rule. So we got two policy tables, NAT policy table and security policy table. Now we need to allow the traffic inbound to that public IP. And this is another thing that will make you a little bit confused but it also makes sense you're still going to the public ip so you're trying to reach a resource that is sitting on this public ip however the real ip is this one so want to make sure that you have that clear and again practice makes perfection make sure that you practice this if you have a, a test palo alto you can definitely build this very easily and practice so you can get the idea security let's click on add name call this web server one dash nat Let's click on source. In this case, my source is the outside because I am coming from the outside. Source address, we don't know the source of the address. Destination, this is what it gets a little bit more confusing. Now we're actually pointing the DMZ because this is my true destination. But even though that I'm translating to a pointing a public IP, as soon as the NAT takes place, it actually points to the inside, or in this case, to the actual zone, which is the DMZ zone. And then basically, Destination address, very important. What address do you think we're going to add this on the destination? If you were thinking the private IP, you're wrong. It's the public IP. Again, yes, it doesn't make sense because we're actually going to the DMC. It should be the destination of the actual DMC address, but no. We're going, the match will make this Palo Alto for the traffic to the actual destination, which in this case is the DMC, and you're going to see it in a bit. And by the way, we can do it for this demonstration. Let's put the DMC and see what happens. We're just going to leave it as, as the private, but it definitely will be the public. So you're going to see that in a bit. And uh, allow application. Let's just make sure that we're just allowing everything because I, I want to just do a ping test to the actual server. Click OK. And let's go ahead and first of all, let's go ahead and click commit. And once we commit, we'll test and see how that goes. Okay, so I just wanted to explain a little bit in case you were a little bit confused. We have to make two policies. One, the NAT rule, and then the security rule or security policy. Destination NAT rule. I am incoming from the outside, and I am hitting a public IP that is still on the outside, because that's the public IP that everyone will point in order for them to reach the web server. So source, I am incoming from the outside, but I'm still reaching a public IP that is going to be on the outside. But then my NAT rule will say, well, if you're pointing to that public IP that is sits on the outside zone, 
I'm going to translate that to my real IP, which in this case will be the DMC server's IP. Now, we need to allow that traffic to go inbound into the web server because we just made the translation but we haven't done the security policy source zone still the outside now we're actually going to the real destination now this is a security policy we need to allow the outside to talk to the dmz but the destination address will match the public address that has been used as the destination nap in this case, the address that sits on my destination NAT rule, it's my actual destination address in the security policy. And I actually configure the security policy to put the actual private or real. So you can see that it will not work if we do it that way. It has to be the public or the address that everyone is pointing. So it actually matches the traffic and sends that to the correct destination. We want to say that the Palo Alto, hey, you want to find that public address in the DMC. However, that public address, it's, it's basically just a translated address or the NAT that we're using to get to the actual web server. So let's go ahead and um, see how that goes on the virtual machine. So I have a like a very, very lightweight virtual machine. And uh, this virtual machine will act as the client. And I should be able to ping the outside interface on the Palo Alto from this uh, virtual machine. Okay, so let's go ahead and ping my outside. Okay, so this is the Palo Alto's outside interface. Now we know that we have reachability. However, if we pin the NAT address that we're intending to hit in order for us to get to the web server, remember, I just put the security policy to point to the actual private IP, and this will not work. Let's go ahead and do it. And you can see we're timing out. Let's go back onto the Palo Alto and see how that looks like on the head counter. Okay, so if we take a look at the NAT, we indeed saw that it got a hit count of five. However, we're not able to reach ICMP, so we're not able to ping the web server because the policy it's pointing to the private IP instead of the public, and we don't have a match because I am still sending the traffic inbound using the destination as the public IP. And this is why it will not match the rule. It will fall straight into my implicit deny. So you can see here that I have five hit counts. It's an implicit deny because the destination hasn't been translated. Till I have approval to move between the zones, then I will be translating myself to the actual destination, to the real destination. So let's make that change and see the outcome. Let's go ahead and uh, remove here. I'm going to click a new, I'm going to add a new one. In this case will be the public translated address. 4033, 22, 10. Okay, let's press OK. And now let's apply it and see what will happen. Okay, uh, commit has finished. Let's go ahead and uh, open our virtual machine and give it a shot again. Difference, huh? Like I mentioned, the Palo Alto still needs to see that the destination is the public IP, even though that it's not a real, you know, it's just a translated address. I need to first match destination to be the public so the Palo Alto can perform the translation on it. I am actually hitting the NAT rule. I am actually matching the NAT rule, but until I have access to the DMC, then it's gonna be applied. I am actually gonna be translated. So very important. And again, practice makes perfection. Just practice on your own, lab it, and you're gonna understand why this is the way to do destination NAT on the Palo Alto. And let's take a look at the hit counter and see if uh, we now have inc uh, increments. Let me uh, do a quick refresh, and sure enough, now I have five hit counts on that particular policy. Okay, everyone, in this video, we're gonna take a look at how to configure SourceNet on our Palo Alto firewall. The reason why you wanna do SourceNet is that you have your source address. In our case, you can take a look here at our, our slide. We have a client that is sitting on the 172.16.10 network. He needs to reach a web server that is on a site to site tunnel so you have a site to site tunnel appearing with a vendor that they have an application hosted on their data center and they told you that you need to peer via a ipsec tunnel between your firewall and their um, firewall and the web server that your clients or your employees will need to reach is on the 10 20 10 network but 
the vendor told you we cannot allow IPs that does not fall on the 10 200 100 address space this is the address space that I gave you so you can send your traffic and your request you cannot send me your native IP I am going to drop that on my firewall and this is where SourceNet comes into place with SourceNet we can basically grab this source address and convert that to a translated address convert that to a, an address that is allowed to go over the site to site tunnel so you have 172 16 10 once it passes the firewall and the Palo Alto does the source NAT translation it changes the source IP to be 10 20 120 in this case then it's allowed and you can reach your application in this case the 10 20 10 10 web server another very common example is the internet your machine it's sitting on a private address you know that private addresses are not routable on the outside you need to convert that private address into a publicly routable address in this case your outside interface will be sitting on the uh, ISP network and your source address will be translated to that external interface address this is a most common use for SourceNet and uh, we're gonna take a look at how to configure it on the Palo Alto firewall alrighty so let's get started let's do a SourceNet and I'm gonna basically configure the common you know inside to outside SourceNet this is the case if you have your internal private network you want to reach the internet or your public circuits you need to translate your private address into a, to your outside address or if you have a public IP block or a prefix that was assigned to your uh, to your circuit by your ISP you can do an IP NAT pool and then add those public IPs there and you can translate your inside clients to the outside using those public IPs so let's begin and let's configure source NAT in our demonstration we're gonna have the DMC zone we have a server on the DMC that needs to talk to the outside to the outside world in this case the internet the server it's sitting on the 10 100 slash 24 network but as we all know this network is not routable to the internet I cannot reach the internet natively using this IP because it's a private address so we need to translate that to the outside interface IP which is a very common scenario where you want to translate your inside network to the outside interface IP in this case your public IP okay so let's go ahead and uh, do this demonstration and we also will be configuring the security rule and we'll do a ping test to make sure that we're able to reach the internet and this will be tested before and after so you can definitely tell that the rule is taking place okay so let's begin let me uh, first of all I'm going to show you that I have a machine that it's trying to ping 1.1.1.1 it's one of those public DNS servers that you can point your machine to so right now my machine it's sitting on the DMC network which is the 10.100 and my machine's locals IP it's dot 100 if I want to ping my gateway is dot one the gateway it's on my DMC interface and the Palo Alto firewall so let's take a look at that DMC interface go ahead in the Palo Alto and we're gonna go to network interfaces and right here you see that 10 101 it's my default gateway and I have my test machine sitting on the dot 100 I am trying to ping a outside address and I'm not able to let's give it a shot to so you can see that I am not able to go outside the reason why like I mentioned earlier my IP is private I cannot route using that as my native IP if I want to go to the internet because it's a private address so let's fix that let's first of all configure the source NAT in order for you to configure the source NAT you're gonna to go to policies NAT and this is where we're gonna configure that NAT policy let's call this DMC to outside NAT and we're gonna say the original packet will be come from the DMC that's my source at my source zone and my machine comes from the DMC this will be my source I want to go to the outside that's my destination zone destination interface will be Ethernet 1 slash 1 this is my internet interface this is the interface where I have that public circuit connected to and then my source address we want to allocate DMC network if you have multiple networks and not all of them you want them to route to the outside you want to make sure that you don't select any and you specify which source addresses are allowed to hit this NAT rule 
In this demonstration, because we only have one network, I'm just going to leave it as any. And obviously, we want to leave this as any for the outside because you don't know where you're going to the internet. Millions of addresses, so you just leave that as any. Translated packet. This is where the magic happens. Let's go ahead and, and source address translation because we're doing a source NAT. We're going to select the type of translation. We have dynamic IP import, and this is the IP, the same source address IP. But, you know, you can keep having TCP sessions using that same source address. You also have a dynamic IP. So this is, you have a, an IP pool and you have multiple IPs on that outside IP. And let me bring the notepad so I can explain a little bit on that. Say your ISP, let's put this as a 30 address. So your ISP gave you 40.30.150.0 slash 24. So you have 252 usable hosts there, right? And you want to make sure that you can use all of them to go out. Maybe you don't want to, and I would not, this is a waste of public IPs. I would rather have like a range of one through 10. So in that case, I'm just gonna create an IP pool of 150.1240301.50.10. So I am actually allocating from one to 10, all those IPs are going to be uh, used to translate my inside to my outside. So that's when you want to have a dynamic IP pool. That's one way to take advantage of that translation type. In our case, we're just going to do a dynamic IP import. Let's go ahead and uh, change that to be from the translated. So this is where you can select a range of IPs or any specific IP that you want your customers to be translated from or your clients. In our case, we just want to translate using the interface address. And obviously we got to select our interface and this is the outgoing interface. Remember, this is the interface that I'm going to leave the zone. So I'm going to go to the internet via this interface, which is one slash one IP address. I am not going to select any IP address here. And the reason why, because I am selecting the interface, I'm just going to use the default interface IP. So whatever is the assigned interface IP, I'm just going to use that to go out. We're going to press okay. And there you have it. So we have a NAT rule. Anything that comes from the source of the DMZ going to the outside, it's going to be translated using the destination interface of Ethernet 1 slash 1. So this is the first port on the Palo Alto. And my source address, my destination address will be anything coming from the DMZ going to anything on the outside will be translated using the dynamic IP import of Ethernet 1 slash 1. Okay, so that's step one. We just did our source NAT. And uh, in order for us to have reachability, we have to configure, obviously, the routing statement. So we have those two zones allocated into the INET router, the virtual router. And if you saw our previous video, we discussed routing context, and we configure that INET router. So let's take advantage of that one. Let me go ahead and go to network, virtual routers. We're going to select uh, INET, and then inside INET, I need to set my static route so I can tell the Palo Alto, hey, if I want to go to an unknown destination on my default route, my send it via interface Ethernet 1 slash 1. So I'm going to say outside route, and it's going to be 0, 0, 0, 0. Via 1 slash 1, my next hop will be my outgoing default gateway or my outgoing router on this network. In this case, my outgoing router will be 20. That one. We'll press OK here. We'll press commit. And I'm doing this on purpose because we're still missing something. And this is a common thing when someone configures a NAT rule. He forgets something very, very essential. And uh, I'm going to leave you to think what we're missing. Okay, so I got the route, I got the NAT statement. What do you think that I'm missing to make this a pingable destination? Well, if you mention security policy, you are absolutely correct. We need to configure security policy to allow that DMC network to reach the outside network. So let's go ahead and do that real quick. And we should be able to see this starting to ping. So let's go ahead back to policies, security, and you can see I don't have my source zone from the DMC going to the outside. I don't have a rule for that. So let's create that and let's allow that traffic to go through. DMC to outside. My source, I am incoming from the DMC. And I'm going to leave this in any for now. Destination, outside, any destination address. 
application, we're going to leave this in any application default. We can leave this in default action. You want to make sure that you're allowed and logged at the session end so you can get some monitoring going on. We'll press OK and watch while the magic happens. We're going to press commit and I'm going to bring the console session so you can see while it's committing how we start pinging. So let me bring this back up and watch while we're committing. You should start seeing this replying pretty quick. And there you go. Now that has committed, we know now that our private IP, the 10.100.0.100, has been translated using the outside interface. So now we should be able to reach the outside network. So you make sure that you have all the policies, not just the NAT. The NAT is just to do the translation and have the proper routing statements and proper security policies, and you should be good to go. If you want to make sure that that NAT statement is actually working, let's go to NAT, and we should see a hit count incrementing. As I ping the outside, every ping will be a hit count. So let's go ahead and refresh, and I should be seeing that incrementing. That's a very good sign that the NAT policy is taking effect. Let's go to security policies, and we should be able to see a hit count also for that rule that I just created, which is DMC to outside. And you can see the hit count. Let's click refresh. And there you go, it's incrementing. Right. Okay, everyone, in this section, we're gonna take a look at the Palo Alto security profiles. And this is the reason why you wanna put a next generation firewall on your network to have not just the basic network based access control, you know, we wanna block a specific resource to reach a specific subnet. We want to limit the amount of traffic that we go, that we bring from the internet inbound to our network. It is not just that. We're also implementing a, a stateful firewall that will inspect traffic up to the packet level and identify if we are carrying any possible threats on our environment, either as incoming from the outside or as something actually malicious already on the network and is trying to spread across your zones. And this is why you want to implement those security profiles. So you have granular control of any possible threat or also enforce the way that the network should flow or be accessed based on your company's policies. So we're going to take a look at antivirus, we're going to take a look at anti-spyware, URL filtering, and denial of service protection. We're going to focus on those items, which I believe they're very important for you to understand and to enable in the Palo Alto firewall. So, and this is my experience with stateful firewalls or next generation firewalls. Company A acquires a firewall, and it can be a Palo Alto, it can be any other uh, firewall. They put it in production and they forgot to enable those features. And you know, you wonder why you are gonna take, number one, the money to invest in a solution like this, take the time to implement, and then at the end, you don't enable what you were supposed to do with it, which in this case is identify specific threats that might be hitting your network or traveling on between your zones, not being able to mitigate them or identify them correctly. And this is the reason why we wanna take a look at the overview. We're gonna take a look at all the options that the Palo Alto firewall, and then we're gonna configure a specific policy so you can identify how to create custom ones or how to use the default Palo Alto profiles that you just basically Enable on your policy and you're good to go. Alrighty, so let's take a look at each one. So if you take a look, we got antivirus. So you basically have your source and destination traffic, right? And inside that policy, you have the ability to enable profiles. So you create an antivirus profile and you will take a look and, and we will take a look in a bit. And basically what it's gonna do is gonna identify if there's a possible known threat between that source and destination that is flowing via the Palo Alto. The Palo Alto will be able to detect that. And the antivirus database is being queried out of Wildfire. So Palo Alto's threat signature database. So on the cloud, they have what they call Wildfire. This is where they analyze every single possible threat that the firewall detects that is not known. They will analyze that on their sandbox. There's an environment dedicated just to research. They will identify and they will see, okay, well, this 
matches this type of behavior, let's classify this as XYZ. And they'll put a name to it, and then they'll detect that as a known thread, and they'll update you, and not only you, but everyone that is a part of the Wildfire platform to, hey, we got this known thread, let's go ahead and update our all firewalls to make sure that they're up to date and you know any of our customers are not compromised because of this. Anti-spyware, very similar to antivirus, so it's gonna be looking for anything that matches a possible spyware and uh, will either block it, monitor it, or whatever you want to do with it. You want to monitor it and just be alerted about it, but not actually block it, you can definitely do that. Or you can just let the Palo Alto do the default actions, and we're gonna take a look at that. URL filtering, we're also gonna be blocking websites, and this is, very, this is a very common scenario with next generation firewalls. You have a couple of policies on the network, policies that belong to the C-level executives, which, they are allowed to basically go anywhere on the internet. You have limited users where they're only allowed to go to a number of websites and you basically limit their ability to go anywhere on the internet. And you got allowed users or privileged users that aren't going to be able to go to most websites, but not as many as the C-level executives. Uh, file blocking. We want to block anything either has been is going to be downloaded to one of our clients to one of our users if they're going to download an executable file we want to block it because we're not allowing to download either executable sips you know something that might be a copyright file and things like that you can block based on extensions so you can say well i'm not going to allow executables downloaded from the internet i'm not going to allow sip files i am not going to allow mp3 files, etc. You just put the policy in place and the Palo Alto will take care of that action. Wildfire, like I was mentioning, in Wildfire, you the Palo Alto detects something that is um, not known. You can basically send that for Wildfire analysis and basically in the Wildfire platform, they're gonna do uh, analysis and come up with a verdict to say, okay, yeah, it's malicious and it's not malicious, etc. And finally, DOS protection. Someone that is trying to limit a resource on your firewall in this case is trying to perform an attack to drop services or overwhelm a an entry point in this case the outside interface for example you enable the os protection and it will take care of that okay so let's do a quick dig into all the sections and i will be explaining you a little bit more in detail okay everyone so once we log in onto the palo alto firewall we're going to click on objects and right below here we scroll a little bit down and we're going to see the section for security profiles. So let's click on security profiles. And once inside, you're going to see all the objects or all the possible profiles that you can enable on the Palo Alto firewall. So if we begin with antivirus, and I mentioned earlier that the Palo Alto firewall will come with default profiles, then you can just enable on the policy and you should be good to go. And what that will do, if you see here, it already shows you the type of service and what's the action that it's going to use if it detects a possible virus on that particular traffic? In this case, HTTP, something that, that matches HTTP traffic and it might be malicious, it will have a default action of reset both client and server connection. So it's going to drop your client connection. It's going to basically reset it, reset the server and try it again. If it keeps getting any threats, it's going to do that type of action. If you see SMTP alert, I am not actually going to block it. I am just going to tell you, hey, I just got this and my AV profile. What do you want to do? And then you decide what you want to do. So, and you can see the same for IMAP, POP, FTP, and SMB. So again, same with uh, Wildfire. So you're going to say, well, I am going to my HTTP. This is what I want to do in my Wildfire action. If you have a custom profile that you want to change so meaning maybe you want to have SMTP to be blocked instead of alert then instead of the default you create a custom one so you click on add and then in add I can actually change this setting here so for example SMTP I can allow it just you know even though that you find something uh, just allow it alert me drop it or like I mentioned, reset one side of the connection. In this case, either the client or the server or both. Uh, same with Wildfire, you will have the same settings. So um, if you have an application exemption, uh, you can type it there. So even though that you might detect this as 
malicious, you want to just bypass that particular application, don't do any actions upon that. Okay, and with anti spyware it's going to be very similar. You have default strict, those are default, they come already in enabled on the Palo Alto, those are already created profiles, and you can either select those or create your custom one, and we'll go into this in detail on our next video. Same with vulnerability protection, you have already predefined strict and default profiles and you just select one that suits your environment best and then you enable that on the policy. URL filtering, we're also going to take a look at that. This is a, by default, it has a list and a allow and block categories and we'll configure that in our next video and you're going to know how to block a specific website. File blocking, again, you have default file types that I'm going to block. So if you see in the action here, I am going to block those files. I am going to alert about anything else, and then I'm just gonna continue for those one and not alert. So continue means just keep going, don't do anything, don't tell me, okay? And then strict has obviously a little bit more files being blocked based on this policy. Wildfire analysis, and this is where you select what's the default action. If you just want to enable default action, Wildfire will basically auto detect and auto scan or auto identify and monitor that traffic based on the public cloud infrastructure that Wildfire will provide you. So on your policy, you just enable Wildfire. And then once you do that, it's just let the Palo Alto do his work and it will report to Wildfire for analysis. And finally, DOS protection. You have a possible way of, of protecting that outside interface or inside, because you might know if there's retaliation inside your network and you want to make sure that DOS is enabled in the Palo Alto so it does not get disrupted by any possible DOS attack. And you configure this um, uh, as a profile and you attach that onto the policy. So let's go ahead and uh, configure AV, anti-spyware. I'm gonna do some URL filtering. And I'm also going to be configuring the OS protection so you can take a look of how you can take advantage of those security profiles. Alrighty, and I think that's it for now. Let's go ahead and configure AV and anti spyware. Okay, everyone. So in this video, we're going to take a look at profiles, antivirus, and anti spyware. And we're going to take a look at how to enable those features that come with your Palo Alto firewall. And as information you need to have a valid license or a Palo Alto support contract that allows you to enable those features and get real-time updates from wildfire so you got to make sure that your firewall is entitled for that service in order for you to enable it so let's go ahead and get started okay once we log in onto the Palo Alto you're gonna see here that I have two policies I have one policy that says anyone from the guests wireless it's allowed to go to the outside. And this is basically what it gives the guest wireless network access to the internet. We have another policy, which is inside to internet access. And this is the policy that provides access from the internal network, or this is my actual corp network into the outside. So this is the policy that will allow internet access from my internal user. So let's go ahead and add enable antivirus and anti spyware for both. So I'm going to do Two options. I am going to enable the default Palo Alto AV and anti spyware profile into the guest access, but I'm going to create a custom one that I would like to drop anything that has been identified to be malicious. So you're going to see the difference between default and a custom one. So let's go ahead and first of all, we're going to enable the guest internet access AV default profile, and we're going to also enable the guest internet access anti spyware default profile. So let's go ahead and take a look at the profiles first. So we mentioned that by default, we have those actions and those actions are, you know, HTTP, if the traffic it's uh, HTTP bounded. So if we're going to port 80 or any traffic that is HTTP traffic, I am going to reset both connections. And when it says both, it says client and server. So client connection and server connection in the TCP session, my client and my server, so who's responding to who, I am going to reset that connection and retry it again. Wildfire, same thing. So if it's detected via Wildfire, I am going to do the same action. SMTP, alert, alert. So I'm just going to get a response. Hey, I'm going to get a response from the firewall saying, hey, I just got this from this particular 
client, you know, so you are aware and you take actions upon it and, you know, so on. So basically it's the same. We got a couple of services here and the default action right next to it. So let's go ahead and enable the default on the guest or wireless. Let's go back onto policies and I'm going to go to my policy that I already have. Once I have it open, in actions is where I'm going to enable that profile. So in profile setting, I am going to select profiles. And by the way, you can also create a group of profiles. So if you have a set of custom profiles that you already got predefined. So for example, you have an AV custom profile, you got an anti-spyware custom profile, you got DOS custom profiles. You can all add them into a group and then just enable that particular group and you're done. But in my case, I'm going to enable them separately for this demonstration. Click on profiles and we mentioned ourselves that we want to have the guest internet profile to have the default AV profile. So I'm just gonna select here on my drop down, select default and I am done. Press OK and now I should have the profile next to the policy, right? You're gonna see the profile and then you're gonna see the AV profile enable on the policy. Once that's done, we just need to commit and we should be good to go. So let's go ahead and configure the anti-spyware one. So we mentioned that we wanted to have the default on the guest wireless and let's take a look at the anti-spyware. We actually have two already built profiles on the Palo Alto. The default one, which basically allows uh, just a default action. And if you're wondering what's the default action, if you click here and you take a look at each one, the default action is just going to be a block. And let me find the action. Oh, and by the way, the action on the rule is actually based on the thread. So if I find that thread running on that particular profile, so if I'm able to detect that I'm matching against this ID, which is this thread name, this is my default action, which is just alert. So you gotta be very careful. If you leave this in default that you don't know exactly what it's doing, it's just gonna alert you. It's not actually gonna take action. So this is unless you have a specific reason why you wanna enable or avoid an anti-spyware to be blocked, or maybe you have a false positive and you need to put a policy, hey, this is not actually an anti-spyware, you're just treating it as a false positive please allow it and then this is how you configure them to customize each one. But in this case, the default is alert. So let's go back. And if we say that we want to be strict, meaning that I want to reset the connection, if you find that the severity of the anti-spyware thread that was detected on the firewall matches a medium higher critical and those levels are dictated by the wildfire thread database. So you gotta make sure that you're actually in agreement with this action if you're enabling strict. It's gonna reset the traffic from both client and servers. So let's go ahead and uh, for the guest, we're just gonna enable the default. I'm gonna go to policies. I'm gonna go back to guest internet access. Once inside, I'm just gonna go back to actions, anti-spyware, and then I'm gonna select default and I am good to go. So if I scroll back to the right, now I have the AV and I have the anti-spyware. Okay, so let's go ahead and do the inside to internet access and I'm gonna create two custom AV and anti-spyware profiles. So let's go back to objects. Let's go to antivirus and I'm gonna click add. And here I'm gonna say corp AV profile. And by the way, you can do a capture. So this is a way to, hey, I want to know a little bit more about that threat. I'm, I can actually capture that in a PCAP file and I can open this in Wireshark and take a deep dive and actually see what's going on on that particular frame. So you have the options and I want to be a little more restrictive or else I'm going to be a little bit more protective in this case. I'm just going to drop, hey, just drop absolutely everything that matches that traffic and it seems to be malicious. So I'm just going to drop and same with wildfire. I'm just going to drop, drop. I'm actually being very restrictive and, you know, it's not actually recommended to go like this extreme because you might be blocking something that is not malicious and then you might have, you know, connectivity issues. So you just need to be aware. But for this purpose, I'm just going to show you that I can do that. Or let's do something a little bit more uniform. Let's go ahead and I want to have IMAP to be alert. I want to SMB. I'm just going to allow it, which shouldn't be allowed. Let's do a reset both SMB. Okay. And then exceptions. Okay. So in exceptions, 
Again, if you have false positive in it, there can be a case where you have something that is being treated as a virus and it's not actually a virus, but it's been blocked by the Palo Alto, and you want to make sure that that particular threat is not treated by this policy. You need to go into the threat vault and Palo Alto on its research center, it will have a database of threats. And I actually have the link open here on my browser. This is threat vault. In threat vault, I can actually do a search for any possible threats that the Palo Alto database has already identified for. So in my case, I'm working on the AV side. So I'm just going to select antivirus. Those are the threats that, you know, beginning with the letter A, and this is the ID right here. So if you, for example, want to select, say, for example, I have a thread that is matching against this, which is not really a thread, you know, I'm just giving as an example, but I want to have this exempt from my rule, I can go into threadvault.paloautonetworks.com, grab the ID, copy it, go into my policy, um, to my profile, paste, and add. So once I add that, there you go. The Palo Alto already identifies that against the uh, wildfire or the Treadball database. And then I can have an exemption and say, well, I don't want this to be treated on this particular policy. So just let it go through. Okay. So once you have that done, then you go into the policy, click on inside. And once you're on the actual setting or policy rule setting, you go ahead into the profile. And then I select my custom one, I press OK. So now if I scroll all the way to the right, I have my guest with the default profile and I have my custom profile for my inside to outside users. Okay, so let's do the one, the, the final profile, which is the anti-spyware for my inside to internet access. Let's go back to objects, anti-spyware. And here I have the default ones, like I mentioned previously. I'm just going to create a new one, and this is anti-spyware, okay, and my core profile. Anti-spyware core profile. In rules, then I'm going to say, hey, my default corp action, any threat name, anything, matching any category, or I can be specific. If I want to block something, you know, that matches a backdoor or a botnet, you know, command and control type of threat on the network, you can say, well, anything that matches a botnet, I want to drop it, right? And then we want to select all severities and then anything that matches a botnet will be dropped. So severity any and the category is botnet and the action is dropped. So this will be my anti-spyware policy. In my case, I will strongly recommend to go any and then reset both and then you should be good to go. Press OK, and again, exemptions, you can again go into exemptions and enable specific signatures that you want to avoid from being matched against this action. So you want to avoid this from being dropped, from being resetted, this is where you add that exemption. And DNX signatures, you can have the option for the Palo Alto to query against that particular destination if it has a DNS signature attached to it on the Palo Alto database on the cloud database and you can say sinkhole means that I am not going to resolve that name and I'm not going to let anyone get there or in this case the endpoint will not be able to reach that anti-spyware repository or you know destination so the anti-spyware is trying to gather gather data from a particular machine with this, I am not going to allow that to resolve any name that there, it's pointing to a malicious site. And we'll press OK. And we have our anti-spyware custom profile. We'll go back onto policies. Inside to internet access. And once inside, I then find my anti-spyware. And then click here. Select my custom one. Press OK. And finally commit. And there you have it. It's very straightforward and uh, might as well take advantage of the default settings from Palo Alto, just enable on the policy and you should. Okay, everyone. So in this video, we're gonna take a look at URL filtering and file blocking profiles on the Palo Alto firewall. We're gonna configure two profiles. One is gonna be the URL filtering profile and then the next one will be a file blocking profile because we want to limit what the users can download from the internet. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, everyone, in our previous video, we took a look at 
configuring antivirus and anti-spyware profiles. Now we need to enable URL filtering. We want to restrict access to specific websites for our internal users. And let's be more creative on this demonstration. I have a global insight to internet access policy. And the insight to internet access policy involves all my internet traffic from the inside to the outside. So all my users going to the outside, they're gonna hit this particular policy because they're coming from the inside zone going to the outside. Now I want to restrict or I want to limit what websites can my organization access uh, internally. So let's go ahead and configure that profile. I'm gonna go into URL filtering and we go into objects under security profiles, URL filtering. And we mentioned earlier that we have a default profile that basically the Palo Alto will come with that predefined. And it shows that my categories as block for abuse, drugs, category, adult, etc. You have a command and control, which is basically the botnet category and websites that are participating in a botnet type of CNC attack. So this will be blocked by default. So let's go ahead and uh, configure a custom one. And if you are okay with how the Palo Alto is treating the default, you just need to enable that default and you're already protected. But in our case, we want to be a little bit more creative. We want to create a custom one. So let's click on add. And on my name, I'm going to say, I'm going to say Corp URL Filter Global. And here I am going to block this. So I'm just going to select this. And I'm going to block and user credential submission. So if in the website requires a user to input his username and password, you can either block it or allow that. So you also have the opportunity to block that particular action. So if, for example, you're allowing, but you're blocking that, even though that you're allowing it, if the user needs to log in, it's not going to go anywhere. But you have the option to be granular with that. We're also going to block adult, and we're going to block alcohol and tobacco block. And then we want to block anything that has to do with piracy. So let's block that. And uh, we don't want employees looking for dating. Dating websites, not the time to do that. So we're going to block that. We're going to block gambling. We're not going to allow anyone to go to gambling websites in our corporate network. Hacking also, we don't want to do that. And um, we don't want people looking for jobs in our corp. So we're going to block that as well. Uh, malware, same here. And you see you see the, uh, the idea. The idea is to select custom actions or change what the default action is by creating a new one and we're just uh, blocking globally. So we're basically blocking inside to outside by just selecting here block. Phishing, same. And so let's go ahead and uh, click OK. And now we have that custom selection as kind of uh, close to what the default selection is, but I just made this as my custom so you can take a look at how it's done if you need to do one custom one. And say for example, and this is a good case scenario, say for example, you block alcohol and tobacco. So it's being blocked, but there's a website inside alcohol and tobacco that not necessarily you wanna have a block because it might be a customer that you're doing business with and they're in the alcohol and tobacco industry. Their website needs to be open. This is where overrides will help you to allow that while keeping everything else blocked. So you have the override. The override means I am going to override what I am blocking globally on the category. So this list of websites are handled by the Palo Alto uh, database. So the Palo Alto Cloud database will have the list of all websites that they are identifying to be alcohol and tobacco. And there might be cases where a website that you really need to have enabled falls on that category. So you can then do an override. An override will say, well, I want to allow Great Goose because we're partners with that company. We're providing IT services to that company and uh, we need to allow that. But globally, I am blocking anything that has to do with alcohol, but I'm allowing uh, this vodka company. So basically I can put an override and say allow. Same with block. The block will be the opposite. So if I am allowing in auctions, right, I'm allowing globally to go to every single website. I'm allowing access for our internal users to every single website that relates to auctions. 
but I want to block eBay, which is an auction website, I can block that individually. And that's how you configure your uh, filtering. You have a, glo a global category, you just allow that or deny or you know block or allow globally. But then you might want to have a website that you don't necessarily want to allow globally, you can override it here. And you put the list of specific websites that might be allowed here, but then I'm just gonna overwrite for that particular one. And then the action on the block list is to block, and then the allowed is obviously allowed. So we'll press OK. And now we need to enable that policy on my inside to outside by going into policies and clicking inside to internet and then going to actions and then URL filtering corp URL filter global and we'll press OK. Now if we scroll all the way to the right now we have that icon in our profiles column saying that I am attached to the URL filtering profile corp URL filter global and anyone that comes from the inside to the outside will be um, enforced by this URL filtering profile. Okay, so we just configure that, and uh, let's go ahead and do the same for guests. And for guests, we can, we can do something that is very common. So on the guest network, you're allowing guest users to use your internet, but you know, there's people that are very, uh, they're bandwidth hoggers. They want to take advantage of that and start downloading large files or, lo or movies or just streaming stuff. You want people to have internet access. You don't want people to take all your bandwidth, right? And one way to limit that type of traffic is by blocking those particular websites. So let's go back onto objects. URL filtering, I'm gonna create another one. And in my case, I am still going to block, block here. I am going to block here. I am going to block adult. And you know what? I want to look for peer-to-peer. -peer. So that's a very good case scenario where people might be downloading torrents. We want to block that for the guest side. And we want to block streaming media. Let's go ahead and block. And that's basically it. With this profile, I am allowing my guest users to go outside, but I am blocking them from going to adult websites, anything that has to do with drugs, and anything that is streaming media, like uh, Netflix, YouTube, etc., and also from downloading or connecting to peer-to-peer -peer networks. We'll press OK. I have a guest URL filter profile. I'm going with this profile to limit our guest wireless network from reaching those resources. So let's go back onto policies, guest internet access, and on actions, I am going to select that URL filter, which is guest URL filter, and press OK. And now we have our guest profile enabled. Okay. Finally, we're gonna block foul access from zone to zone. It means uh, I'm going to block anyone from downloading a specific file format or uploading a specific file format by creating a file blocking profile. We're gonna go into objects. I'm gonna go to file blocking. We have a predefined file blocking profile, and this is the file types that are gonna be blocked. You can see the action here, and then anything else. This is continuous, so don't actually tell me that someone is actually downloading this type of file in, in my alert settings. So let's go ahead and click on add. I'm gonna create a custom one. This will be my global corp, my corp file block profile. And I'm gonna click add. I'm gonna say extension one, matching any applications, and you can be based on custom applications. So if the traffic matches a specific application, you can type it there. In my case, I'm just gonna say any, and then this is where I am going to select a particular format. In my case, I want to block executables in both directions, either download or upload, and my action will be blocked. And I can make this more relevant to our case, executable. I can block torrent. Well, let's go ahead and see if uh, torrent is an option here. So we'll click add, and then we'll click go down, and there you have it. So now, I am blocking torrent, and I can actually nest couple inside the same policy. So in case you just wanna make one option inside the profile and then select a handful of file types that will be blocked, then I can, for example, select zip, and there you go. So now the torrent category blocks torrent and zip. Let's go ahead and change this to block. 
we'll press OK. And we're done with the profile. Now let's go back onto the policy and enable that on our Corp network. We'll click the policy. Let's go to Actions, File Blocking, and we're going to select our custom one. We'll press OK, and we are done. If we scroll all the way to the right, now we have a file blocking profile that will block people from downloading executables, downloading torrent files, because this will download not the actual content, because you know torrent, you need a peer-to-peer -peer client that will download the actual data that is referenced on that torrent file. But this is to avoid someone from downloading the actual torrent file that will basically link in their peer-to-peer -peer program to download the actual data. And we're also going to block download SIP um, from my inside to outside. And this is a good way to limit what gets uploaded or downloaded in your environment from your internal users. Okay, everyone. So in this video, we're going to take a look at DOS protection profiles on the Palo Alto firewall. DOS, we know, very common type of attack where the purpose of this particular attack is to limit resources or stop from providing services because it has been overwhelmed by requests. You know, most of the time, there's a flood of requests coming down the interface of the end or the end device. It's not able to keep up with the demand of traffic flow. In this case, either it can be in multiple sessions you know, hundreds or if not thousands of sessions open in a matter of a second, and that will basically run out the TCP session stack and it will exhaust available sessions for legitimate users. There's many types of DOS attacks and in the Palo Alto firewall, we need to configure a DOS protection profile. And the way it works is you configure a protection profile. And if you can see here on my slide, I have the outside which is resembling our internet. And we have our attacker in this case, the user that is coming from this particular IP, and um, he's about to do a teardrop. And most of the time, it's not just one. We, we usually experience this type of attack from a botnet, or this is basically a form of machines that are hitting your same target. So, so in this case, it's a distributed denial of service. Multiple machines are targeting a specific resource from the outside in this case, or it can be pretty much anywhere on the net. You'll have a bunch of requests coming in from multiple machines and your appliance will not be able to keep up, so it will drop traffic. So we configure a DOS protection profile. The way it works is we create a profile object and the profile object, we're gonna put some thresholds. So we're gonna say, well, I'm going to allow X amount of connections per second. If I go over that, consider that a DOS attack and apply the enforcement. So we're going to see uh, the type of enforcement that we can apply, which is basically drop or protect. And you're going to see the difference between both of them. And then we're also going to discuss what is an aggregate DOS protection profile and a classified DOS protection profile. So basically an aggregate is uh, you're applying this particular object that you're creating to a zone or interface, and regardless what's the traffic that is flowing, it's gonna be applied globally. So any traffic whatsoever will be applied against this particular DOS protection profile. So there's no specific attribute that we're looking for. You just apply it and as an aggregate, and it will detect all traffic and it will enforce all traffic regardless of individual IPs and so on. Classified is the opposite. So classify, you, you specify how do you want to classify the traffic or what are you looking in the traffic and then match against your protection profile. So if it hits your threshold, then it matches the profile. So then it gets applied based on the rule. So you can classify based on source IP, uh, destination IP, or you can do both. So we're looking for a specific source IP or we're looking for that source IP and the attack type or the threshold that has been violated and then we apply the policy upon that and we decide what, what we want to do. And obviously we apply the policy to a zone or to an interface. We can select that and we'll take a look at that in a second. And this basically example is a very common scenario. We got an attacker or a bunch of attackers or a bunch of machines that are basically a botnet. This group of machines are all targeting the same destination. In our case, we have a web server sitting on the DMC. This is the public IP, and, and basically we're getting this attack, hitting this IP, which then gets forwarded onto the real IP, which is the 10 10 And then if we don't do something about it, for example, they might be exhausting the HTTP request. So that's TCP, 
and I'm just overflowing that TCP request. So what's going to happen with the web server is that it will drop concurrent requests because it's going to say, well, I don't have any more sessions available. I'm going to drop. And that's basically a denial of service. OK, so let's go ahead and uh, configure the DOS protection profiles and let's apply it to our outside to inside zone or in this case, the outside to DMC and we'll go from there. OK, so once we're in the Palo Alto, we're going to take a look at policies and the last option it's uh, DOS protection. So this is where you apply the actual object. We need to create the object and this will be the DOS protection profile. And once we have the profile with the settings and the thresholds that we want to enforce, then we go over policies into DOS protection and we apply it into the direction we want to. So in this case, we want to apply it from the outside to the DMC, or if your environment is going outside to inside, then you'll have the DOS protection profile apply that way. So, okay, so let's go ahead into objects. And then in objects, over security profiles, the last option, DOS protection. Okay, in DOS protection, we're gonna click add and we're gonna create our first profile. Okay, so I decided to label this one as Corp DOS Protect Aggregate. We're gonna do two profiles. We're gonna do a classified profile and we're gonna do an aggregate profile so you can see the difference. Okay, in the window, we have two options. And again, you can see here is a type of aggregate or classified, and this one will be aggregate. The first tab shows flood protection. So this is the type of flood or the type of traffic we want to, you know, protect our environment from a potential DOS attack. SIN flood, we can enable SIN. And if you can see here, the action is random early drop. You got two options, SIN cookies or random early drop. We're going to be doing random early drop. So it's going to detect and it, before it actually hits or enforces, it will drop the traffic and it will not allow that to hit our destination. And we have our thresholds. We got a threshold of 10,000 concurrent connections a second. If we go past that, that means that treat it as a DOS attack and enforce the policy. Activate rate, same. So if you see, you can say, well, I want a threshold of 9,000. So we can say our threshold is 9,000. So, hey, start triggering an alarm because we're hitting the, the threshold, but then actually enforce if it goes over 10,000. So you have the rate, the alarm. So let's start monitoring everything more closely because we're now getting close to the threshold. If we hit the 10,000, we're actually applying the policy. And we have a max rate of connections of 40,000. If I go over 40,000 concurrent connections a second, then drop as well. So we have this activate threshold and we have a maximum connection threshold. And we're blocking four or five minutes or 300 seconds. If we go to UDP, it's very similar. We can enable UDP and this will be the alarm rate and activate rate and max rate. So ICMP, if we're doing ping of that, if we're doing an ICMP type of attack, again, we have those thresholds and we have the duration. It's very, very similar. And then finally, IPv6, ICMP, and any other type of IP flood, we're going to set those thresholds. And we'll leave it as default for our demonstration. Resource protection. We can also say, well, I don't want to have more than X amount of concurrent connections or sessions, then I can enable resource protection. So if someone keeps sending an infinite amount of sessions to be established to our end device or our end application, then if I pass the threshold, I'm going to drop the traffic. I'm going to consider that a DOS attack. Okay, so we'll press OK. Once we have the first one, we just need to make the second one exactly the same thing. The only difference will be that it will be classified and we're classifying to a specific attribute. And you'll see that in a bit. And the second one will be labeled the same thing. The only difference is classified. Okay. And now we're going to select classify and we're going to enable the same. Or better yet, let's do it different on this one. I'm going to say that the threshold will be 20,000 from a specific source, or in this case, if it matches the source IP. So UDP flood, we're going to leave this in default, ICMP default, and other IP. And we're also enabling resource protection. We'll click OK. And now we have both. We got the aggregated, we got the classify aggregate applies to all traffic regardless of source IP or destination IP. Classify applies to a specific type of traffic and you're going to see that in a bit. Let's go to policies. Now we go to DOS protection and we're going to make two policies. We're going to make an aggregate policy that it will be enforced against all traffic regardless of source or destination and then we'll do another one which is classified. 
first one will be DOS Protect Aggregate. Well, we can select either zone or an interface. I can grab my outside interface. If I want to apply it to multiple interfaces that are belonging to the same zone, I can then select the zone. In my, in my case, I'm going to add it to the zone. Okay, and my source zone will be the outside because my attacker comes from the outside. Any source IP and any user. So let's go ahead and click on destination. And we're going to select DMC. Destination. And now, this is what we can do. We can say any service, regardless of what type of service, or I can be specific to what service is being affected by this DOS. In my case, I'm just going to leave it as any. And my rules are either deny or protect. Deny, as long as you match the policy, deny the traffic. If you actually match the condition, I want you to protect. Else, you know, let it go through. And allow, obviously, else allow. In our case, we're going to set as protect. So protect basically is going to say, unless you match the, the, the specific attribute that we're looking for, we're going to enforce. As a matter of fact, let's do aggregate deny. So it's, it applies globally. Schedule, you can put a schedule. When do you want to have the policy enforced? You can lock the activity of this particular policy to your external logger. And then aggregate, we're going to apply. This is where we actually apply the DOS protection profile. Okay. And then we'll press option and we're going to say any here. And we're good to go on the first one. And then finally, we're going to do the second one. And the second one will be exactly the same thing, but it's going to be specific to our source IP. Okay. Now we go to source. Same source. Destination. Same destination. Option, we're going to leave as any. And in this case, I want to protect. I want to protect. I want to verify that it matches my classified policy or profile and then take the action of protect the environment. Aggregate, we can actually do both. Um, and I will strongly recommend to, you know, have them separate because then it will hit a little bit more of CPU resources or hardware resources on the unit because it's going to do aggregate, but also it's going to start checking one by one. You don't want to hit your CPU usage or your hardware usage on the firewall. So let's leave it as none. And then on profile, I'm going to select classify. And this is where we can select the attribute that we want to classify the traffic as. In my case, I'm just going to leave it as source IP only. We'll press OK. And done. OK, so in the summary, we got two policies. We got the source zone going to our DMZ. And we're matching against both profiles that we created uh, previously. So if we go into DOS protection, we got two profiles. We got aggregate and classify. Aggregate applies to all traffic regardless of source IP or destination IP. And classify applies to a specific address attribute. In this case, we select on our policy to be source IP. And that is it. Make sure that you have your settings. And again, this is something that is it will differentiate or it will be different based on your environment. It is not a set and forget. You got to identify or you got to analyze how your application behaves. And then based on that, you can then decide how to create those policies and apply them to the right interface. Okay, and that's it. Uh, DOS protection is something very useful and very much needed these days. So make sure that you apply it and you should be good to go. Okay, everyone, in this video, we're going to take a look at high availability and uh, firewall clustering in the Palo Alto platform. And this is something that is a must. If you're running any critical environment, you should definitely have high availability. You need to have an M plus one environment, meaning one active instant and at least another one in standby in case that primary goes down or fail for whatever reason. The Palo Alto is very intuitive when it comes to deploying high availability setups. And this particular slide, we can see that I have two operation modes. I have an active standby mode, which in this case, I have Palo Alto 01, PA01 in active and PA02 in standby. And this is Palo Alto 5260, which will include predefined HA interfaces. So on the Palo Alto, certain models will have the dedicated management interface as well as the HA interface or the high availability interface. And this is where you're going to cross connect both units, they're both on the same data center. So if you have both units sitting on the same data center, the most simple and effective approach will be to cross connect them. So you're going to have a peering between HA uh, port 1A to HA port 1A on the second unit. So we're cross connecting port to port as well as the high speed chassis interconnect. So this particular interface 
in a Palo Alto HA pair, we'll send the data plane traffic and we'll discuss that information or what this port is going to do. So it basically syncs the sessions between the two firewalls. So in order for this environment to work properly and fail over quick, it needs to share session information between the two units. Meaning the active unit, the one that is currently forwarding traffic, either inbound to the internet or inbound to the enzyme zone, uh, it needs to tell the standby unit, hey, I got this many sessions and this is what I'm currently processing. In case I go down, you have already a copy of that and you can continue my duty. And this is what will allow you to have this seamless you know, one ping, two ping, drop type of impact. So you're basically not going to notice that you lost a whole firewall because you have that session synced between the two units. The HA interfaces, the actual dedicated HA interfaces, will transmit the heartbeat information. So I am going to keep saying a hello to my both units. So I'm going to be sharing hellos and making sure that we're both alive. Hey, I'm here. And we'll continue to have this HA status of active standby so in this case we're going to have a standby unit this standby unit and active standby will remain as far as management you can still get to the dedicated management interface however it's not going to forward any traffic i'm just going to be standing by as the word it's saying it's a standby unit i am going to be standing by in case the active primary goes down for whatever reason and I'm going to take over ownership of the traffic forwarding. So in the Palo Alto, I can configure a link and path monitoring. So when you configure active standby or active active pairs or clusters, you're going to have some parameters that you got to configure and tell the Palo Alto, hey, if this happens, I want you to fail over. Meaning that, for example, if you want to configure a monitor policy, you can say, well, I'm going to constantly ping to the outside and you can ping to Google's popular DNS 4.2.2.2 or you can ping 8.8.8.8. If for some reason I stop pinging, I want you to go ahead and fail over to the standby. So treat myself as failed and I'm going to go ahead and fail over to the standby and the standby will become online. And you set up thresholds. So if I lose five pings, consider myself down and fail over to standby. And we're going to configure that on our next video. In the case of Active Active, and this is why I love a lot of Palo Alto's way of doing Active Active. In Active Active, you can actually have both units forwarding traffic at the same time. Versus in Active Standby, the only one will be forwarding traffic. What's the benefit of it? Well, you can have load balancing, some sort of load balancing, because then you'll have both units forwarding traffic at the same time. In order for us to accomplish a load balancing scenario here, we got to configure a virtual IP and set up that ARP load sharing. In this case, both firewalls will be able to route traffic outside. So they're basically working as a cluster of resources and both units are going to send and receive traffic inbound and outbound. So you take full use of your cluster. So this particular setup is a little bit more complex, obviously, than the active standby, but it's not too complicated to the point that, you know, we got to go to school all over again to, to understand how it's, it's done. So as long as you have, you know, correctly configured and good to go and make sure that everything has been tested and, uh, and you confirm that communication is, is happening as the way it should be and you perform this failover so and i've seen this many many times in environments that i work with where they set up an ha cluster they don't do a failover test to make sure that the cluster is actually working they just set it up and oh yeah it's set up it's so good to go but you don't unplug uh, courts to see if uh yeah it's actually working i was able to fail over and traffic is still flowing or you know make sure that the policies that they put in place like to ping to the outside they're actually working by just triggering a force failover meaning i'm going to unplug my outside interface and see if the standby will take over and make sure that my traffic is actually working that's something that's mandatory so so if you build the, the, the ha cluster you gotta make sure that you do a failover test so you make sure that everything is working as expected in an active active standpoint well, they're actually active active, so meaning that they're actually forwarding traffic. If there's an issue, you're going to notice that right away because one of the units might start dropping traffic and you know, well, even though that is active active, this unit is not able to forward traffic. So let's take a look at the network side, switches, cabling, etc. Okay, so we're going to take a look at um, what's the benefit of going one way versus the other. And I think I explained this on this video, so active standby is just basically one unit active, the other one just waiting. If something happens, we'll take over. Versus active-active, then you have 
load balancing between the two units. You can send traffic and receive traffic across the two units. Both unit interfaces are going to be active. They're going to be able to forward traffic. Whereas the active standby, only one will, is going to be able to move traffic. The other one, you're going to see the interfaces as down. So in active-active, also, the benefit of going active-active has also some constraints. Not necessarily constraints, involves configurations. Certain parameters that you're going to be configuring manually. For example, the NAT rules, they have to be, in some cases, assigned to each individual firewall. So you might need to configure two NAT rules for the same purpose, but one pointing to PA01 and then the other one pointing to PA02. And I'll show you this on our video regarding active active. And finally, if you do patching, you can actually patch both units at the same time by going this setup. So active standby mode, I patch the active and actually I am invoking the same commands to the standby. The reason why is everything is sync. So if I make a change here, so if I add a policy, I add this object, I add a NAT, I add anything or I change anything, except certain areas that we're going to be looking at as well on the video. So there's certain areas that you make changes they are not going to be replicated. And the high availability section, of course, is one of them because they're going to be unique. Uh, but everything else, most config stuff, most policies, most NAT rules, everything else will be synced. So if you configure something here, it's going to auto be synced to this standby unit using the uh, HA interfaces. Okay, let's see what we got for today. We have two firewalls. We got PA01, we got PA02. PA01 will be our active unit and our highly available cluster. So we want to make sure that we have redundancy in our environment. We want to have to deal with an outage because this is a very, very critical device. This gives us internet access. This device will give us access to other resources such as the server environment if you're connecting remotely if you have a lot of users that are connecting remotely in order to hit your internal resources probably are doing vpn services and we want to make sure that is always up and active so we're going to be configuring an active standby ha pair in this scenario or in this setup we have two units we have a unit that is going to forward traffic it's going to do a routing and that translations are address translations so this unit will basically do what every single function that the Palo Alto does so this active unit will act as a normal Palo Alto it will do all the normal forwarding decisions all the policy enforcement all the authentication requests etc the standby unit will just do the session and configuration sync from the active unit so this standby unit is just going to be there waiting if something happens it will take cover and continue forwarding traffic the way that it's going to do that is by syncing the data from the active unit so the active unit any changes that will happen so if any administrator or any security engineer performs a change, adding a policy, adding a route, adding any change, except specific sections on PanOS that are not synced, which uh, one of them will be the HA settings, of course. But everything else, everything that is done on the active unit will be synced to the standby, along with the sessions. And why it's important for us to have session synchronization between the two units. Anything that is being forwarded until that center receive completes, this unit will hold that session. So this Palo Alto should have a copy of that session in case in the middle of a transmission, I don't need to re recession every single request. So if I go down, I can take over quickly and continue what the active unit was doing. We want to make sure that the standby has a copy of what the active was doing. And that is where we do session synchronization. We usually perform session synchronization via the high-speed chassis interconnect. If your unit currently has a high-speed chassis interconnect, most certainly is going to be a higher-end model, uh, like the 5000 series. They'll, they'll come with a high-speed chassis interconnect, which is a QSFP interface. runs on 40 gig, and it does that session sync in active standby. In active active, this unit will actually forward traffic if for some reason the request came from one firewall, it needs to send via this link in order to reach the other firewall because it may have the session established on the active and not the standby. So it needs to use that link to send traffic between the two units. But in active standby, I am sending session sync and I am sending any routing decisions, etc., to the standby so they have copy. So this unit will have copy of what the active unit was doing. So again, it's very straightforward. Configuring active standby will require. Let's take a look at that. We have HA in active standby mode. 
it requires a, an IP, so it requires us to allocate at least three interfaces, three HN links. And there's certain, like I mentioned on my intro video, uh, there's certain models that will come with the HA link, dedicated HA link. But in case you need to in session sync as an HA, you can also select an interface that is not necessarily as an HA port and, co and configure as an HA. So you can then take advantage and configure the HA those interfaces. So in our case, I have two firewalls. I am allocating three interfaces. One interface will be my HA1A link, and this is the link. And if you remember our previous video, we talked about keep alive and hello. So I'm going to keep sending my units. Hey, I am here. Everything is okay. So it maintains that status between the two units on the pair. HA1B, again, we need redundancy. So in case HA1A goes down, I can still perform the same functions at HA1 and I will not have some sort of major impact. I will continue my cluster. I just lost one HA link. I can still use the other one. So we're good on that. HA2 or B, this is the link we're going to be using as our data plane traffic. So let me explain. So you have two types of traffic flow between the two units on the HA interfaces. You have the control plane traffic, which is going to go usually between the two units via the HA1 interfaces. And the data plane traffic, anything that is traffic related, not config related, anything that is traffic related will be used the HA2 interface or the HA3 or high speed chassis interconnect, HSCI. So we're going to configure this scenario. We're going to allocate an IP. So I'm going to configure this as layer 3 slash 30. We're going to have the dot 1 on the active primary and we're going to have a dot 2 on the standby unit. If you can take a look here, so I have both units talking to the internet via Ethernet 1 slash 1. I have a local inside interface of Ethernet 1 slash 2. So this faces the inside network. This interface is sitting on this subnet, the 10 0 0 slash 24. And I also have another interface allocated to the same Ethernet 1 slash 2. And remember, anything that is configured here will be mirrored here. So make sure that the interfaces that you allocate are exactly for the same purpose. So Ethernet 1 1 will do the outside. So you make sure that the redundant link on the standby firewall is connected to the same network via the same interface. Make sure that because obviously it's not going to work because then the active will send traffic, will send the configuration of whatever interface I have here to this guy. And if I'm not plugged in on the right network, I am not going to be able to forward traffic. Same here. So I have one slash two facing my inside and same way on the standby unit. I have a test PC down below here. And with this PC, we're going to be pinging constantly to the outside. Once we're done with the cluster, we're going to shut down or we're going to bring down the active primary unit so you can see how traffic will fill over to the standby and we should be able to see the standby becoming the active. And then finally, we're going to have, like you see on the slide, I have this in like a more clear format. So I have this more transparent. So actually telling you that this unit is not active and it does have the same IP as the primary. So at my interface from my internal subnet going to the outside, it's on dot two and the layer three address is dot one here. This same address is obviously configured here because like what we mentioned before, any configuration on the active is replicated to the standby. So you want to make sure that you understand that anything has to be mirrored, not only the config, but also the physical connectivity. So make sure that you're good on that. And you can see here, the only difference here is the local IPs on the HA config. So the HA config is going to be one of the things that is going to be independent. You're not going to do a change here. It's going to be replicated here. You got to do it manually on both units. And we're going to discuss that as well. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, so let's go ahead and configure an active standby HA pair. So I got two firewalls, PAO1 and I got PAO2. I'm going to make this one our active primary or the active forwarder in the pair. And PAO2 will be the standby one. Okay, so let's get started. Let's go to PAO1. I want to know that once I have that HA pair up and running, I want to know the status. So you want to add a widget that will show you the status. So right now it's saying HA is not enabled. Of course, I don't have the HA config. So let's go ahead and configure that. So let's go to network, ethernet, and on my setup, if you remember my slide, I have ethernet 1 slash 6, 1 slash 7, and 1 slash 8. So let me show you how that looks 
on the diagram so you are more familiar with it. We have three interfaces and we got to change that mode to be a J. Once we change the mode on this three interfaces, we should be able to configure the HA settings. Same with PAL2, we got to do the same thing. So let's start with PAL1. I'm going to change this interface Ethernet 1 slash 6, 7, and 8 to be an HA interface. Okay, let's start with the first one, 6. We go into Ethernet 1 slash 6. And here where it says interface type, we want to select HA. We'll press OK. So we got the first one. Let's go ahead into the second one. Do the same thing. Okay, and the last one, 8. Okay, let's do the same thing here, and we should be good with PAO1. Okay, we have the HA interfaces. They're ready to go, so let's go ahead and configure that active standby cluster. We're going to go to device. We're going to go to high availability, and this is where we configure HA. You begin by enabling HA, of course, and we're going to go ahead and click this settings button here. And we're going to enable HA, and this is where we select group ID. Okay, your firewalls, they belong to the same group ID. So that's how the Palo Altos know that both of them are actually on the same pair. Not only that, the group ID, so when you have a cluster, the group ID also generates the MAC address that is associated to the cluster itself. So there's going to be a virtual MAC address that is referenced on both units. So you can do that low sharing without having any duplicate IP. So there's going to be a virtual MAC address that is going to be created or generated once we do this configuration. So you got to make sure that the group ID matches between the two units so they can belong to the same group and they can see each other and exchange the HA configs and bring the HA links up and running. And we're going to select just group one. You can type a description if you want. In our case, we're going to do active passive or active standby. We're going to enable a config sync, and this is very important, because if you make a change on PAO1, I want the standby unit, PAO2, to get the copy of that config. Okay, and peer HA1 IP. And you remember our slide. Let's go back to our slide. In our slide, we have the first HA interface, HA1A. It has the slash 30 address space, the 192.168.10 slash 30. I am going to allocate to the first firewall or the active one, dot one, and the standby dot two. I am going to do the same thing with the other HA interfaces, HA1B and HA2. So we're going to allocate dot two on the standby and dot one on the primary. Okay, let's go ahead and configure that. And this is telling me the peer address, so don't be confused. This is not your local. So PA1, we know that it's going to be that one. They're actually asking you, the Palo Alto is telling you, hey, the peer address, which in this case is going to be PAO2. So we know that's going to be dot two. That is for the HA1A. And now we're going to do the same thing for HA1B or the backup interface. Okay. We'll press OK. And let's go ahead and configure the active passive settings. Select here. And we're going to say either shutdown or auto. What's the difference? Okay. You want to see the interface or you want to see the, the active or the standby unit to be in a passive state. You don't want to see the indicators to be online. So it's going to look like the unit's actually dead. Only the HA interfaces will be seen uh, lit up. If you leave this in shutdown, you're going to see it that way. Or if you set it up in auto, they're just going to show as they're aligned, but they're not actually doing anything as far as forwarding traffic. In my case, I like to leave this in auto. And then you can monitor the fail hold down time to one minute. And this is what's going to tell, you know, hey, if I am actually down, this is my threshold here up in minute. I usually leave this in default. Um, let's go ahead and press OK. Election settings, very important. Election settings, it's going to tell me which one will be the active one. So we're going to say it's going to have a preference of becoming active versus the other unit. And you can figure this individually. The lowest number becomes the active, the preferred to be the active unit. So in this case, if I, if I type 50 and I leave a PAO2 as 100, then I am telling PAO1 to always become the active the master unit if the HA group joins and they build the HA pair. So you want to make sure that you select the lowest device priority to the unit that you always to become the active primary unit. Preemptive, if we have a case where I come back online, I want to regain that status again. I want to become again active primary. If I want to enable a heartbeat backup using the election, so I want to see, okay, I'm, I lost connectivity, so I want to have another backup of that connection between the two units, I can enable it here. I just leave this as normal. I'm not going to do that because I'm just going to use my HA interfaces to do that portion. 
and HA timer settings, how far do you want to have that session or election going on? You can tweak that. In my case, there's a reason why it says recommended. I'm going to leave it in recommended. And then, by the way, I haven't mentioned to you guys, but every time that you see a help, it actually is going to open a knowledge base article. This is actually stored on your firewall. So if you have a doubt about something on the Palo Alto itself, and you're on that particular session, you want to look for that that help icon, you click it and actually it's going to open a knowledge base article or directory that is actually stored on the Palo Alto itself. So if you can see here, this is the private IP of my management interface on the PA. So this is actually stored inside the Palo Alto. This is actually very good uh, to double check your settings. If you have some doubts, you click on help and you should be able to see the information regarding what you're configuring. Okay, let's go back, press OK here. We're going to leave PA01 to be the preferred one because we assign a lower device priority. Control link H1. This is our first interface and we have to configure those IPs to each individual interface. And this is the IP of my second unit. I need to configure that one on each HA interface. So beginning with HA1, which is this guy, this will be that one. So let's go ahead and configure that. And we're going to then select the interface that will become HA1, which in this case is the first one, 1.6. One okay, I am making it a layer 3, so they're going to exchange that heartbeat using that point of point. I don't need to select the gateway because I just want them cross-connected. If for some reason you have the other unit doing HA layer 3, and you're using routing to hit the other firewall because it's not actually on the same location, then you can select the gateway and then it should be able to find the other member of the HA link by looking at this IP. In this case, I don't need a gateway, so I'm going to leave that in blank. Encryption, so if you want that traffic, that HA traffic to be encrypted, you can select encryption. But in our case, because we're not going over a, another network in order for us to build the HA communication, I'm just cross-connecting both units. I am not going to enable encryption. I'm going to press OK. Let's do the same thing for the backup. Select here. And we're going to select port 7. That's our second port, which will be the HA backup. And we mentioned that our peer is dot 2. This guy will be dot 1. And again, I am not doing any sort of, sort of routing, so I'm just going to leave this here. Press OK. Let's go ahead and configure the data link side. And the data link, it's the, that interface that we mentioned that is going to be forwarding data plane traffic. So in this case, I am sending the session sync between the two units, so both units have a copy of the session table, I'm going to use this interface. If you're doing active-active, this will be the interface that is going to allow that traffic between the firewalls. So if I need to exit via another firewall, I can cross this data link and I can continue my forwarding path. I'm going to select port here, which will be the last one, eight. Either I can say I am going to use an ethernet mode, meaning in layer two, just send a broadcast, and my two units will reach that information at layer two, or I can make it a layer three. So in this case, we can leave this in Ethernet. I'm just gonna assign a, an IP. And again, it's gonna be very similar as the other one. So in this case, we're gonna do that three. And again, I don't need to have a gateway because I am cross-connected. HA2 keep alive. Yes, I can have an HA2, this interface also to be a keep alive interface. But in this case, I'm just gonna use uh, as my data plane interface on my data plane traffic between the two cluster members. So I'm just going to leave this unchecked. Press OK. And uh, we should be good. Let's go ahead and enable the HA by committing all my changes. And we'll configure the same thing on PAO2. Same thing. Network. Interfaces. And finally, 8. We are good on the interfaces. Now we have the interfaces. If you don't do this, and you try to configure the HA settings, you're not gonna see those interfaces available for you to choose. So you gotta make sure that you allocate first your HA interfaces if you don't have dedicated HA. Let's go device, high availability, enable HA. Again, same group. We wanna make sure that both of them are on the same group. Active, passive, enable config sync. And now my peer will be that one because this will be the dot two unit. Okay, peer HA1 interface, peer HA1 backup interface dot one and dot one okay select here we'll set this an auto like the other one and here we're going to leave this at a hundred and we're not going to enable preemptive because i want pao1 to become always the active if both units are actually online and we'll leave this in okay and now we can configure this let's go ahead and do the same thing here 
press OK, and finally the data link interface. And you can see here, session synchronization, so we want to make sure that we use the HA2 or the data link interface as our session synchronization interface. And we'll press OK, and boom, let's go ahead and commit and watch the action. So let's take a look at HAOPA01. It's already completed. Let's take a look at the dashboard, and now you can see that I enable HA, but now I don't see anything about my peer because obviously I am still committing my changes. So let's go ahead and see how that looks now that the second unit is finished and is committed. Let's go ahead and uh, refresh, and boom. Now you can see I just got my status with the uh, with my standby unit. My local unit, it's the active, and my peer is my passive unit. When we take a look here at my system logs, you can see that I built that HA group one between the two units, and you can see all the information that is being exchanged between the two members. So yeah, let's take a look at PAL2. Let's take a look at the same thing. Let's add that widget and make sure that we're good to go and yes we are we're synchronized so pal1 has synchronized to pal2 the config i am matching the same versions across all my updates of my app thread antivirus panel s and global protect and i have my ha's up and running okay awesome next let's configure something and let's take a look at what it looks like on pal2 and uh, you should be able to see that being replicated as well Configure the two zones, the outside and the inside. Okay, and let's commit. If you take a look, I am committing, but let's go ahead and PAO2. I should not have anything configured here, right? But I am configuring in PAO1. So we should be able now to see the status of synchronizing in progress. So synchronization is in progress. That means that I'm actually sending that information to PAO2. So PAO2 should have the same config. Let's uh, wait until that's finished and let's check on PAO2. Okay, so it's synchronized. Let's go to PAO2 and let's hit refresh. Boom, there you go. How beautiful is that, huh? We have both units with the configuration in sync. So we should be able now to configure all my necessary interface configs. And, and once we're done with that, we'll have a test machine and we'll ping to the outside and we'll perform a failover test. So let me configure that. And uh, after I am done, I'm gonna continue on the video and we're gonna go into the testing phase. Okay, so I will be right back. Okay, so I am done with the configuration. I have an internet reachability. I have my interfaces configured and I have both units with access to the internet. One is actually in standby as we configure HA active passive mode or active standby mode, and the other one is uh, forwarding the traffic. And I have a server that is sitting on the inside network. So if we check the config, we have a server that is on 10.0.0.10, and the default gateway is 01, as you saw on our slide. We have the server right here, so this is the 10.0.0.10, and it goes out to the internet via PA01 currently. We're going to do a failover test, and we're going to see what's the behavior once I bring this firewall down and this takes over. Okay, let's begin pinging here. Okay, I am pinging to the outside. So since we don't want to just shut it down, because we want to do more testing after this, I am going to suspend the local devices. This is a very, very cool command. In the high availability settings, you go onto operational commands and you can suspend the active unit from forwarding traffic and then PAL2 will take over. So if you need to do some sort of failover, you gotta trigger a failover event. You can actually suspend the active unit by clicking suspend local device. So let's go ahead and do that. So we'll press okay here. And let's take a look at the dashboard now. It has been suspended. And now we should be able to see the peer becoming alive. And this guy has become the active. And let's take a look at PAO2. Let's check the dashboard. And yes, the peer has been suspended. And uh, let's take a look at the, at the server and see how it's looking. And there you go. If you can see here, we have two ping drops. So let me uh, scroll real quick. This was due to that outage event. So let me stop the constant ping. So you can see here, once I did that suspend local, the Palo Alto or the server just lost two pings and then it continued just right away. So that's very cool. You have instantaneous failover. Your users will not notice that your environment went down. I just lost two pings. 
Okay, but that's one way of doing a failover test by, you know, if you lost the unit, you basically are going to see that behavior. You're going to see everything failing over onto standby. But what if you lost an interface or you lost access to a particular network via that particular firewall and the other one is able to go there? You still want to failover in case that happens. You don't want to, my firewalls are active, my interfaces are active. I'm not going to fail over unless the file auto actually goes down. No, you want to also fail over in case you're not able to reach a network. And we can configure two items, link monitoring as well as path monitoring. Okay, we're going to go into device. And in device, you're going to see here under high availability, we're going to click link and path monitoring. I have link monitoring enabled. So if I lose one of the links, I am going to drop. But it's not going to take effect. And listen carefully. If this is not going to take effect unless you configure a link group with the condition, right? So we want to add the interfaces that if for some reason I lose one of them, I want you to trigger a failover and move me to the standby unit. So let's go ahead and add that link group. We're going to call this the failover. And we're going to say a failover condition of any. So any of the interfaces that we're going to select here, if they go down, I want you to trigger a failover. So let's go ahead and do that. Select my outside interface and I'm going to select my inside interface. So if one of those two goes down, the Palo Alto will do a failover to the standby unit. If I select all, unless both goes down, then I will have a failover event. So you want to make sure that you select any. There's cases where you want to do all. So because you might have a port channel, right? You don't want to have a port channel, if a complete failover, if the port channel, only one interface went down, but the other one is forwarding traffic. I don't think it should take that hit or that event. So in this case, I'm going to select all and both interfaces, they need to go down in order to trigger a condition. Problem is, what happens if I had two completely different zones? I don't have that scenario. If I lose one, then I'm not going to have a failover. So in this case, if you select any, then it will actually trigger a failover if either one of those two goes down. So I'm just going to leave it in any. We'll press OK. And path monitoring, I think this is very important to configure. Path monitoring, I am going to ping something on my end of the network, either in the outside or the inside. And if for some reason I lose ping or I am dropping that traffic, I want you to trigger a failover. And we're going to configure a path group. And this is where you're going to select that behavior or the destination that you want to ping and the conditions, right? And how long often you want to ping and what is considered to be down. So after X amount of pings, you want to failover. Okay. In this case, you have many options. You can have a virtual wire path if you lose that path in the virtual wire and the V-wire. We discussed V-wire on previous video. You can do that. A layer 2 VLAN path you can. Or in our case, we're going to do a virtual router path. So at layer 3, I want to ping something. If I drop that traffic, I want you to trigger a failover. Add virtual router. And we're going to add our virtual router. So any virtual router that it's going to be used to send that ping probe, you're going to select it here. Failure condition, again, if any of the IPs I'm going to list here go down, any one of them, I want you to trigger a failover. I think, my personal opinion, for the outside, you want to make sure that you ping multiple outside IPs, not just single one, and then unless all of them goes down, then you want to trigger a failover, because the outside, they might have an issue, but the internet not necessarily is down, so you don't want to trigger a failover event if only one destination IP is down. So let's go ahead and click Add, we're going to select those public IPs. Okay, so I am selecting 1.1.1 and a.a.a. So unless I lose both destinations, I am not able to reach them, then I'm going to trigger a failover because I'm selecting all. Ping interval, 200 milliseconds. So every 200 milliseconds, I'm going to be probing and checking that you're alive. If those guys are alive, we're good to go. If we're not alive, after 10 ping counts, I'm going to trigger that failover event. That's the threshold. If I don't meet my threshold, meaning that I am going over ping counts, I'm going to trigger that event because we're going to assume that uh, the, the destination went down. So we want to do that failover event. You want to be more aggressive, we lower this to five or even three. Three, you want to be very careful because maybe you just lost a ping. You don't want to drop the whole thing or fail over the whole thing if only three pings went down and then everything came back up. So you want to be very careful. You don't go too overboard with this. So I'm going to leave this in five. I'm going to press OK and we are going to commit. Again, the reason you got to configure this, it's to have a true failover event. So if it goes down, you still have reachability. And because this is a high availability setting, you need to do this on PA1. This is not replicated. So if I configure this here, it's not going to be replicated because this is an HA configuration change. Okay, let's go ahead and uh, do the same thing here. 
Okay, so I just configure all of them to save some time. It's exactly the same thing as I configure on PAO2. So once this is done, we're going to do a failover test, but this time we're going to drop the outside interface and see what will happen and if we can see that our rule is actually working. Let me unsuspend my local because this was uh, suspended for our demonstration purposes. I'm going to make it a local device again, make it active, and yeah, now it's leaving the suspended state. Once it's done, we should be able to do that new failover test. I'm going to go ahead and uh, disable the outside interface of PA01 and we should be able to see that path monitoring rule will take over and will trigger a failover to PA02. Go ahead and uh, go here. Okay, so we're passive on PA02, PA01. While that's happening, I have my server pinging to 1.1.1. As you can see here, I am pinging to 1.1.1. I'm going to trigger that failover event. You should be able to see that we lost connectivity but it should recover right away. Go ahead and uh, disable that interface. And sure enough, I just lost connectivity and boom, I am back online. Let's go ahead and see how that looks on the PA. Boom, non-functional, PA01, I just disabled the interface, uh, the outside interface, and I just lost connectivity. And uh, let's take a look at here. And sure enough, I have an HA event because I lost the destinations IPs in my path group are completely down. So meaning I cannot reach both IPs configure in the path monitoring rule. If we take a look here, I am not able to get to that destination, so I am triggering a failover event to PAO2, so this guy should be the active now. Alrighty, it's pretty cool. Make sure that you set this up. Make sure that you run HA redundant, highly available environment. Okay, everyone, in this video, we're gonna be configuring our Palo Alto firewalls in active active HA mode. We have Firewall PA01 and Firewall PA02, both of them equally active in forwarding traffic. So both units will provide load balancing along with redundancy on your environment. So PA01 and PA02 will be able to send traffic inbound and outbound. And they're also going to be configured in an active, active state, meaning that if one goes down, the other one can still take over the sessions and continue forwarding. So you not only perform redundancy or you not only enable redundancy, but you also uh, maximize your investment by using both units at the same time rather than having one in passive with the active standby or active passive mode that we discussed on our previous video. If you have one in active passive mode, then one those firewalls will be just sitting around doing nothing until something happens and it needs to take over. And active active, both of them actually forward traffic, both of them are actually operating. In case one goes down, the other one can still forward the traffic. We're going to be doing that routing, NAT, so address translation, routing, the policies, authentication, basically everything that the Palo Alto does will be active on both units. So in this demonstration, we're going to go into implementing our existing environment. So we, on our previous video, configure active standby. What we're going to do now, we're going to convert that into an active active mode. The only difference that we're going to do here is that we need to allocate a third HA interface that will allow us to do a VR sync. And we're going to be able to exchange the routing information and the router config across the two units. So we need to configure Ethernet 1 slash 5 to be an HA interface and then allocate this as our HA3 interface. Not only that, but we have to configure virtual IPs. We have to configure a local IP. So remember, before we only had one IP active and because only one firewall was actually active. Now, because both of them are active, we actually have to configure an individual IP or a unique IP per firewall and then configure a shared IP or a virtual IP that the cluster will use or that your end users or resources will use to point in order to hit either one or two. Same way with the outside. I have my lab environment, so my demonstration environment, I have my outside NATed via this address space. So in this case, we were using one to two as our outside in active standby, but now that we're going to put both of them in active active mode, then I got to configure the other unit to be 123 and then I'm going to move my outside to be 121. So this will be my shared virtual IP between the two units. So my destination will point towards this address, but in this case, this can forward or this can forward. 
Same with my internal network. I'm going to point my users to go to the 10001, but because we're doing active active, either this can take over PAO1, so that can own the session, or PAO2 can own the session. So the active forwarder will be either that two or that three. And that's how we load balance traffic across the two units. Another way that we can do is doing floating IPs. So the difference between virtual IPs and floating IPs is that in a virtual IP, with when we do ARP load sharing, both of the units can receive and, and send ARPs. Uh, both units are actually active. If we use floating IPs with active active, then the floating IP will be binded to a particular Palo Alto. And it's not until that fails over to the other firewall then the floating IP then will move. So it, the floating IP will basically attach to one. So even though that we have active active, the floating IP will only be binded to a particular instance. And that doesn't mean that we cannot load balance. We can definitely load balance using floating because then I can assign one floating IP for a specific set of resources and then I can assign another floating IP to B and then point half and half, right? Well, it, it works, but I think it's better to go um, IP our load sharing if that's the case because then you just point it to a virtual IP and either one or two can take over. But with floating IPs, you can assign a virtual IP that flows in one particular unit and if something happens, it can go to the other one. So you can set, well, if, if you fail, then fail over and move the floating IP to the other unit. And we're going to be configuring that. And this will be done actually on our next video. So we're going to do the HA portion now. We're going to change this into active active. We're going to configure those interfaces with those specific IPs. And then we're going to change the HA mode to be a active active. Once we do that, we then will go on to our next video where we're going to configure a virtual IP on both the inside and the outside. And we're going to do failover testing. And you're going to be able to see the behavior that your end users will see if you have a failover scenario where one IP, you know, one side of, of your cluster goes down, one PA goes down, the other one will take over. Again, it should be non-disruptive or not impacting because we're active active. So both of them are actually forwarding traffic. You should not even see a drop of traffic. It should be seamless. So we're going to configure that virtual IP. We're going to allocate it onto the cluster and then each one will have individual ones. Once that's done, we should be able to test connectivity from the internal PC to the outside. When we're doing active active, another thing that I got to emphasize, or I got to tell everyone, it's that in active active, your NAT statements cannot be duplicated between the two firewalls. And it's not that they cannot be duplicated. It's that you cannot have a single statement that will be shared across two firewalls. The translation rules, they have to be configured individually. So even though that I configure a NAT rule here and it will be replicated here, it only will be attached to one particular unit. So I got to create the same NAT rule for the other firewall and attach it to the other unit. And you're going to see that. Don't worry, we'll configure that on during the virtual IP video. But for now, let's go ahead and convert this to active active. And if for some reason you're, you don't understand how to do the, the complete HA config, I will suggest that you go on to our previous video and take a look at active standby. Because basically we're taking over the config of active, active standby and we're converting it to active active. So we're not just going to configure the whole thing from scratch. We're just going to change the mode to active active. And you're going to see the difference uh, between the two of them. So let's begin. Okay, so if you remember our previous video, we configure active standby. So we have PAO1, PAO1 is the local active, and our PAO2 is currently the passive one. So let's go ahead and configure active active. Let's allocate an IP to, so, so we, based on our slide, we mentioned that we need to allocate a specific IP to each firewall, because now this address cannot be duplicated because we're running active active else you're going to have a duplicate mac or a duplicate arp because both have the same ip we don't want that so we need to configure specific ip per firewall and then once we're done with that we should be able to enable active active so let's go ahead and do that that's uh pao one we're going to select this interface right here and we're going to change that ip as a matter of fact i don't need to because this will stay in 122 so i think we should be fine on pao one Let's uh, change that to be 123. Let me show you back the diagram so you're more familiar again. Okay, so if you see our diagram, we're going to change this address to be 123. So instead of having the same address, we need to have them, we need to configure 123 on this, and this will remain in 122. So let's go ahead and do that, and then we'll do that two here, which will, will, we need to change that to that two, and then the other one will be that three. So let's go ahead and configure that real quick. 
Let's go ahead and uh, IPv4. We're going to configure this in 123. PAO2. Press OK. And we're going to do the same thing for the other interface. And we're going to allocate that three here. Okay, so we have that one. We don't want to commit because we're in HA mode. So if I commit here, this can override PAO1. We don't want that. We're just going to make the change, but we're not going to commit. Let's go ahead on PA1 and let's change this one. Okay, let's go ahead into IPv4 and this one will be dot two because I need that dot one. Dot one address will be our virtual, so I'm gonna change this to dot two. Press OK. This will stay the same. Now we need to change the mode into active active. So let's go ahead and do that change right now on device. We go to setup. We already have enable HA. Group ID is one. Now here it goes. This is where we change that mode from active passive to active active. We'll press yes here. Now, because they're active active, each firewall will need to have a unique ID. PAO one, we're gonna leave this in ID zero, and then PAO two will have ID one. Both units are active active, so each one must have a unique ID. So we'll leave this in zero. We'll read uh, the same IPs as the active standby. We're not, we're not going to change that. It will be the same. So in case you're doing active active from the beginning, you know, you're not going to change from active standby. You're going to do a completely new setup. I will suggest you see the active standby video and just follow the same procedure. The only difference will be that you're selecting active active. So let's go ahead and device zero. We'll press OK here. Now we have a device priority. Even though that we're running active active in the Palo Alto, one is primary and the other one secondary. So one unit will still have some sort of ruling over the other one. However, both of them are actually forwarding traffic. It's just that one will be active primary and the other one will be active secondary. We're going to leave this the same. We're not going to change our device priority preemptive. We're going to leave this in preemptive and we're going to use the recommended HA timer settings. Control link, we're leaving the same way. We're just going to use the same address space, same for HA01, same for HA02. And finally, in active active, we then need to enable packet forwarding. So in case we need traffic flowing from one Palo Alto to the other, so you're seeing traffic that hits PAO1. Let me bring the slide. So if traffic for some reason came and hit 01, so in this case it went all the way from 01, then the return traffic for some reason hits 2, you can use the interface and you can forward traffic between the two units even though they are hashing over one interface and then returning over the other one. So that's the uh, reason why you want to definitely do packet forwarding on the HA3 interface. Okay, let's go ahead and select. And our HA interface is going to be 5. Why I don't see five here? Do you remember what we have to do in the beginning? We have to enable the HA or make the interface as an HA so we can then select it here. So let's go ahead and do that real quick. Go on to network, interfaces, five. We're gonna select this to be HA. Okay, we have it in HA mode. Let's go ahead and see if uh, we now can do that active active config. Let's find if we see it. There you go, we have it here, awesome. Now. This is where we select. We want to have that virtual routing in sync between the two units. By selecting this option, we can have the virtual router sync between the two firewalls using this HA3 interface. Also, if you want to do a quality of service sync, so if you're doing QoS on both firewalls, you select this so that is or anything that happened from a quality of service standpoint, you need to make sure that you have a sync so you enable it here. In our case, we're not doing QoS. And we have a whole timer of uh, 60 seconds. I will leave this in 60. I will not, you know, change the whole timers. I just leave it in 60. Section owner selection. Okay, so you want to say you want active primary to be always the session owner select selection. So, so the active primary firewall will be the owner of all the sessions you select primary device. Else, the first packet decides who's the owner. So if either I hit PAO1, I'm gonna become the owner. If I hit PAO2, I'm gonna become the owner. That's the difference. I am going to leave this in first packet. I wanna take advantage of that, you know, across the two units. Session setup. So this is how we do that low balancing between the two files. We can either select the primary device to be the session owner or the session that will be established will be on PAO1. Or we can select IP module, which is the Palo Alto's way of doing load balancing. And this is the recommended way that Palo Alto does HA active active with IP sharing. So make sure that you have IP module or you can do IP hash if you want or first packet as we talked about.
So in our case, I'm going to leave this in IP modular. We'll press OK. And uh, yeah, we should be good to enable on PAO1. Once I am committing, I am going to do the same on PAO2. Press Commit. OK. Now, even though that I haven't configured this one, this will not replicate to this because I just changed the mode and it will be a mismatch. So I don't need to worry about this overruling or overriding my configs on this one. Let's go ahead and configure this. And again, we're going to make this an HA port. Okay, let me go ahead and change this to HA. We'll press OK. Go on to device. High availability. We're going to select the setup. And we're going to change this to be active active. If you want to change this to active active, then everything that is active passive from a configuration standpoint will be lost. Are you, are you sure you want to change the mode to active active? We'll press yes. And now the only difference here is now I select the zero to be PA01. This one, which is PA02, should be one. So we're going to select this as one for our device ID. We're going to leave this in config saying we're going to leave this the same. Now we're going to leave the same priority as we did on active standby. We're going to leave the same IP address space for our HA interfaces. If we go on to active active config, this is where we want to select that uh, third interface for HA3. Select five. We want to synchronize the virtual router and we're going to leave this in first packet IP modular and we are good to go. Press OK. OK, while that's going on, I'm going to check on PA1 to see how it's looking. This is finished. Let's take a look at the dashboard and sure enough, I am mismatching because I am still in active standby until the commit completes. Then I should be able to see some activity going on here. So let's uh, wait for that. Okay, so as it's done, let me take a look real quick. Let me refresh and sure enough, active, active. We're still waiting for that secondary unit to finish his synchronization with the primary and we should have an active, active cluster. If you take a look here, we now have an HA3 interface up. That means I am able to synchronize that routing table across the two units. And I think it's looking all good. Let me see if uh, we have some activity. Not yet. Let's wait for this a little bit and see if we have full green across the board. Uh, let's give it a shot one more time. Boom. There you go. Now we're fully up and running and active active. I have my local unit to be active secondary and the other unit has become the active primary. I have both firewalls active active. I should be able to forward traffic using both the units. Now what we have left to do is configure virtual IPs and test failure. Now that we have an active active firewall cluster, we're going to configure load balancing by using virtual IPs. Uh, in this case, we're going to configure a ARP sharing virtual IP address that will be allocated in our enzyme zone. So all of our clients will hit this IP as the destination gateway. So my gateway will be this IP, but then it's actually shared between firewall one and firewall two. So I, my default gateway will be that one, but then Palo Alto 01, it's that two, and Palo Alto 02 is that three. Once I hit this IP, either one or two can take over my request and forward it upstream. This is where we take advantage of, of having equal traffic between the two Palo Altos. So we now we can take full advantage of the hardware resources by just configuring a load balancing IP or in this case a, a virtual IP and then pointing our clients to that as our last hop. We're also going to be configuring public floating IPs. Public, I call it public because this is the outside interface and by the way, you see this is a private IP because of my lab environment. I'm actually doing a NAT. So I have uh, this IP which then goes into my public uh, public internet. So I'm just going to create a floating IP and that floating IP will be binded to the primary unit on the cluster. We're not talking about active passive. We're talking about active 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 primary, which will be either PA01 or PA02, and then the secondary will be whichever has the lowest priority. We need to also configure a NAT rule. So in, in Active Active, you still configure your NAT rules the same way as we were doing on our NAT section. The only difference now we're gonna have a floating IP, and then we can either decide if PA01 will take our sessions 
or PaO2. So we can bind that NAT rule to either PaO1 or PaO2. If PaO1 goes down, that NAT flips over to PaO2 because we have a floating IP pointing to either one or the other, but we can enable that floating IP to fail over in case of failure. So we, even though that we bind to a particular Palo Alto, if we enable failover on the floating IP object, if Palo Alto 1 goes down, it can actually float and continue working on PAO2. So that's why the name floating IP. I can move it around based on the scenario. Same with the public floating IP. If I lose PAO1, which is the one that is going to have floating IP as active, PAO2 will get that float IP and will continue to serve requests. We're going to configure that inside virtual IP with IP ARP sharing. And uh, we're also going to configure those two floating IPs. We'll create the NAT rules for each one. And then we're going to ping from one of my machines. We're going to use uh, the same machine that we used on our previous video. We're going to ping the inside IP and we're going to bounce one firewall or we're going to suspend one firewall and we're going to see what's going to happen from a failover standpoint. So you can see that it's very seamless. So, okay. So let's go ahead and begin configuring those virtual IPs. Okay, so here on my Palo Alto, and you can see here I have my PAO2 as the active primary and PAO1 as my active secondary. You know what? Let's make PAO1 as our active primary. You wonder how you can do that by simply suspending this local device. So let's go ahead and do that. Click on device, high availability, operational commands, suspend local device. Press OK. Now, this guy should be out of the cluster as far as uh, traffic flow. We're going to take a look at PA01. And sure enough, my PA01 has become the primary. Okay, great. Let's go ahead and re enable it back. Okay. Now that we re enable PA02, now it needs to rejoin the cluster, but in this case, it will join as a secondary unit. Now, PA01 is my primary unit. While that's happening, let's go ahead and configure those virtual IPs. We'll click on device, high availability, and active active config. Under packet forwarding, this is where we enable that HA3 interface. We're going to configure virtual addresses, and this is where the virtual IPs are going to be configured. Let's click on add, and then let's add the, the first one. Add that inside IP, which is the load balance ARP sharing address. This is going to be the 10.0.0.1. Let's take a look again at the diagram. This is going to be this virtual IP. This is going to be IP ARP sharing. And we're going to enable this between the two firewalls. I'm going to click on add interface. This is where the actual physical interface of that virtual IP will sit in. In this case, it's the inside, which is one slash two. We'll click add and we're going to add that IP. So we have 10.0.0.1. Now we're going to select either floating or ARP load sharing. We want to load balance that between the two firewalls, so we're going to select ARP load sharing. And it's telling me what kind of load balancing algorithm we're going to select. We're just going to do IP modulo, which is the recommended Palo Alto uh, way of doing this. So we're going to select IP modulo. We're going to click OK. And sure enough, now we have that H virtual IP created. And if you can see here, we can also have it as a floating, so we can convert this into floating by binding it to the active primary. So in this case, all traffic will hit just PAO1. If PAO1 goes down, it will flow to PAO2. And in this case, we're just going to leave it without active primary, so we want to take advantage of sending the traffic to both units. We'll press OK. Now we have that virtual IP created. Let's go ahead and commit, and let's see. By the way, let's before we commit, take a look at my machine. I'm going to ping, and sure enough, obviously it's not responding. However, what if I ping my local member? There you go. This is PAO1. I am able to hit the physical inside interface of PAO1, which is 10.0.0.2. Okay, and this is a PAO2, which has the internal IP of 10.0.0.3. So I know that I'm able to hit both firewalls. Now I just need to hit that new load balance IP. And then we're going to leave this running, and then we're going to make the change. Okay, let's go ahead and click Commit. Press OK. Okay, it has finished. So let's take a look at the computer again. There you go. Now we have our virtual IP, uh, and this virtual IP is active on both PAO1 and PAO2. Now my clients will point to this IP as the last resource. In case PAO1 goes down, they're not going to notice because we have load balancing between the two units. 
you can see here for one second we lost two pings the reason why is the configuration from pao1 was being synced pao2 so now pao2 also has the same object so that's why you saw that brief interruption here but this is actually a good sign then that means that both files are currently active okay let's go ahead and uh, configure those floating ips now let's begin with the public ip we want to do a floating ip and we want to bind that to both firewalls but only one will be active select the outside interface one slash one we'll click add and now we're going to type this new ip which is going to be 10 10 20 121 in this case we can either do floating or art load sharing in this case i'm going to do it a floating so you can see the difference between one or the other and then i can select to be bounded to the active primary device by clicking here or i can actually have some sort of load balancing meaning that i have more priority in device zero which you remember during the ha configs device zero was allocated into pao1 device one was allocated to pao2 so i can either have my more priority of one over the other or i can just have an active primary device in, in this case the the address will be assigned to pao1 if the pao1 goes down it will be assigned to pao2 and you can see here right at the end you can see failover address if linked state is down and that's what we talked about the address will move between the firewalls in case the active primary goes down so it's going to float over to pao2 we want to leave this checked we're also going to assign this to the active primary device uh, we'll press ok and now we have that finally we're going to configure that other floating ip and this will be used for that nat rule let me show you back our diagram we also have a destination nat so we have a web server and we have a couple of public ips we want to allocate a public ip to this particular web server by using a floating ip so we are going to create this floating vib if someone from the outside hits the address will be sent to the web server the nat configuration will be the same if you are still unfamiliar with how to configure a destination nat i'll suggest you go back onto the destination nat video and you take a look at that and you become familiar so i'm going to go ahead and do that config the only difference in this case will be that we're just configuring that floating ip okay now that we need to configure that destination nat it's also a public ip so it means that needs to be binded again to the same outside interface so we're going to click the existing outside interface that we configure the uh, public ip we're going to add that new one okay so we have a 10 10 20 200 and we're going to make it floating as well and we're going to bind it to a primary device press ok ok and boom let's go ahead and click commit once that's done you can either commit now or you can create the NAT rule and then commit. Let's go ahead and create the NAT rule after this commit. Let's go ahead into policies, NAT. Let's click on add and let's create the first rule, which is going to be the first load balancing IP for our internal users. In order for them to go outside, they're going to use the 121 address. Let me show you again. They're going to be using this public IP, so we need to do NAT translation. Okay, inside to outside, original packet, source, inside, destination, outside, destination interface, Ethernet 1 slash 1, translated packet, and this is where the magic happens. Translation type. We want to select IP and port because we're basically doing a pad and we need to be outside to the internet. We want to select IP and port. Address type. In this case, we can select either translated address or interface address. Because we're using a floating IP. We can use a translated address, add the floating IP, and then configure the same thing on PAO2. So let me go ahead and do that. Translated address, in this case, will be okay. And the most important item here active active HA binding of this NAT rule. Where do we want to bind this rule to be effective? We have two firewalls, zero and one. Zero meaning the configuration device ID, zero for PAO1, and one for pao2 in this case we're going to make one for pao1 and then we'll make another one the same for pao2 and we should be good to go so we have the first one and you know what let's do the same thing for the second one but let's just use the clone function and we'll say we're going to move it on the bottom and boom so we have the same rule the only difference that we have to do now is change the active active ha binding okay so once we open their nat rule active active ha binding in this case will be one 
And now we have both rules. This rule for PaO1, this rule for PaO2. If PaO1 goes down, I still have the same rule for PaO2, so I should be good to go. Okay, let's go ahead and configure that destination map. Okay, original packet will be coming from the outside, going to the inside. Destination interface will be 1, 2, which is my inside interface. Source address is coming from the outside, so it can be any destination. This case will be my public floating IP. Okay, 200. And now translated, I am going to point to the real IP. 10.0.0.200 as my internal web server. So that's their NAT rule. Uh, 20.200 as my call site NAT address, going to the private address of 10.0.0.200. Okay, and I have this here. And finally, my first binding will be to PA01. Okay, let's go ahead and uh, duplicate it. Let's clone it here. Let's put it below. Press OK. And now we just need to change the binding. Okay, in this case, it's just going to be one. Everything else stays the same. We'll press commit and we should be good to go. Once that's done, we're going to do a failover test by pinging a 10001 and we'll see how that looks like from a failover standpoint. So we're finished here. Okay, so now we have created NAT rules using floating IP. So we have our inside to outside NAT. So in this case, imagine if this was a public IP. Now we have a floating public IP from PAO1. If it goes down, we can still use it on PAO2 because we have enabled under the virtual IP settings, we enable failover if this primary unit goes down. So if PAO1 goes down, I still have the rule for PAO2. So I should be good to go. So this rule applies to PAO1. This rule applies to PAO2 and we should be good to go same here this one will apply to one this one will apply to two and same way if one goes down the other one should still flow traffic okay so from the failover standpoint in an active active it should be even more seamless because we have a low balancing between the two firewalls we're pointing to a virtual ip either one of them goes down the virtual IP will still remain the same. It will still be binded to both units. It's just one will not be able to forward request. So let's go ahead and do that. And uh, first of all, I'm going to check my machine. We're pinging from my internal network to this low balancing IP. We're just going to suspend one of the units and we'll see what will happen to this uh, virtual IP. Okay, let's go ahead and disable PA01 and we're going to suspend this local device. Press OK. And this guy is completely out and PAO2 just became the active primary. Let's take a look at the machine now. And there you go, just one ping. After that, boom, we're back in action. Nothing really happened. Just one single ping and uh, nothing happened. Everything is working, everything is operating and you can continue sleeping at night. <laughs> so you're not gonna face failure scenario where you have a firewall, it just went down and nothing recovered. If you implement a true HA, environment where you have both firewalls acting as a cluster member or one even active standby if you have active standby you know all that matters is that you have redundancy you have some way of maintaining connectivity if you lose one firewall if it goes down you know something as simple as upgrading the firmware what happens if for some reason you upgrade the firmware or something it doesn't go according to plan the firewall is shot the firewall died the firewall can boot 2 a.m in the morning you're a remote no one is in the data center to help you. Well, trust me, a standby firewall will definitely save your day and your week. So make sure that environments are critical. Make sure that there's redundancy and plus one everywhere. We want to make sure that all firewalls or like critical devices such as firewalls, they need to be highly available. So you want to make sure that you have both units active, active or active standby. Alrighty, and that's it. That's Active Standby and Active Active. Okay, everyone, in this video, we're going to take a look at virtual systems on Palo Alto firewalls. This is one of the greatest features that the Palo Alto firewall has, and it's that you have a beefy firewall. You have a very, very powerful firewall. It has a lot of resources, and you have multiple uses for it. So say you want to create some internet rules, and you want to also have some server traffic rules, so meaning that you have a completely isolated environment where you have the servers completely isolated from the clients and it is required by the users to traverse the Palo Alto firewalls in order to hit the servers. And then that is where you can apply policies and avoid 
any attack coming from the user side of your network. But then usually you run on and to buy an additional appliance just to do that. Well, in Palo Alto, there's something called virtual systems. And what it can do is actually can create virtual instances inside the physical device. So if you have a firewall like this one, this is a 5280. I can allocate a set of interfaces to a particular virtual firewall and then allocate another set of interfaces to another instance. So if we want to apply policies that are related to the internet, we apply it to the internet virtual system. If we want to apply a policies that are for the server side or the server firewall, then you apply it to virtual system uh, number three. In this case, you don't need to buy another appliance to allocate it for the specifically the server firewall traffic. You can just create a virtual system inside the physical Palo Alto and create domains. So uh, like I mentioned, I can create a virtual firewall inside one physical firewall. So I can allocate a set of ports for one firewall and then another set of ports for the other one. I can isolate policy. So if I want to make my policy table shorter or more cleaner, I can do that by allocating two completely different firewall uh, instances inside my physical firewall. And keep in mind, this is supported in the 2000, 3000, 4000, 5000, and 7000 models. So this is not supported on all the firewalls, but most of the firewalls are those models. So we should be good to go. This is not supported on the lower end, the, 8, the 800s, the 200s nor the virtual firewall. So you want to keep that in mind. On the virtual firewall, you know, you can deploy multiple virtual firewalls. That's not a problem. Uh, but when it comes to maintaining uh, physical devices, you want to make sure that you have the less as possible so you know you don't need to worry about those devices from a management standpoint. Also, you're leveraging the hardware. So you have not that much traffic on the internet side. You might have a lot of traffic on the server side. You don't need to buy another appliance just to serve the server side or the internet side. You can combine both functions while separating the policies between each other. So we'll see this as completely different firewalls, but they're actually one physical appliance. So let me show you how that looks logically. So you have a set of ports, so you can configure virtual systems. This enables virtual systems inside the Palo Alto. And then once you enable it, you can create those virtual systems. And I can then select what type of interfaces or which interfaces I'm going to allocate to this particular virtual firewall. And quote virtual because it's basically a virtual instance inside the same physical appliance. And say with the other one, so if you can see my slide here, I have the internet firewall. So I'm going to configure virtual system number two. Virtual system number one, remember, it's the default virtual system. Every Palo Alto will come with virtual system one, and then you can continue creating virtual systems. I can select two ports for a specific virtual system. In my case, I'm just selecting this whole range so you can take an idea or take a look. Uh, I want to take two 40 gig ports, but I want to also take SFP ports for 10 gig connectivity, as well as uh, one gig for my copper ports. And then I can also create virtual routers and apply it to specific virtual systems. So I can have a routing table that belongs to the internet firewall that the server firewall has no communication whatsoever. So I still need to have routing between the two virtual firewalls in order for them to communicate each other. So you got to make sure that once you configure this type of environment, there's no way like you can route leak between the two. You definitely need to have a path in order for this communication between firewalls will happen. So long story short, you have a bunch of ports that you're going to allocate to the virtual system. You can select either one or as many as you want, as long as you have them available and they're not allocated to any other firewall. Same with the other side. So I have a server firewall and I'm actually allocating the range below. So it's very straightforward. Once we enable a virtual systems, you create the virtual systems and then allocate the interfaces and everything else is pretty much the same. I'm going to show you on one firewall that I have. It's in production, so I'm going to be blacking out some configuration settings, but it's very straightforward. So you enable virtual systems, you allocate the ports that you want on that virtual system, and then you configure the policies on the particular context. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Okay, so once we log in onto the firewall, we're going to click on device, and then inside device, in the setup section under management, we're going to have the option to enable virtual system capability. So once we enable that, we're going to have the option to configure those virtual systems. So the step one will be go into device, setup, management, and then check mark virtual system capabilities. So I'm going to just click real quick. And then you see it here, I can enable virtual system capability. Once I do that, then I'm going to have the option to configure those virtual systems. Let me show you how that looks. And I'm going to be blocking out. This is a production firewall. But I'm going to show you that I have my default virtual system and I got virtual systems two and three. 
And then inside here, I can allocate the interfaces that will be related to each virtual system. If you see AE, AE, those are link aggregation interfaces, or if I LACP or port channel interfaces. So I grab two physical interfaces and I created an AE interface or a group. So this is basically allocated to virtual system two. And then virtual system three, I got a couple of other ports as well. So once we have that, it's basically the same thing. So we go into policies and then I can find the policies that are related to a specific virtual system, or then I can configure policies for each individual firewall. So you have the option to do the policies on either firewall. So imagine like you have two firewalls inside the same physical appliance and everything else is pretty much the same. So if we go to NAT, it's the same thing. On NAT, I have the default virtual system, but then I can select any other of those virtual systems and, and yeah, I can figure out the policies. And once I committed the changes, it's just going to commit it to the firewall itself, but it actually applies to the particular virtual system. Everything else is pretty much the same. If we go to network, and virtual routers, I have a virtual system allocated for this particular virtual router and as well as for this particular virtual router. And there you have it. It's pretty much the same. The concepts are the same. Once you create the virtual system, you have imagine yourself that you just created two firewalls and configure the ports individually like you were doing on your standalone unit and you should be good to go. So this is a quick demonstration. Virtual systems, you enable it. You configure virtual routers, allocate a virtual router to the particular virtual system and allocate the interfaces and you're done. That's about it. Okay, everyone. In section seven, we're gonna look at Palo Alto's VPN tunneling options. And the options are very straightforward. IPsec tunneling. We want to connect remote offices. We want to connect to an external entity or a partner. You decide to partner with company B, your company A. Not necessarily you want to have an MPLS or a dedicated lease line to establish a private LAN or a private network between the two entities. You can do a cost-effective interconnect and it's still private over the internet by creating an IPsec tunnel. And in this type of connection, you have a service that will be encrypting your traffic in the Palo Alto. And this is the IPsec service that runs on the particular tunnel. So you have two type of faces that will be in charge of adding that encryption and, and authentication process. So we know that the traffic is completely secure end to end. We're going to discuss that on this section and we're going to also take a look at Global Protect VPN and every firewall or I would say every major or known network firewall vendor will have their flavor of remote access VPN. Okay, I have an appliance, I have remote users or you or company, it's allowing telecommute which will require users working from home, working from anywhere in the world to connect to your on-prem environment. Yeah, because you either have an on-prem server, you have some sort of applications that are running on-prem on your data center, and those applications are not open to the outside world because they're not web applications. They're actually requires an end-to-end -end, uh, communication, and you need to have that type of connectivity secure over the internet. And the way we do it in Palo Alto is with Global Protect. We have two options in Global Protect. We have the portal and we have the gateway. Those two items or options in Global Protect are necessary to establish and enable Global Protect for our remote users. And we're going to take a look in upcoming sections. So if you can see on this slide, I have two type of connectivity or tunneling connectivities that we can establish in our Palo Alto firewall. In the left side, if you can see my mouse over here, I am hovering over what it seems to be a branch office. So I just put a small building here and we have a Palo Alto. We have a dedicated WAN connection and we have our on-prem environment or I label this side of the network as our core data center. This office, we have some remote users because they're part of the organization, but they're not actually in the same regional area. So in this case, we need to provide them some remote connectivity, but not necessarily we need to have them on demand connectivity because we might need to have an always on connectivity. Good example, we have a read only domain controller in this branch office, and we need to have replication between the two domain controllers in our Active Directory environment. This is basically how do you allow users to authenticate to the environment. This is LDAP. So you have to create some sort of replication so the main data center can replicate those objects between the branch office and so on. 
So we cannot establish an on-demand tunnel or a remote access VPN for this type of scenario because we need to have an always-on connectivity. This is one example. Another example is having you, know, you peer with a partner or you are providing services or your partner company is providing services to you and you need to have an always-on connectivity. So you need to build a site-to-site -site tunnel and you configure your peers and we're going to discuss what is peers and how to configure them in the Palo Alto. So basically what you need to do is have uh, the two peers and you'll establish that tunnel and we'll encrypt that traffic. Okay, so our other option in VPN tunneling is our remote access VPN. In this case, you have users and you can see the picture here. Uh, we have this lady that we don't know where actually she's working, but she seems to be working and uh, she needs to establish connectivity to the corporate data center where we have hosted all of our application servers. And we need to make sure that her connection over the internet is completely encrypted and it's secure. So we will not have some sort of man in the middle or we're not gonna have someone sniffing our traffic and seeing what is actually happening in the pipe or in this particular tunnel. So this requires the end user to have a client and a remote access client. In this case, the Palo Alto uses Global Protect. And Global Protect is not just a simple remote access client. It does much more than that. It can profile your machine. It can find all the attributes of your machine and send that to your central Palo Alto, or in this case, to the Global Protect gateway where that information will be sent into the Palo Alto and we can identify the machine and we know about the OS that is running. We can know what updates does that machine have. We can know if the machine is running with a up-to-date antivirus. And we can put even policies to say, well, if you're not running with, with no antivirus or you're not updating your machine on a regular basis, meaning you don't have, a, in this case, if it's Windows, you don't have Windows updates enabled, then we can deny that traffic. And we can say, well, until you get your updates up to date, we're not going to give you access. And that can be also done with the power of Global Protect Client. So the Global Protect Client can also serve as an end user agent that will send the information from their local machine over the WAN to the on-prem Palo Altos, in this case, to our on-prem firewalls. And, um, and we have two options in Global Protect. We have the portal and the gateway. The portal, this is where we point our users to download the client because we host the copy of Global Protect Client and the Palo Alto itself. So we will have a web access gateway or basically a website that is basically on the Palo Alto. And in that website, once the user enters their credentials and they're authenticated, they're going to be able to download the client, the Global Protect Client. And we're going to have links to download that executable where they're going to be able to install on their machines and then establish connectivity. Then we have the gateway. The gateway is where we actually establish the connectivity to. So once we have the client, we point ourselves to the public IP of the outside facing interface in the Palo Alto where we have the global protect enabled. So the remote users will point to either a DNS name or FQDN. In this case, if you have a, a public DNS provider, you can have the Palo Alto's interface IP or you can have also an assigned public IP as your Global Protect Gateway and clients will basically point there and they will be able to establish a connection once they have authenticated access. And after that, this is treated like any other zone. So you can put policies to the Global Protect zone or the VPN zone. And then once you have that, you will have access to the resources that you're allowed to. Okay, so this section is to discuss those two connectivity options. So if we want to leverage VPN tunnels in the Palo Alto, we will be able to do by implementing IPsec land-to-land -land or site-to-site and also enable remote access VPN with Global Protect. Okay, everyone. So in this section, we're going to be looking at the IPsec VPN tunnel in the Palo Alto firewall. In this particular video, we're going to be configuring an IPsec VPN in tunnel mode. In tunnel mode, we don't have an IP address assigned to the tunnel interface. We just point to that tunnel once we create the, the configs for that particular IPsec tunnel. Our destination will be pointing to the tunnel interface. And as long as we have the policies in place, we should be good to go and reach that other machine in the other location. So if you take a look at my diagram that I have right here. So I have site A and I have a PC and it's on the 1010 10 network. And site B, I have a server, and the server is 10.20.0.10. So it's on the 10.20 network. We have that facing on the inside, 
And on the outside, we have reachability between those two sites via the internet. So we are going to use the internet to establish an IPsec VPN tunnel, configure the required authentication and encryption settings, and allow communication from this site to this site. In this particular scenario, I'm going to do this demonstration very dynamic. Uh, we're going to do a scenario which is going to be very common as a network security engineer. You, you're most definitely going to be assigned a task to build a tunnel between two locations. And, um, and I just prepared that section outline that will include a real scenario where it's very common to deploy this type of solution in case you might not need to have a dedicated MPLS circuit or dedicated line, we can just use the internet to do that communication between two companies or two sites and allow private traffic across the WAN. So let's get started with this particular session. Okay, so I have here our session demonstration, which will involve configuring a tunnel mode IPsec site to site VPN. So in the scenario, it says Company Sky has just partnered with Company C. So we got two companies, Company Sky and Company C. You are currently working as a network security engineer with Sky, and the IT director has requested you to build us a, a virtual private tunnel with company C. And now that we partner with company C, we're working for company Sky. We need to build a site-to-site -site tunnel so in order for us to reach their network over the WAN. And it might be because we're not ready to have a dedicated line and we need to have some sort of private connectivity between the two companies. So this is a great way to do it. Okay, company Sky and C have, have agreed in the security parameters for their new VPN tunnel connection. Okay, so now that we have meet with the CIT people, decided some security mechanisms that we want to put in place in order for us to make the connection secure and encrypt all traffic as it goes through the WAN. We have already identified our peer IPs, and by the way, the peers are the outside IP where you're going to be pointing your IPsec tunnel uh, gateway configuration in order to establish that site-to-site -site VPN tunnel. So you need to point to that public IP. And in this case, we have Company Sky, peer IP of Company Sky, which is the company that we're working for. It's going to be 24.155.99.53. And Company C, peer IP is 24.95.211.199. So we have that information. We have the two peer IPs, and this is important because on one side of the tunnel, this is one peer, and the other side of the tunnel is the other peer. Okay, and now we also have the phase one. So this is the initial session that the Palo Altos will try to establish to build the tunnel. You have to agree. So both configurations on Palo Alto and Company Sky and Palo Alto and Company C, they need to be equally matching. So we need to match the same encryption and authentication and the pre-shared key in order for us to build that phase one. Once we succeed on phase one, we'll then go into phase two. And which is the IPsec crypto phase where we're actually encapsulating the traffic itself. So once the traffic starts flowing via the tunnel, we're actually encrypting it before it goes out to the WAN. So we are negotiating based on the information that we got from C. We are encrypting AES-256 and we're doing a SHA-1 off and we're doing DH group 2 with a key lifetime of eight hours, and we have the pre-shared key, as you can see here on the screen. On phase two, is very similar. We are doing ESP, AES-256, SHA-1, and we're not doing perfect forward secrecy. Key lifetime, again, eight hours. So it's pretty much similar for phase one and phase two. So we need to make sure that we're configuring exactly as it's actually telling us to configure in order for us to confirm that we are going to have a successful ton of build. And then our supervisor has requested that only your local WAN subnet at 10.10.0.0.24 can talk to C. In this case, C is the company C. And it's local subnet of 10.20.0.0.24. So this is your traffic. This is the actual internet interesting traffic between the two locations uh, that is going to be flowing over that IPsec site-to-site -side VPN tunnel. So we need to make sure that we have security policies in place to allow that traffic through, but also avoid any other traffic that we don't want to allow over that VPN site-to-site -side tunnel. We need to make sure that the VPN tunnel is completely encrypted end-to-end -end between those two companies in order for us to, to confirm that we have a secure and completely private traffic over the internet. And finally, we'll please confirm on the virtual machine of 10.10.0.10 
that is able to reach the server in the CE's network of 10.20.0.10 once the tunnel is built. So we need to confirm after everything is done that we can ping end to end from 10.10.0.10 to 10.20.0.10. That will tell us that the tunnel has been established. Okay, so C company has given us the go ahead to build the tunnel configurations because company C firewall, they already have everything configured and they're just waiting for us to configure our side and we should be good to go. Let's go ahead and begin. In order for us to configure an IPsec tunnel, there's three items that we need to pre-configure. Number one, the IP key crypto profile. So this is basically the, the profile that is going to have that in, in authentication and encryption settings that were requested to us in order for us to encrypt the traffic and secure the tunnel. So I already have some predefined ones. So on the Apollo Auto, you're going to have some predefined IP key crypto profiles. In this case, because we're actually going to do a different type of encryption and authentication, we need to create our own. In order for us to do that, we just need to click on add and then label IKEA crypto profile and then add the settings that were required in order for us to build the tunnel. Okay, so I just label it CVPN IKEA crypto profile that belongs to the CVPN tunnel. It's telling us for phase one, and by the way, that will be your IKEA crypto. So you can see right here, we're configuring the phase one setting. We need to add AES256. We need to add SHA1. We need to add the DH group number two. And we need to add a key lifetime of eight hours along with the pre-shared key. The pre-shared key is actually configured on the IKEA gateway, which we're going to be doing in a bit. Okay, so let's add those settings onto the IKEA crypto profile. So we start by adding the DH group and it's group two. Encryption, we're gonna do AES256. Authentication, we're gonna do SHA1. And the lifetime is gonna be eight hours, which is already set. We'll press OK. And we're good to go on the IKEA crypto profile. Now we need to configure an IPsec crypto profile. We'll click on IPsec and this is phase two. So if you want to remember this as a more familiar term, so it's phase two in your IPsec VPN. So phase two, those are the settings right here. So if you have some troubleshooting and you see the logs that you're not able to bring phase two up, your issue might be right here. So you might want to remember that IKE crypto is phase one, IPsec crypto is phase two. And again, we have some predefines, but we're going to build a custom one. Click on add. Okay, in this case, I label it CVPN IPsec Crypto, and we're going to add the encryption. Let's double confirm that we have the right information. Okay, for IPsec Crypto, based on the information that we got, we got the protocol ESP, encryption AES256, authentication SHA-1. We're not doing perfect for secrecy, and we're going to have an eight-hour key lifetime. Okay, so let's add the encryption, and it's going to be 256CBC. We're going to add no perfect for secrecy. In this case, see here under DH group, you want to select no PFS. Lifetime, eight hours, and the authentication, it was going to be SHA-1. IPsec protocol is already set as ESP. Okay, so we have all the information on the IPsec crypto profile. We'll click OK. And now let's build that IP gateway. This is the gateway that will establish that VPN connectivity. And it will try to establish that tunnel with the C company, which is our other end of the tunnel. We'll click on Add. In this case, we can label this as the C VPN gateway. And version, you can select versions that you want to, that you are required to establish. In our case, we're just doing IKEA v1, but definitely IKEA v2 is more secure. So you want to make sure that any tunnels you want to build in an IKEA v2. For this demonstration, we're just doing IKEA v1. Interface. In interface, we're going to select the outside interface. Remember, this is the interface that is going to trigger that connectivity request to the other side of the tunnel. So we're going to select our outside interface in the IKEA gateway. Okay, so we have the uh, CVPN gateway name and we're going to select the outside interface on the IKEA gateway. So this is the interface that faces the outside network or the internet and the local IP address of the interface, we need to select that. So we have here under the interface, our local IP address. And by the way, you don't need to select specifically the interface IP. You can actually allocate a different public IP as your VPN peer. But in our case, we are just using the interface IP. And then 
this is where we actually configure the peer address. So if you see here, the peer type is going to be an IP address. You can use DNS name or fully qualifying domain name. If you want to use a, a domain name rather than having a public IP, you can do so. But in our case, we're just doing an IP. Okay, so we, we're going to add the peer address for the C company's file. So C peer IP, let's copy the public IP and we're going to paste it right here on our peer address. And then we finally need to add the pre-shared key. Let's go ahead and copy the pre-shared key. And let's go ahead and paste it right here. And local identification and peer identification. Okay, so if you want to add a specific attribute that you need to match on both sides, meaning that I am going to send this particular attribute as soon as I'm trying to establish my tunnel, and my other side of the tunnel will need to see that I'm sending this particular attribute in order for me to build the tunnel. So I need to see, for example, if I want to make it more secure, I can say, well, if I'm sending my request using a fully qualified domain name on the other side of the tunnel, you should definitely also be specifying that in order for tunnel to be built. So you need to make sure that if you're using an identification on that IPsec tunnel, both ends, they are agreeing on which option or which name or setting that you added. So a tunnel built. In our case, I'm just going to leave it as known. Okay, an advanced option. We can do NAT T, so if we're behind another router, we can enable NAT T, NAT traversal, or we can make this as a passive mode IKE gateway. In our case, we're not doing either of that. We're just doing a, a straightforward tunnel, very simple. Okay, an exchange mode. We can select either auto, so it auto negotiates what's the exchange mode for IKE V1. And this is where we select that crypto profile. Do you remember when we configure that crypto profile? This is where we're going to select that. Got to go ahead and select our CVPN IKE crypto. And we are not doing the PD, so that peer detection. We're just going to disable that. And we'll press OK. So now we have the IKE gateway. Let's finally build the tunnel. We'll click on IPsec tunnels. I'll click on add. We need to label this tunnel as CVPN site to site. Tunnel interface. OK. So you need to create a tunnel interface on the Palo Alto. And this is the interface that you're going to be pointing your traffic in order for it to, to reach the other end of the tunnel. Meaning that this is like a virtual interface that is attached to the IPsec tunnel. And this virtual interface actually is assigned to a zone, to a security zone. Via this tunnel interface, this is where we can actually police the traffic and add rules, etc. In my case, I'm going to select a particular interface or I can create a, a new one. So I, in this case, let's go ahead and create a new interface. We're going to click new tunnel interface and we're going to add this onto my default router. And I am going to add this to the CVPN security zone. And by the way, you need to configure a security zone and for this particular tunnel. So for any tunnel traffic, you need to also create a security zone so you can then create policies and apply them inbound or outbound onto that zone. So in our case, I already did the CVPN zone. I'm just going to add this on the tunnel interface. IPv4, because this is tunnel mode, we're not actually adding an IP address to this tunnel interface. In I interface mode, then we can add a particular IP. IPv6, same. We're not an advanced, we're not going to attach any management profiles. We'll click OK. And then finally, we are going to select our IKE gateway that we previously configured with that outside interface and the peer IP and the pre shared key, etc. Select that here and the IPsec crypto profile that we configure right at the beginning. Let's find that IPsec crypto. Here we go. And finally, proxy IDs. We need to add the interesting traffic or the private traffic that will pass through the tunnel proxy id we can label this cvpn tunnel traffic local so this is my local subnet that is going to be allowed to go over the tunnel to reach the c network 10 10 0, 0, 24 is my local side the inside uh, network and on the remote side it's going to be 10 20 0, 0. and there you go and protocol i can select a specific protocol in my case i'm just going to allow all Okay, so we have the proxy IDs, we'll press OK, and um, we'll commit. Once we commit, then we'll see if the tunnel establishes. Okay, so now we see that we have an IPsec tunnel configured. We have the CVPN site to site, and you can see the status here. We have two status indicators. The first status indicator is phase two. So if we're passing phase two, this should turn green, but it will not pass 
into a green state until the first phase, which is phase one, turns green. So we need to see this one first becoming green, and then the second one should become green right after, and now we know that we have a fully established VPN tunnel. Let's uh, do a refresh to see if it actually establishes. And no, it does not establish. We need to add a route. However, the route should not make this go up or, or down. In order for it to go up or down, we got to initialize some sort of traffic. So we might as well configure the route so we can point the traffic via tunnel. Let's go ahead and create that route that will point to the C private network via the tunnel interface that we just built. Okay, so let's go ahead into static routes. And I'm gonna add a route we're going to see VPN 10, 20, 0, 0, 24, and let's add that destination here. And this is where we're going to select that tunnel interface that we created when we did the IPsec tunnel config. And in this case, it's tunnel 3. Next hop. Interesting. We don't have a next hop IP, and the reason why we're not doing interface mode, we're just doing tunnel mode. We just need to select the interface 3 and then the next hop address it's done. We're just telling the Palo Alto, hey, there's no next hop, just send it over this tunnel interface. And the Palo Alto will be smart enough to just send the traffic over there. And if everything is configured correctly, you should have traffic flow end to end. We'll press OK, and we'll press OK here. One last thing that we need. So let's go ahead and create two policies. One to allow traffic out to the tunnel from our internal network and another policy allowing inbound traffic from the VPN tunnel to our inside environment. Click on policy, security, and we're going to click add and create those two rules. And the first rule will be inside to see VPN tunnel. And source, it's going to be the inside. Source address, we don't want to leave this in any. Even though that we leave this in any, my proxy ID that we configure on the IPsec tunnel will not allow the traffic unless you're coming from this particular IP. My source address will be the 10, 10, 0, 0, slash 24. My destination is going to be the CVPN zone. Remember, we need to have a zone attached to that tunnel interface that is pointing to the IPsec tunnel. CVPN, destination address, and this will be the destination on the C's network side of the tunnel. So we need to confirm that we have this subnet added onto the policy so we can communicate with it. And then we'll allow and we should be good on that. So now we need to make another one from ingress traffic from the C network. So from C, if they try to reach to our network, we need to allow that traffic rule as well. So let's go ahead and add that rule. And for that, we're gonna just do a clone. I can clone this and then basically flip the zones and flip the addresses and we should be good to go. Press okay here. And now we have it here, so let's uh, relabel this. Okay, we're going to relabel this as C VPN tunnel to inside because now this is the inbound traffic source. In this case, we're going to add C VPN as our source zone because now we're, this is ingress traffic. And we're going to add that 10 to. We're going to add their network as the source network. Destination, we're going to add the inside zone because now we're having ingress traffic from the tunnel. We're going to add the 10 10 0 0 24. Okay, and we have now the 10, 10, 0, 24 as the destination. And we'll just leave this in any, any, and allow. Okay, and now we should be able to see some sort of traffic going over the tunnel. So let's take a look at that. I'm just committing. We'll wait for this and we'll check. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look. Go to networks. Let's go to IPsec tunnels. And we're still seeing this in red. Both of them, actually. Phase 1 and phase 2. I have a cool trick that I can show you to generate some sort of traffic. You can either start pinging from the end machine or we can use the Palo Alto to bounce and try to establish that tunnel. So let's open the console for this and we're going to do a test command. We're going to bring some sort of traffic going on the tunnel to see if uh, we can bring both faces up. Okay, so I am console onto my Palo Alto. This is the Sky Company's Palo Alto. And we want to uh, bounce the tunnel to see if the tunnel comes up. So let's go ahead and do a test. And this is the way that you can try to initiate tunnel traffic. We're going to type test VPN. And then we want to try to establish phase one, which is IKEA. And now it's asking us for the gateway, which we're going to add the command gateway. And then now we're going to select create a gateway that we just created before. We created this CVPN gateway. Let's add the CVPN gateway and we'll press enter. Okay, so now you can see that the Palo Alto initiated IKEV1 SA. So let's try to see if uh, there's some sort of activity going on on the tunnel now. Let me refresh. And there you go. So now we have IKEV phase 1 showing green. That means it has established. 
And let's do the same thing for now phase two, which is the IPsec SA. Okay, the same command, but in this case, instead of IP SA, we're gonna use IPsec SA. And then we select tunnel and the name of the tunnel. Okay, and well now we can see the initiated IPsec SA one. So it tried to initiate IPsec, which is phase two. Let's take a look and see if uh, now we show in green. Let's refresh and boom, we now have a fully established tunnel. Now we should be able to ping end to end. Let's take a look and see from the machine, which is the 10, 10, 0, 10, to see if we can ping 10, 20, 0, 10. Okay, so let's bring PC1 and see if uh, we can ping from our network to the C company network. Okay, so I just brought my virtual machine and this machine is on the 10, 10, 0, 10 to see if we can ping 10, 20, 0, 10, and that will tell us that we have full reachability over the tunnel. And boom, yes, we definitely have reachability. That's a very, very good sign. So let's go ahead and uh, leave this running and uh, see the Palo Alto runtime stats to confirm that we're actually encapsulating and decapsulating traffic. So we're encrypting the traffic of the tunnel. And we should also see that we have the security policy getting hit counts. Okay, let's uh, first of all, let's take a look at the tunnel. And you can click here on tunnel info on their IPsec tunnels and this will tell you the stats. And yes, we can definitely see that we're getting packets encapsulated and decapsulated. If we keep refreshing, this should increment, and there you go, it's actually incrementing. So that tells us that that ping that I'm actually executing on the PC is actually going over the tunnel to the CVPN company. Okay, so let's take a look at the security policy and let's confirm if we're getting hit counts. And yes, we definitely are getting headcounts from the inside, because remember, my machine is sitting on the 1010 network, and we're going to the CVPN tunnel, or the CVPN company network, to the 102010, that's the machine, we're getting headcounts. So that means that we're definitely hitting the policy. And yeah, if we refresh, we definitely have traffic going on. So this is a complete success. This video, if you remember, we configure an IPsec VPN tunnel. And um, now in this particular session, we're going to configure a layer three tunnel interface between site A, which is sky, and site B, which is C. Benefit of going with a tunnel, a layer three tunnel interface is the fact that we can have IP reachability and allow OSPF or any other layer three route, dynamic routing protocol to perform adjacency because now we have a point to point interface that goes across the WAN or across your dedicated network. So if you have a particular scenario where you want to build a layer three dynamic routing adjacency between two peers, you can do that. So it actually saves us from adding static routes or keep adding more, more policies in order for us to allow different subnets to reach the other network. So in this case, we have site A, which is Sky, and Sky's network, they have a 172.16.0024, and we have a client on that network, which is 172.16.0.10. If you remember our previous video, we're only advertising the 1010, and we're not actually advertising, we're just announcing on the tunnel that we're allowing 1010 as my source traffic to hit the 1020. Now, we want to allow this additional subnet, but instead of manually telling, number one, telling Skycore, hey, if you want to reach 102550, I need to send a static route, and then the Palo Alto will need to have another static route to hit the traffic and send to site B. We can just enable a tunnel interface and a slash 30, so we'll have dot one on this end and then dot two on the other end. And we can have OSPF adjacency between the two Palo Altos over that IPsec tunnel and advertise in the same area, both networks and both locations. So now the C network should be able to see the subnets that are advertised over the tunnel from Skycore. So if I advertise this subnet, I should be able to see this advertised in Ccore and then my client can reach the server from Sky to C over the IPsec tunnel by following a dynamic routing protocol. It's very useful and it's more simpler to manage because then you don't need to add static routes on every single hop on your network. You just need to enable OSPF on the interfaces and advertise that subnet across the tunnel. So we need to allow the tunnel to send this traffic from the 172.16. If you remember 
on our previous video, we configured proxy IDs. In the proxy IDs, we advertised the source, which was 1010 and 1020 as the destination on the sky firewall and the C firewall. We advertised it backwards because now the source will be 1020 and the destination will be 1010. We still need to advertise the new ID because we're sending this IP natively and the IPsec tunnel policy, we need to allow this subnet all over the tunnels so it can flow and it's permitted and the Palo Alto doesn't drop that traffic. So we still need to add the proxy ID onto the IPsec tunnel config and we need to enable a layer three interface on the tunnel interface and assign these IPs. So let's go ahead and configure IPsec tunnel in tunnel mode. And what we're gonna do, we're just gonna update the existing tunnel and add an interface IP in both locations, then enable OSBF end to end. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, so I have here the C core. If you remember our slide, we have a two cores. One core is the sky core in site A, and then the other core, it's the C core in site B. Let me show you how C core is configured and we'll show you how Sky's core is configured so you can see that we have enabled OSPF locally on the interfaces and we need to enable OSPF between the Palo Alto and Sky core and then we'll configure the tunnel so it can have reachability or bring adjacency to site B or the C company. Okay. So inside core, I have uh, two interfaces. The interface that faces the Palo Alto. On the Palo Alto, we have that one with the 10, 10, 0, 1, and then the core is dot two. The interface that faces the client PC is 172.16.0.1, and the client PC is 10. If you take a look at the configuration on the interface that faces the Palo Alto, we have enabled OSPF process one and area zero and also enable this to be a network point-to-point -point interface. So we need to do the same thing on the Palo Alto so we can have reachability to the Sky Core in OSPF. So we need to know that we have adjacency built between Sky Core and the Palo Alto. So let's take a look if we have adjacency between Sky Core and the Palo Alto. And we don't. So you can see there's no output. So let's fix that. Let's build adjacency between Palo Alto and the Sky Core. Okay, real quick, I'm going to go to network. I'm going to go to the virtual router and we're enabling OSPF and we're going to configure this to be local router ID of 10, 10, 0, 1. And um, we're going to add the area, area zero, type normal. We're not adding a range. We're just doing interface, enabling OSPF on the interface. Let's enable interface, the inside interface one slash two. And we're going to enable this to be a point to point because remember on the core, we have to put point to point and that's it. We we'll press OK, OK, and OK, and we'll commit. And now we'll check how the core has seen that adjacency. OK, let's take a look at the core. And we already see a log message that we have an adjacency to the neighbor, which is 10, 10, 0, 1. That's our Palo Alto. That looks very good. And there you go. We have full state. And we're peer in OSPF between the Sky Core and the Palo Alto in Site A or Sky. Let's build OSPF in the tunnel interface. So let's configure interface mode on the site to site tunnel. On our previous section, we already configured that IPsec tunnel. So what we need to do now is enable to be a layer three interface between the two sites. So let's go ahead into interfaces because remember, if we go into the IPsec tunnel, there's a tunnel interface assigned to this IPsec tunnel. And we have tunnel three on Sky site A. So tunnel three is the tunnel interface that is attached to the site to site tunnel. We need to add that IP under this interface. Let's take a look at what was the IP that we need to assign. On the Skype side, we have the 22000 slash 30, and we're going to assign to tunnel three dot one. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay, let me go ahead and um, find that interface. Let's go to interfaces, tunnel, tunnel three, and now in IPv4, I am going to add that interface IP. Okay, so now we have that interface assigned and we're gonna press commit. Okay, so now while that's committing, we're gonna add the same address space on the C firewall and we're gonna add a dot two on the tunnel interface. Okay, let's go to the C firewall. Let's go to network. And by the way, let's take a look at the IPsec tunnel here on the Sky firewall. And we're going to see what's the assigned tunnel interface. And you can see it here is dot two. Let's go ahead and configure interface tunnel dot two. 
Let's go to Tunnel, select Tunnel 2, IPv4, and we're going to add the dot two here. Okay, so now we have the dot two here. Press OK, and we'll commit. Okay, now that we commit, we need to tell in the tunnel what other networks are going to be allowed to traverse the tunnel. So let's go ahead and configure that. Let's go first to the uh, C firewall, and this is the VPN tunnel that goes to Sky. Okay, and under proxy IDs, I'm going to add those two new subnets that they are going to be allowed to go through the tunnel. Let's click on Add. Okay, this will be my proxy ID, Sky Traffic 2. My local LAN side will be, and now my new subnet on Sky will be the 172.16. Okay, because if you remember, this is our new client subnet in the Sky network. Let me show you the diagram again. The diagram, we're allowing this source traffic on the tunnel to hit this network on the Sky network. So from 10.2 to destination 172.16, where my PC is. And we have to do the same thing backwards from Sky to C. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so I got this uh, network advertised or this network added into the proxy ID. And we're going to add one more. It's this subnet right here, the 10.255.0024. So remember, this is our source networks. Those are our source networks, and those are our destination networks. So we should have the policies allowed for those two. Okay, so let me add this real quick. Local. Remember, this is my local, new local LAN in C. Now this local LAN will be able to hit this remote network in Sky. And we'll do one more. And there you go. Now I am allowing both local networks in the C company to hit the remote networks in the Sky company. We'll press OK. And now finally, we need to enable OSPF and allow the pol security policy to allow the new subnets to go through the zones. So let's enable OSPF. OK, let's enable the uh, OSPF process also on the tunnel interface. Go to OSPF, Area 0, and now we're going to select a new interface that will participate in Area 0. And it will be the, the Tunnel Interface 2, because this is the C firewall, it's going to be Tunnel 2. Select the Tunnel 2 interface, and we're just going to do a broadcast on this particular interface. Press here, we'll press OK, and we'll press OK again. And finally, we're going to configure that security policy, because we're only allowing... 1020 to hit 1010 and then backwards 1010 to hit 1020. So now we got to do the same thing or we just need to add out those two new subnets here. Okay, in the security policy, I already have the first subnet. Let me add the second subnet. That's my local subnet in the C company. Okay, destination. Okay, so now my two local networks are allowed to hit the remote subnets in the Sky company. We'll press OK. And let's do the same thing backwards. Okay, let's add the second remote subnet because this is my Sky to Inside policy. So the source will be incoming from the tunnel going to my local network. So I'm allowing those two subnets to traverse the tunnel to reach my networks on the inside. And I'm going to add the new inside subnet. We'll press OK. And now we'll commit. Okay, so now we have to do the same thing on the Sky firewall. I am going to configure on the Sky firewall a little bit quicker, so we continue testing. So let's go ahead real quick and IPsec tunnels. I'm going to add my proxy IDs. In this case, will be from Sky to C. And I forgot to add the second local one, so let's go ahead and add that. Okay, one more. Now we have this ready. Finally, we have to enable OSPF on the tunnel interface. In this case, we have tunnel 3 as the tunnel interface on this side-to-side -side tunnel. Okay, so let's select OSPF, area zero, interface, and add the tunnel interface here. Enable, enable, okay. And finally, the policies. We're just gonna add, again, the new subnets traverse the zone-to-zone -zone traffic. Okay, let's go ahead and add on the source, and this will be the new remote subnet that needs to go through. Okay, and we're gonna go destination, and add the new one. And we should be good on this one. Let's do it backwards now. Okay, and let's go ahead and commit. Okay, so it's, it's committed. So now we just need to test. Before we do a ping test or check the routes on the core, let's take a look at the virtual router on the Palo Alto and see if we see some sort of adjacency 
formed in the OSPF process. Let's go here into virtual routers. I'm actually clicking runtime stats. From here, I can see if I'm having OSPF and indeed, here we go. So we have here that it has learned OSPF already and we see the sum that's advertised, which it's showing my next hop to be dot two. And I'm actually on Sky Firewall and my local IP on the tunnel interface is dot one. And I already see that dot two is advertising. So that is a very good sign. That means that we're definitely adjacent in OSPF and the core is actually sending the routes onto the Palo Alto, which the Palo Alto is then advertising the other side to side tunnel. So if I go into the OSPF process and click neighbors, boom, there you go. So I got my local core as my local neighbor. So this is the sky core and I do have the neighbor Palo Alto and the C firewall. So let's go ahead and uh, do a show command on the core switch to see if we can see some routes as well. And finally we'll test. And we definitely have adjacency to the Palo Alto, but now we need to see if we see the routes from the C company. There you go. So we see both routes advertising on SPF 10.20.00 and 10.255.0.24. This is a very good news. Finally, what we need to do is test connectivity. We should be able to ping from the 172.16.0.10, which is my local machine in the Sky network, to the server and the C core, which is 10.255.0.10. So let's go ahead and confirm that we are able to ping from this machine all the way over the tunnel to this server right here. And everything has been advertised in OSBF as we can confirm on the information shown in the firewall. Let's go ahead and ping. Okay, first of all, let's ping if we can hit the Palo Alto, the local interface and the Palo Alto for this network. And sure enough, I can ping it. Moment of truth, let's ping that server. There you go. So we definitely have reachability. Our job is done. We have OSPF adjacency going over a site-to-site -site IPsec tunnel over the WAN. So this is very good news. And this is a great way to have a peer and advertise multiple subnets over the internet by using that IPsec tunnel. We have reachability between this uh, network and the C network via OSPF, which is then advertised over this IPsec tunnel. In this video, we're going to take a look at configuring the Global Protect portal. And this is step one and involves enabling the portal. And the portal is it's just a front end that it's enabled on the Palo Alto's outside interface or the external facing interface to allow your remote users to download the Global Protect client. Once they install that Global Protect client on their machines or endpoints, they can establish a VPN tunnel to the environment. So they can do a remote access VPN connection to the Global Protect gateway. Once we enable or once we're ready to configure the portal, we need to create an authentication profile and that authentication profile will be attached to the Global Protect portal. So anyone that is member of that authentication profile, either you select local users or at your remote LDAP or Active Directory server, any user that belongs to the security group that is allowed to go to the Global Protect portal will be able to sign in and download the, the client. So let's go ahead and configure the Global Protect portal. Okay. In order for us to enable the Global Protect portal, we need to configure some prerequisite. This will allow the portal to be enabled on that outside interface. We need to create a local VPN user for this example and also create a VPN users group. So any member that would like to have remote access VPN to the environment will be able to do so once it's added into the VPN users group. We then need to continue creating an authentication profile. And what that's going to do, it's going to select the type of authentication that we want to use on our Global Protect portal. So the Global Protect portal, basically a website that allows the end user to download that Global Protect client. And we need to tell what type of user it's allowed to log in into that portal. And we can then point our VPN users group to be the group that is allowed to access the portal. Once we create that authentication profile, we need to create that certificate signing request. In this case, if we want, by the way, this is a recommended way of going, you should definitely generate a certificate signing request and upload that to your external CA authority. In this case, if you have, for example, GoDaddy or DigiCert 
have that CSR generated on the Palo Alto, then signed by your external authority. Or in this case, for this demonstration, we're just going to do a self-signed certificate. Once we have that, then we can attach that certificate into a SSL or TLS service profile. What that's going to do is going to tell the portal what certificate it's going to use for that web front end. SSL port 443, it's the port that is going to be listening for users that want to hit the portal then they need to have a certificate that they need to trust. There's a, a certificate that is put in front of the portal in order for us to have a secure connection to our environment. And finally, we are going to configure and enable the Global Protect portal once we have all those prerequisites created and enabled. So let's go ahead and configure each step and let's enable the Global Protect portal. Okay, so once you're inside your Palo Alto, so once you logged in into your PA, you're going to create a local user and this is, will be the user that is going to be allowed to hit that global protect portal. So let's go ahead and click on users and you can see I already have a VPN user created. This is basically a local user and this user will be added into the VPN users group. We go into the users group. I already have a VPN users group. You can see here that I just allowed the VPN user one into the VPN users group. Let's go ahead and create an authentication profile. We'll click Authentication Profile, so we're still on Device, Authentication Profile, and we'll click Add, and let's call this the Global Protect Auth Profile. So we label this Global Protect Authentication Profile, and the type. This is where we can select, either we can go local, so you remember we'll configure a local VPN users group, so in this case we're going to use a local database, but we have more options. We can do LDAT, Radius, TACX, uh, SAML, or Kerberos. In our case, we're just going to do a local database. Local database, and because it's local, we don't need to add a domain prefix to the authentication profile. And this is what the Palo Alto is going to look for the actual user input. So if we go on to advanced, and here we're going to allow that particular group into the Global Protect portal via this profile. So you can see here, I just click add on the allow list and I'm going to add my VPN users group. We'll press OK and we are done for the authentication profile. So we're set with the auth profile. Now we're going to create a certificate. We need to generate a certificate that it's going to be attached to the Global Protect portal. So let's go ahead and click certificate under certificate management. We'll go to certificates. We'll click generate and you're going to be presented with this window where it's going to ask you if you have a local or an external issuing your certificate. In our case, we're just going to have a local uh, certificate. We're going to call this global protect portal cert. Okay. Common name. And this is a very important item because we're just doing a self-signed certificate. I'm just going to add a um, generic name. In theory, you should definitely add this with the public facing DNS record. So in case, for example, you want people to connect to a new URL where they are going to be able to download that client, they can do it with a friendly name instead of having a, an IP address. So in our case, imagine the scenario where I want my company to uh, download that client via remote remote.company.com. So that will be the website and I type company as my name of the company. So you can type your own company name. I'm just calling this remote.company.com. So every user that wants to have remote access and needs to download the client, you will tell them, hey, just go to, to this website. They can pull or they can retrieve that Global Protect client. Signed by, well, in this case, because we're not going to be signing a certificate against an external authority, we're just going to make ourselves a certificate authority. So the Palo Alto is basically going to do a self-signed certificate for this demonstration. And again, make sure that you don't go self-signed certificate for public-facing web services. That's that's the no-no. You definitely need to have a, an external authority issue certificate. So make sure that this is just demonstration, okay? And uh, this is where you can change the algorithm. You can put the encryption bit. Uh, you can select your digest, etc. So I'm just going to click generate and you can see that the Palo Alto has successfully generated the certificate and the key pair. And now we have a certificate and it's showing valid expiration and this is the expiration date. Okay, so now we have the certificate. Now we need to create an SSL TLS service profile where we're going to point that certificate to. We're going to call this Global Protect Portal Service Profile. And here we're going to select our previously made certificate. So there you go. I am attaching the certificate and I'm going to tell 
that I want to negotiate TLS version 1.1 or anything that is above 1.1. And this is how you can tell the Palo Alto, I want to negotiate this particular encryption protocol. So I want to have TLS version 1.1 as my minimal protocol to negotiate between my client and then anything that is above that. We'll press OK. We have the certificate attached to the service profile. Now that we have that, we should be good to configure the Global Protect portal. I'm going to go onto Network and we're going to click Global Protect. So you can see here under Network, I have interfaces. So right below, you're going to see the subsection of Global Protect. And in there, you're going to see the portal. We're going to click on Portals and we're going to create our first Global Protect portal. Uh, that's my name. And I'm going to select my outside interface in this case is interface ethernet one slash one now i'm going to select an ip before address and this is the address that is going to be used to establish a connection to our portal and i'm going to select my public facing ip and you can see this is a private ip uh, and the reason why it's showing as a private ip is because this firewall is running as a virtual firewall in Azure. So I have a Cloud Palo Alto firewall running in Azure and basically the, the Palo Alto is going to show a, a private ip but I actually have a secondary public IP attached in my Azure resource group. You can see here, I am on my Microsoft Azure account. So I have a Palo Alto deploy on the cloud. And what I had to do was basically on my outside interface, and you can see the subnet is the untrust subnet. And you can see that one dot four, and that was the IP of my external facing IP on the Palo Alto. I just attached a public IP, and this is a real public IP that the end users will use to get to the global protect portal this is a very good way to deploy a firewall in the cloud you just basically deploy either pay as you go a palo alto or you can bring your own license and you can deploy the palo alto on the cloud i just want to show you this as a an example or what am i doing to present this section and have a true testing environment so we can know that from the outside we can definitely reach the global protect portal Okay, so now that you saw that private IP is actually attached to a public IP, appearance. We can let the Palo Alto use the factory default portal login page, but we can also customize that. So if you want to customize, you can create a custom portal login page. In this case, we're not going to show that, but you can definitely customize this portal page to whatever your environment suits. Or you want to customize it to have a more graphical or something that is more related to your environment, you can do so. Well, in our case, I'm just going to leave it as the default. Same with the landing. So once you log in, you're going to get presented with the website or the web page that you can use to download that Global Protect client. And uh, this is the default landing page. Authentication. Okay, we're now going to select that SSL and TLS service profile. You remember that we created a profile? This is where we're going to choose that profile, which will have already that certificate attached. And once we have the profile, we need to add our authentication profile. So remember, we created authentication profile and we added the VPN users group. So we'll click on add. And we'll click here, this is the auth profile, our authentication profile for the portal. And we're going to allow any OS version to authenticate. And we're then going to attach that authentication profile that we created earlier that has the VPN users group. Okay, and the Global Protect app login screen, this is what you can do to customize what is the label on the actual portal. So what's going to show the end user where they, what they need to type in order for them to have access to the environment. So you can customize those, that information that is shown on the portal. An authentication message, I am actually going to customize this so you can see that we can definitely customize the page. Okay, I'm just adding here authorized users only. And I should see that once I enable the portal. We'll click OK. And you also have agents that can also be attached to the portal. But in our case, we're just going to do a normal, uh, very basic portal. So you can have agents and attach it to specific external gateways that will also serve as part of the Global Protect portal. And I can have clientless VPNs. In this case, we're, we're going to use the Global Protect client. So I'm not going to be doing a presentation on clients VPN. But you, if you want a specific service that not necessarily needs to have a Global Protect client, it just need to have a TLS SSL connection to your on-prem using the portal, they can do so. And satellite, you can definitely connect multiple instances onto this particular portal configuration. I am not going to proceed to do that. It's basically creating the portal so you can take a look at how it's configured and it's very, very, very straightforward. Uh, we're going to press OK. Now that we have the portal, guess what? We just need to enable it and we should be good to go. Okay, so I'm committing my changes and then we'll test and see how that goes. 
Okay, so if you remember, I was on my Azure Palo Alto, and I do have a public IP that is attached to the private IP that is sitting on the outside interface on the cloud Palo Alto. So I have that public IP, so I should be able to hit that public IP and hit the portal. And boom, there you go. So I do have the Global Protect portal, and it's asking me for a username and password. Let's go ahead and type that username and password. And sure enough, so here we go. We have now the capability of downloading the Global Protect client straight out of the actual portal. So we have the link to download the agent, and this is basically the Global Protect client. And once we install that on our endpoints, we should be able to establish a Global Protect connection to the gateway. If I want to download it for a Mac format, I can do it, or Windows 32 and 64 bit. So if I click one of them, there you go. I am now downloading the Global Protect agent from my Azure Palo Alto firewall. Okay, one last thing. Now that we know that the Global Protect portal is actually working, we need to also discuss that the Global Protect agent is updated on a regular basis. So once you click on the device, you're going to scroll right below almost at the end, and you're going to see the Global Protect client link or section. We'll click here. And this is all the versions that are available on our Palo Alto for our Global Protect client. If you can see here, it shows my version size and the date that it was released along with the uh, check mark if it was downloaded and it's actually active. So if you have this particular check mark enabled, so you have this 3.00 as your activated version, it's the one that is going to be shown on the Global Protect portal. So say, for example, you want to upgrade, and you can see we're pretty much behind the, the latest and greatest. We just need to download the base of the next version that we want to go to. In our case, we want to go to 4.0, so we just click Download, and we should have now the version 4.0 on our Palo Alto. Once we have a version 4.0, and we just downloaded that from the Palo Alto's cloud service, so once we download that version, we can then say, well, I want to upgrade our portal and our clients to use 4.0. We'll click on activate and we'll click yes. Once we activate, then the Global Protect portal will start serving 4.0. If we want to upgrade to a newer version, we just do the same. We'll select the base and then we'll select any increments inside the base. So for example, if I want to upgrade 4.0, you know, from 4.0.0, and we want to upgrade everyone to the latest version in the base, which the base in this case is 4.00, and the latest version in 4.0, or the last version in 4.0, it was 4.08, we can then select download, and now we should have 4.08. And then once it finishes download, then we can activate the same way we did before. Let's wait until it finishes, we'll click close, and we'll activate. We should have 408 as our enabled client. And you can keep going up to 5 if you want. But now the Global Protect portal will be serving 408. Okay, everyone, this video, now that we have our Global Protect portal configured, it's time to enable the gateway and allow those remote users to connect to our on-prem environment or cloud environment. So we have our firewall, it's sitting on the outside. We want to enable the gateway in order for us to provide remote access to our remote users, vendors, etc. We want to allow people to securely connect into our environment by establishing a, a VPN connection to our Palo Alto's outside interface. And this is where we configure the Global Protect Gateway. Okay, so if you take a look here at my a diagram I have a global protect client and this is the application that we are going to download from the portal so remember on the last video we configured the global protect portal and clients are going to point to the either the public IP or the fully qualifying domain name in order for them to download the client once they have it installed they're going to point into the public IP that is allocated into the global protect gateway configuration so once we create that global protect gateway we're going to allocate that public IP and our remote users, either they're going to point to the public IP, or if we sign a certificate, which we definitely need to do a certificate, so definitely a more secure approach, 
uh, we'll sign the C uh, certificate using a fully qualified domain name. And then if you have a public DNS provider, you can change your public A record to point to the public IP. In this demonstration, we're just going to do it with public IP, but the outcome will be the same if you go into performing a fully qualified domain name. Okay, so we have the Global Protect client is going to connect to our Palo Alto through the Global Protect gateway. Once we are connected, we're going to get a route advertised on our Global Protect client that will tell the endpoint or the, the user machine, hey, I have access to the 192.168.00.24 via this tunnel interface that is established using the Global Protect client. We're going to take a look at how do you advertise specific routes and how Global Protect client sees those on the end user. So we open the Global Protect client and there's a section in the client that you can see what routes are being advertised via this connection. Okay. Let's continue. So there's a couple of items that we need to configure in the Global Protect Gateway. One of them, we should have already configured the Global Protect Portal because we're now going to enable that agent into the portal that is going to allow us to authenticate and connect to the gateway. We need to also create a tunnel interface and tunnel interface is to point a specific source of that traffic either coming inbound or going outbound firewall. So we're going to allocate all of our remote global protect traffic using that tunnel interface and then we can apply policies as well. So we can use that tunnel interface as this is the interface that my traffic from my remote users are going to the on-prem environment and we can apply policies and restrict traffic if we need to. We also need to create a global protect zone and this is another zone on the firewall is just like the outside and inside we're going to allocate the tunnel interface that we just created add them in the global protect zone once we have that it's a matter of creating that security policy and allowing the access if we need to based on the, the requirements for that remote user and finally we need to allocate the users that are, are going to be allowed to connect to and this is done on the actual gateway so on the global protect gateway settings we are going to map either the local users or remote users that we have that are going to be allowed to connect via vpn once we have all that we'll basically configure that global protect gateway attach all the ssl settings or the ssl certificate that we have for our global protect portal into the gateway and we'll configure the IP pool. And this is the IP pool. It's the private address range that we're going to assign those remote users once they establish a connection. And then finally the agent settings and such. So let's go ahead, let's jump real quick onto configuring that gateway. Now that we have the Global Protect portal configured, it's a matter of configuring the gateway and adding those attributes that is going to allow our remote users to establish a connection. Okay, so let's begin. Okay, so I have my firewall here and this firewall is currently running in Microsoft Azure. I have a public IP allocated to it and I can definitely reach out from the outside. I can do all changes from the outside. And I am also attaching a particular public IP dedicated for the global protect uh, connectivity. Okay, so the first thing we gotta do is configure a zone. So let's go ahead and configure real quick the global protect zone. We'll make it traditional layer three and we're gonna leave interfaces as it is for now. And then let's go ahead and configure a tunnel interface. And as a matter of fact, I already have tunnel one and we can use tunnel one. If you can see here, it's not attached to anything. It's just, you know, sitting there. Let me go ahead and to global protect and let's attach tunnel interface one. And now we know that tunnel interface one belongs to the global protect zone. So once we configure the gateway, we attach this particular tunnel and we should be good to go. Okay, so we now have the zone and we have the interface attached to the zone. So you can see here, something very important that we need to do, and it's we need to enable user identification because we want to know the users that are connecting via this particular zone so we can inspect their end devices. So if we wanna put policies that will restrict or allow users based on what end device are they trying to use to connect to. For example, if we want to have users meet certain security requirements in order for them to connect, then this is done with HIP profiles. In HIP profiles, you can say, well, if the machine is not up to date with Windows updates, I am not going to allow it in. If the machine doesn't have an up-to-date antivirus, I am not going to allow it and such. So you definitely need to enable this. And also this is a requirement because the Palo Alto is going to take a look at the user attribute once they try to log in or traverse between zones. So make sure that you always enable this. Okay. We'll press okay. Okay. So we have this ready. Let's go ahead and configure the gateway. We're going to click add. 
and this name we're going to call it global protect gateway interface it's sitting on the outside so we're going to select our interface e11 this is my outside interface and i am going to select the public ip and you see this is a private ip and the reason why it's i have it in azure and azure allocates a private ip but then it maps a public ip to it so if you're familiar with azure you know what i'm talking about if you're not familiar with Azure, this is the way. So they're going to give you a private subnet that is called the untrusted subnet. And then you can attach a public IP. It's basically doing some sort of natting in the cloud. So the cloud will basically nat to this particular private IP. But this is why it shows as private. If you're not running it on the cloud and it's on-prem, you're going to see a public IP here. This will be interface public IP. Or you can allocate a different public IP if you have a public block available. Okay, so let's go into authentication. Authentication, we're going to use the SSL service profile that we use to configure that Global Protect portal. So once we made that Global Protect portal, at some point we had to do an SSL profile so it can have a, a certificate binded to the service. In this case, I'm just going to use the same one that I was using for the portal. Next, we need to enable client authentication, and this is how the Palo Alto is going to take a look at the particular user attributes as well as the user login to confirm that they're authorized to log in. We're going to click Add. And we're going to say Client Auth. That's a test. Operating system, I am going to allow anything. And then I am going to attach my local authentication profile. And this is the local auth profile that I made on the device and i'm going to show it real quick uh, let me go ahead and show it to you let me just press ok and we'll come back to this slide let me go back here so if we go here in auth profile and this is where i attach type of authentication that i'm going to grant to uh, global protect gateway or any other service in the palo alto in this case i'm using it for global protect gateway so i'm going to look in my local palo alto firewall database for local users so any local user inside the local database will be matched against this authentication profile i'm going to press ok and right now because this is just a demo i'm going to allow all so any user that i have configured here is going to be allowed and currently i only have one vpn user but if i have multiple vpn users because i am attaching all as my allow list then i'm going to allow everyone to connect you definitely want to make sure that you have specific groups, not allow all, because maybe not everyone is entitled to do VPN. So you want to make sure that you have that. And obviously, I'm using local authentication because I am looking for my local user database. Okay, so let's go back. Let me go back here. And so we were here. And now you know why we need that local all profile. And I am going to let this by default, so username, password, and then enter login details. This will be shown on the actual application itself, on the Global Protect client. If you want to change that to something different so that your users are more familiar with your client, then you can do so. You can modify this as you wish. So we have that. Let me go on to the agent. Okay, this is very important. An agent, we're going to enable tunnel mode, right? Because we want to have the global protect zone available for us so we can create multiple policies because we can have multiple vpn connections but i can attach them to separate policies i don't want to have just one policy i want to make sure that i can segment connectivity on the global protect side so if, for example i have a group of users that are part of hr and i want them to go to the hr resources i can be granular with that so just enable tunnel mode and then we're going to select our tunnel interface, which we selected one to be that tunnel interface. Okay. If you want to enable IPsec, you can make this connectivity IPsec. For now, I'm just going to make it simpler for this demonstration, but you can definitely do IPsec. It's way more secure. And then you got to attach a crypto profile for this IPsec type of connectivity. We're just going to click here. Timeouts. So you can say how much time do you want to leave the user logged in? And how long do you want to disconnect if you don't see any traffic from that user, as well as an activity. So I want to make sure that the user is disconnected, auto-disconnected after three hours if they're not doing anything on the connection. Client IP pool. I can set an I client IP pool here so I can tell I want to offer this range of private IPs to my Global Protect clients. But I'm going to do a client profile that is going to be here. I can also configure this same setting there. In this case, it's going to tell if you put IPs here, I'm going to add those IPs as the tunnel traffic. So the Palo Alto will know that those IPs are part of that particular route 
or particular tunnel. So the tunnel will be binded to that particular IP. But I'm going to show you, I think, a better way to configure this, which is going via the client settings and then configuring all those attributes here. So now in client settings, I'm going to click add, right? And then we're going to call it uh, client. And then we're going to select user groups or users. In this case, I'm going to leave it in any. IP pools. Okay, this is what I was talking. Let's configure that IP pool range. And let's say 10, 0, 0, 10 to 10, 0, 0, 100. So I'm going to allow over 90 connections into the Global Protect Gateway because I'm going to offer over 90 addresses. So if I run of IPs, then I need to add another or extend the pool or add another range if I want to. And split tunnel. Okay, another thing that is very important. This is where you got to specify what subnets they're going to be able to reach via that tunnel. So this is how you advertise your internal networks to the Global Protect client. So this is how you tell the Global Protect client and the end machine or the end user, hey, you're able to reach this networks via this connection. So in this case, because we only have one network based on our slide, which is 192.168.0.0.24. So I'm going to tell all my remote users that they're going to be able to reach this network via their connection. Okay, we'll press OK. So we got that. And network services, this is where you definitely need to configure that DNS entry. So the end machine can reach a DNS server if they need to resolve an internal name for an application or a service that you're offering on premise. In this case, I'm not going to, it's just a demonstration. And HIP, I can uh, configure those policies that I mentioned before that you can restrict traffic if their users are not meeting the requirements, like they don't have up to date antivirus, they don't have enable updates, etc. Satellite. In satellite, if I want to configure a specific tunnel config for this particular section, I can do so. I am not going into detail on satellite. I am going to use the normal agent config for this particular demonstration, but that's something you want to take a look at. It's also another option that you can go ahead and configure the gateway in satellite mode. I am going to do agent mode, which basically is the de facto standard uh, way of configuring it, but you are good to uh, set it up in, in satellite mode as well. I am going to do agent without IPsec. For this demonstration, we're not gonna enable IPsec. So we have pretty much everything that we need. Let me go and click, okay. Let me go to portals. And now I got to enable that, the portal to authenticate my Global Protect Gateway users. So let's go ahead real quick here and to the Global Protect portal. We're not in the gateway anymore. We're on the portal, portal config. Okay, we gotta make sure that we're using the same authentication profile. Let me go now onto agent. And this is very important, okay? If you configure the agent, but you don't tell the Global Protect portal, hey, I am going to allow connectivity from a specific public IP or FQDN, the Global Protect client will not work. It's gonna say it's invalid. The gateway is invalid because I am not allowing it on the portal. So the portal and the gateway are very much related. So you gotta make sure that everything is consistent between the gateway and the portal. So let me go ahead and configure the agent. And this is the portal agent. We already configured the Global Protect Gateway agent, which we allocated that IP pool. We allocated those routes and we added the user that is gonna be allowed to connect to. In this case, we need to tell the Palo Alto, hey, if you see a user connecting to this portal to the gateway, then you want to allow it. I'm gonna say, and then we're gonna say, we have options to enable client certificates if you want. We're not gonna do client certificates. We want to override the authentication profile. We can do so, we're not. We want to enable two-factor. If you want to do two-factor or 2FA off, we can do so from here. In this case, we're not. And then we're just going to leave it in any internal gateways. We don't have internal gateway. We have external gateways. And this is where we attach that public IP into our config. And we're going to say global protect IP. And then in this case, I'm going to do an IP. I don't have a fully qualified domain name. And let me find the IP. Okay, so I have my IP here. Let me go ahead and type it. It's gonna be 4086. And by the way, if you see, this is not the public IP for the Global Protect Gateway. This is actually my management interface that I have a public facing IP so I can manage it from the outside. Again, I'm mentioning that this an Azure Cloud Firewall. 
Okay, so I have my public IP here, and this is the IP that is attached to the outside interface in this particular model. And I can show you in Azure in a bit, so you can take a look and see how that is. Let me go ahead and pull Azure so you're more familiar. You're not getting confused of why I have this public IP and not this one. I'm going to select my firewall. This is my Palo Alto, the one that we're connecting to. And you can see here, this is my management IP. If you remember on my firewall, uh, let me go back into the firewall. It's the 4078-8480. So this is my public management IP, and this is my outside interface public IP. Let me show you that again. Okay, so we go back into Azure. Let me go into networking, and then let me click on Ethernet 1. And there you go. That is my public IP, and it's facing my untrust subnet in Azure, which is the 10.0.1.4. If you remember on the portal or on the gateway when I configured the public IP, and it was actually a private, this is actually translated to this. So this public IP in Azure translates to this on the inside. That's how I'm able to reach the firewall from the outside. So this is my public IP right here. And if you're wondering how to allocate public IPs in Azure, I can give you a freebie. And this is how you do it. So you go onto your interface on your virtual machine in the cloud and then go to IP configs. And this is how you attach a public IP. So I have my interface on the outside. So this is my outside interface in the Palo Alto. If you click this, you can actually attach a public IP. So this is how you attach a public IP to a private interface on your cloud firewall. Okay, let's go back. Okay, so once here, now we have a public IP. Now you understand what's the difference between this and this. I'm gonna click add. And this is source region. I can be specific from which part of the world we're going to allow access into this particular Global Protect Gateway. For this demonstration, I'm going to do any, but you can be granular. You can select specific address ranges, but in this case, I am going to allow all of it. And we'll press OK. And then let's see what else we have. Oh, this is very important. OK, so in the portal, I can modify the behavior on the client itself. This is one great example. So by default, the Palo Alto will set the client. So the Palo Alto dictates the client how it's going to behave as far as connectivity. If you leave this in default, which is user logon always on, the Global Protect Client, every time that you boot up your machine, it's going to auto-connect. It's going to try to auto-connect once you log in into your desktop, and you're not going to be able to even disconnect. It's not going to show you a disconnect button. So you got to make sure that you change this to on-demand, which will allow you to do a manual user-initiated connection. This will allow you to have the disconnect and connect, so you can connect as you wish. It's an on-demand setting. And here, this is not only the setting. We have so much that we can change and tweak. So for example, allow the user to disable the Global Protect client or the application. I am allowing it. You want to be very strict, I can disallow it. So I can basically not allow the end user to disable the app. So they're going to be connected 24-7. And that's, you know, you control it. This is very powerful. You can dictate how your end user's client will work. Okay, so let me uh, show you. There's a lot of settings here. You can do Windows Auth. You can do single sign-on. You can have the change the thresholds every time that you're going to try to restore connection. It's five minutes, etc. So also you can have a welcome page, and this is very important. Once the user connect, you can create a welcome page that shows, hey, you just connected into XYZ's VPN tunnel. This connectivity is restricted. Only authorized users can log in, blah, blah, blah. So you can have a disclaimer page that is shown to the user once they establish a connection. So this is done through the welcome page and you can import your own. So you can generate your own welcome page and upload it as well. In this case, I'm going to just leave it as on demand. By the way, you know what? I'm going to, for this administration, let's leave it on default. And I'm going to show you what's the difference. You're going to see that I'm not going to be able to disconnect. I'm just going to leave it there and we'll change it and you'll see the difference. Okay. All right. So we got this. We'll click OK. And finally, we got to authorize the CA that issued our certificate as a trusted CA. If we don't do that, it's not going to allow us to connect to the gateway because it's not going to understand the certificate that we're trying to connect to. It's going to show us an invalid certificate. So we're just going to add our local Palo Alto as a trusted root CA. Okay, we got that. Uh, let me see what else we got to do. No, I think that's about it. And we're not doing satellite config. We're just doing this agent and that's it. We'll press OK. And yeah, looks good. So we're going to commit, and I already showed you 
that we have a local user. I'm going to use that local user to connect to the gateway. So let's uh, give it a shot. Let's wait until this finish and we'll test the connection. Okay, has finished. Let me go ahead real quick and uh, open my virtual machine. I have a virtual machine that we can do that testing from. Okay, here I am. And I already installed my Global Protect client. So I have right here. And it's asking us to type the public IP. Let's go ahead and type the public IP, which was 4078. 6286. Okay. We'll press enter and it should tell us our, yeah, correct. So we have now our uh, VPN user one. This is our VPN account that we have on the Palo Alto is asking us for those credentials. And uh, let's type the password and let's try to connect. Let's see if we're lucky. Boom. And we are connected. Woohoo. All right. Let's take a look at what we have. Let me go into settings. Okay, in your Global Protect client, you're going to be shown the general tab, which basically shows the status and if you're connected or not. Connection. I am showing myself to be an external. I am I'm tunnel connected and I am authenticated with my Palo Alto, which is sitting on the Azure environment. And see here, I got an assigned local IP. If you remember on the Global Protect Gateway agent settings, I have an IP pool range that I allocated from 10.0.0.10 all the way to 10.0.0.100. So here you go. I got the address 10, which is the first address in my range. If we go into host profiles, this is all the information that the Global Protect client is sending to the Palo Alto. So the Palo Alto can now see everything about my machine. So I can create policies based on the attributes that the client is sending. So I can restrict traffic if I am not meeting the requirements for HIP. Troubleshooting. And this is a great way also to see that we indeed have that route injected. Let me take a look here. And sure enough, remember when we uh, allocated that one in 2168 slash 24? And this is it. Now the Palo Alto told this end machine, hey, I got a subnet that is advertised via that Global Protect client. This is how you can reach the network via. So if you want to reach 182.168.0.0, go over the tunnel. That's about it. Uh, let me now change, because you saw on my config, there's no way to disconnect, because I left this in on demand. If you see here, I can disable it, that is not actually disconnecting, it's disabling the client as a whole. You don't want to do that. You want to disconnect and connect whenever you like, right? So let's go ahead and change that. And you should see now the option to be able to connect on demand or disconnect whenever you like. So let me go ahead and go back onto the PA. Okay, let's go back onto network. Let me go to the portal. We're going to go to the agent. We're going to go here. And then we're going to go into the app and then we're going to change this to be on demand. Once we do that, we got to disable the client and re-enable it. And then we should get the new settings from the firewall. We'll press OK. OK. Commit. Let's wait until this commits and we'll test it again. It's almost done. Let me go back onto my machine. OK. Let me go ahead and you see I cannot even delete or edit. It's completely locked. So let me go ahead and disable it. And I should drop because I disabled the application. Let me uh, wait for that. And there you go. We're disabled. Okay. So now I am going to enable the client back. And now it's asking me again for those credentials. Let me go ahead and type the password. Let's see now if we have the option to disconnect. And there you go. Now what's the difference? Now I can definitely disconnect. You see, you can modify the behavior on your client using the Global Protect Portal agent setting. So make sure that you set I don't know if your environment needs to be completely always on. You can do it, but I want to give out the users, you know, the flexibility to disconnect and connect with. So I'm just going to disconnect and that's it. That's about it. You're connected, disconnected. That's Global Protect Gateway and, uh, and we're done. Okay, everyone, as we begin section eight and our final section, we need to discuss some general maintenance tasks. Obviously, we're going to be upgrading our firewall image. We need to upgrade our firewalls operating system. So we need to understand what's the process behind upgrading your Palo Alto firewall from a general release to a upgrading the Palo Alto from a specific version to a specific version or adding an image in between that will provide some known issue fixes or is going to provide more features to your unit. So we need to understand the path that we need to take in order to bring a 
file off from one specific version to another specific version. So if you take a look at my slide here, I am showing that I have a Palo Alto running in 7.1.0. So I am running PanOS 7.1.0. I want to go all the way to 8.1.0. There is uh, two types of Palo Alto software upgrades. The first one is your base image. So if you're going to upgrade to a specific PanOS version, you definitely install the base image, which is going to bring you to that level. While you're running and operating on that image, you definitely will like to do some preventive upgrades or, you know, proactive upgrades to make sure that it's running on the most stable code in this particular base, and that is your maintenance upgrade. So you have a PanOS maintenance version, which is basically some changes to the base. You basically upgrade the image from the base and you apply the maintenance to that particular base. It's 7.1.1, it's the first maintenance, and then they released 7.1.19 because you waited over, I don't know, six, eight months to perform another upgrade. You might see that they already released 719. You can go ahead and from 710 upgrade to 7119. So you want to make sure that, you know, you have all those updates up to date and you are fixing every single thread, every single bug, every single flaw in the code by applying the recommended upgrade. Okay, so this is when you are working with your current base so we want to make sure that our base image is stable so we apply those preventive maintenance updates if we want to upgrade from a specific base version to another base version we need to go obviously you're going to most certainly on a specific maintenance version what you do is you apply the base on the new version and after that this is what i do i apply the latest maintenance on my base and then go ahead and apply the new code that you want to go to. So in this case, we want to do from 7.1.0, we want to go all the way to 8.1. So we need to upgrade to a maintenance release in 7.1. It's not mandatory. You can go 7.1.0, 8.0.0, and then 8.1.0. But in my case, I would like to at least patch something in between and then go 8.0, 8.0.17, which is one maintenance image in the base, so one maintenance upgrade image in the base image, and then from there go all the way to my target image. So in this case, I want to go to A.1. Okay, so you need to understand that path. Don't ever, ever go from 7.1.0 all the way to a major release without going into the base first. First of all, the PA will throw you an error saying, well, you don't have a base. So we cannot go, for example, from 7.1.0, I cannot go and patch 8.0.17 because I need the base first. So you want to go 7.1.0, 8.0, and then go all the way to 8.1. So I'm going to demonstrate how to go from 7.1.0 in this case. We're going to do this whole upgrade path from 7.1.0 all the way to 8.1.0. So we're going to upgrade a firewall that is running the 7.0 code in this case 710, we're gonna bring it to A.1. And like I mentioned, so basically maintenance will provide you additional fixes on the current base that you are running. Okay, so let's go ahead and perform that upgrade and uh, we'll go from there. So what I have is a virtual firewall that I deployed in my Azure cloud resource group. So I have a resource group in Azure where I have a couple of machines and I deployed a virtual firewall virtual Palo Alto and it's currently running 7.1.1. We're going to upgrade this to the recommended version in 8.1. We need to go, like we mentioned on our slide, 8.0, 8.1. Let's go ahead and uh, upgrade this firewall. We're going to click on device. And we're going to go all the way to the bottom and we're going to click software. Click on software and you're going to be shown all the images that you have available. And you can see here that I don't have available A.1. The reason why is until I get upgraded to A.0, then you're going to see that I'm going to be able to go all the way to A.1 and such. So the Palo Alto is intelligent enough to not provide me any image that I'm not able to upgrade to. But if you download it from the Palo Alto support site, then you can definitely apply. But again, the Palo Alto will scream telling you, hey, you don't have the base. We cannot go all the way here. So you want to make sure that you upgrade the Palo Alto in the correct path. Okay, so we're running, if you go back to the dashboard, we're running software version 711. 
we want to upgrade do a maintenance upgrade on 7.1 and we're going to upgrade it to the latest and greatest on 7.1.1 before going to 8.0. I'm going to go on device, software, and in this case, my latest image in 7.1, it's 7.1.23. And again, if you're running a specific code, so say for example, we are already are running 8.1, make sure that you read the release notes for the particular maintenance level that you're going to, because you want to make sure that there's no known issues that might affect your current production environment. Don't just go crazy and select the latest and greatest, because even though that has been published, it doesn't mean that it's stable. So you want to make sure that you select an image that you review and you understand that it's completely safe to put in production because there's no non issues reported. Okay. All right. So in this case, for this demonstration, I want to show you how to apply a maintenance patch. Let's go ahead and download. So from the Palo Alto itself, you can download the image and then apply it to the firewall. So let's go ahead and click download. So I'm going to select the latest maintenance release in 7.1, which is 7.1.23. Click on download. And right now we're downloading that image. Once we're done, we should be able to patch it and upgrade to 7.1.23. Let's wait for this and we should be good to go. Okay, almost done. It's being loaded into the software manager. So basically that's a partition inside the Palo Alto that will hold that particular image revision. Okay, and it has completed. So let's go ahead and uh, apply the maintenance. So now that we see here, we have it downloaded. It has been uploaded into the software manager. We are good to go and install the image. So let's go ahead and install the update. Once that's done, it'll probably apply and it will restart the unit. It will reload the services and uh, apply the image. Okay, and sure enough, it has completed and it's asking us to do a reboot so it can apply the maintenance upgrade. So let's go ahead and click yes and we'll wait for the PA to come back online. Here, yes, and it's telling me that it's in the process of rebooting and uh, we should wait a little bit to see that the screen has refreshed and it should prompt us to put the username and password to log in. Okay, the firewall has come back online. Let's uh, let me log in real quick. Okay, logging back in. Let's take a look now at the firewall. Now we can see once the firewall has come back online, we're running 7123. So that means that we had a successful upgrade. Let's go ahead and go to A.O, but I am going to tell you that there's something very important. There's a step that we need to do that is very important before we go from one version to another version. And it's the fact that once you move between versions, the configuration of the firewalls, the syntax on the firewall of the config might change. So we need to export the configuration running in this particular version before we upgrade to the next base version. The reason why is if for some reason the code is not stable, if for some reason we need to roll back, we need to reapply the old version or for somehow we had a um, catastrophic upgrade or something happened, the firewall died, didn't come back. We need to roll back to 7.1. You need to apply the configuration that was running in 7.1. So it has the syntax that is compatible with 7.1. So we want to make sure that we perform a backup of the config before going to the next base version. So let's go ahead and do a quick backup. And then, by the way, I'm going to be discussing backup on our next video. So I'm just going to do this real quick for this demonstration. Let's go ahead and uh, save the config. We're going to call this PA01. Okay, so we know that this config was running on 7.0. You can also, you know, set the day if you want. So in this case, we're going to put today's date and we are going to save the config. And now we have it and now we can export it just in case something happens to the disk where that data has been stored. If for some reason the upgrade fails and we need to format the whole appliance in order to bring it back online, we need to make sure that we have that config all ready to go. And you can see here, once I did save, I can now export the config that I just saved. And sure enough, I do have the copy locally on my machine. Now we should be good to go to upgrade to 8.0. I'm going to go down here again, software. And now we're running. Can you see here under currently installed? So we have a column say currently installed. And we have a check mark under 7123. So that's the code that we're currently running because it's actually checked mark. Now we're good to go into our A.0 base. 
If you see here also, take a look, the base images are usually bigger than any maintenance upgrade. So they will have all the base features and prerequisites of A.0. So all that information regarding this particular image will be in the base. So that's why you need to first go onto the base and then upgrade to your preferred maintenance. So let's go ahead and download. Okay, so I am downloading 8.0.0. Okay, now the image is being loaded into the software manager. That's the uh, Palo Alto's internal portation where it stores all those images. Once we have that, we should be able to activate the image. Okay, we're good to go. Let's all go ahead and click close. And now we should have that available for install. So let's click on install and we're upgrading from 7.1.0 to 8.0. We're going from a maintenance release in 7.1, and we're going to go on to 8.00 in the base image. And it's actually telling me, please review, because we're changing the, the, the version from 7 to 8. And if you see right here what we just mentioned, we need to perform a backup of the config that was running in 7.1 in case we need to downgrade because we're not going to be able to downgrade to a older version if we don't have the supported config that was running in that version. So we want to make sure that before you upgrade to another version, perform a config backup in this old version and the previous versions. So you make sure that you, you have a backup running that is compatible with, in this case, 7.1 in case you need to roll back and it's actually telling us that so we're going to just click ok and that will make the palo alto execute the upgrade to a.0 okay very interesting it's actually telling us and this is good that it was shown on the actual video it's actually telling us that we cannot go to a.0 and the reason why we need some prerequisites before going on to the, this version in this case the content version of this particular firewall it's lower than 655 and we need to go to this version or higher. We're running 564. How do we do that? Very easy. Let's click close real quick. We're going to go here onto the NIMEC updates and we're going to refresh real quick and we'll see what we can download. Right now it's telling us that we have this content which is 8151. Let's go ahead and download it and apply it. And those are your application and thread everything that is the next generation of firewall features, those are the updates that you need to run prior to having the PA running in a code that is suitable to upgrade to 8.0. Finish the content update, definitely need to apply it. Okay, so I just applied the content, it has completed. Let's take a look and see if we have more updates to, to apply else we'll take a look and see if uh, we can apply the A.0 image. And yes, we sure have. We have now an antivirus. Let's go ahead and upgrade the antivirus and make sure that we have everything good for A.0. Okay, that's completed. Let me go ahead and install it real quick. Okay, has completed. Let's go ahead and uh, see if we finally are able to go to A.0. Okay, it seems to be that we have everything that we need. Uh, let me go ahead and trigger again and see if we're lucky to go to A.0. Let's go here. And looks like it. Alrighty, we're running the upgrade to A.0. We'll wait for this to be completed. And uh, it definitely will require a restart. And we'll see how that goes once we are ready to log in in PanOS A.0. Also, you want to plan your maintenance windows when it comes to upgrading the Palo Alto at least with an hour because it will require the download, it will require applying it and the restart. So, you know, you want to play it safe. It definitely will take like an hour to do the whole process and uh, make sure that you perform those backup configs before you execute any upgrade make sure that you do that beforehand and you back it up locally you export that to your local machine has applied the update now it's asking us to perform a firewall restart we're going to click yes and we'll wait until the palo alto reboots and we get the login screen once again we'll press yes now I'm just going to pause the video and when we're back, we should be running in A.0. Okay, so we can see that we just upgraded to A.0. You can tell by looking at the login page, it has changed from the colored login screen with the Palo Alto logo to the grayish Palo Alto logo. So I'm going to log in and we're going to go into a maintenance release and then we're going to go ahead and jump into A.1. Let me log in real quick.
Okay, we're logging on to the firewall. Let's take a look at the image that is currently running. Close, and sure enough, we're now running 8.00. Now we're going to go and apply a maintenance upgrade in the 8.0 base. And once we're done with that, we should be good to go into upgrading 8.1. Okay, so if you can see here, we are running 8.00, so we're currently running the base in 8.00. We came from 7.123. This is 8.00 that is currently running, and now we should have available 8.1. You remember in the beginning when we were running 7.1? We didn't have the option to go to A.1, but now because we're on A.0, we can definitely go into A.1. So let's go ahead and upgrade to the latest maintenance release for A.0. And once we're done, we'll just upgrade to A.1 and we should be good to go. Okay, so I wanted to bring back the slide. So we went from 7.1.0, we went to 7.1.23. So I'm just showing 7.1.19, but we went to 7.1.23. We now executed 8.0, so our firewall is running 8.0. We're going to apply the latest in PanOS 8.0. And once we're done, we'll just apply base. Again, this is not required. I'm showing you that you can apply you know, a maintenance on your base and go to the next available base, or you can go straight from 8.0 to 8.1. Let's go ahead and apply this step, and then we'll finalize our video with 8.1. Okay, like with 7.1.23, we want to uh, download this image. We'll just wait for this to complete. We'll install and we should be good to go. Okay, it's been saved into the software manager. Okay, has completed. So let's go ahead and apply 8.0.17. We'll wait for this to complete and it's obviously it's going to ask us to do a restart. Once we're done, we should be good to go and finalize our upgrade video to 8.1. Okay, and 8.0.17 has completed. So let's go ahead and reboot the device. We'll wait a couple of minutes and we should have the login screen back ready for us. And it seems that we completed. This one took a little bit more time, actually. You are not experiencing the time that it takes but it takes roughly like 10 minutes for the whole process to complete. So you gotta keep that in mind every time you upgrade. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, log in again. And we're logging in. We should be running that uh, maintenance release. So let's go ahead and take a look at the dashboard. Let's wait for this and, and sure, we're running A017. Okay, so our final upgrade, we're gonna go to A.1. Before we do that, remember, we're running A.0. We want to back up the config that is compatible with A.0 before going to A.1. The reason why, like we mentioned earlier, if we need to roll back to A.0, we have the configuration that is compatible with this OS. Once we upgrade, the Palo Alto will convert the running config into A.1 format. So if you're planning to roll back using the A.1 config, it's not going to work. So you've got to make sure that you perform a backup before going for a major uh, revision change. So let's go ahead and do that backup real quick. Device, setup, operations. We're gonna save the config, label it the same way, PA01, and in this case, A.0, and we're gonna put the, the date backed up. And now we're gonna export it to our local machine in case the storage on the Palo Alto suffers uh, some sort of corruption if we go up and it doesn't reboot and we need to format it uh, we have the config on our local machine so let's go ahead and export the config we save it and now we're good to go and upgrade so let's go ahead again to software and uh, let's download our base so we're going to go to a.1 now okay so let's wait for that to complete downloading we'll apply it and we'll basically perform the same procedure Okay, it has finished the upload onto the Palo Alto firewall. Let's go ahead and click install and see if uh, we get an error before proceeding. So obviously, like we mentioned, we performed the backup, so we should be good to go to upgrade to A.1. Press OK, and let's see if uh, we're lucky. And yes, we don't need to do any dynamic updates. We were able to go all the way to A.1. So we'll wait for this to complete, and uh, we'll restart the firewall, and we'll go from there. 
Okay, so it's asking us to do a reboot. We're gonna go ahead and perform that reboot and we should be running on A.1 once it completes. Okay, well, I'm gonna pause the video. We'll wait for this reboot to complete. Okay, and we're back in action we have our firewall running in a.1 let me go ahead and log in and confirm confirm now that we are running in a.1 okay dashboard it's loading and boom we are successfully running a.1.0 so you see the process we went and i can show you real quick here we went all this all complete software upgrade path we went from 711 to 713 Apply install. We went to 8.0 from 7.13. From 8.0, you can see here, we went to the maintenance release in 8.0, which was .17. And after I apply that, I downloaded 8.1 and I applied 8.1. So we went maintenance release to 8.1 base. So there you have it. As long as you make sure that you have your configs, uh, you back up the config on every single base image. So if you're running 7.1, you want to back up the config running in that version. You upgrade to 8.0, back up the config in 8.0, upgrade to 8.1, and you're good to go. In case you need to roll back, you have the configs in each older version. So you have the configs running in the older version in case you need to roll back too. Alrighty, that's upgrading your software and your Palo Alto file, everyone. In this video, we're going to take a look at how to manage the Palo Alto configs. We want to make sure that we have a rollback in case we made a change that disruptive or actually broke some communication on your network. We want to roll back. We need to know the process to do that in the Palo Alto firewall. We're also going to take a look at auditing. So. You want to make some changes and you want to know what's the difference between what's running, what is the intention or what will be changed once we commit the changes. We have two types of configs. We have the running config and we have the candidate config. The running config is the one that is active in production. So that's the active firewall config. This is what is currently running on the environment. And the candidate config is what whichever change you made onto the running config but has not been applied yet this is all the all the changes that you do on the palo alto they're not live changes you need to commit them in order for them to become running so a candidate configuration is a pre-commit config there's the configuration that you made the adjustments on the gui but you haven't committed you haven't made it a running config once you execute the running commit it will become the running config so you want to make sure the difference between those two Auditing on the actual commit window, we have the option to review what's going to be changed. Or for example, if someone logged in onto the Palo Alto, perform a change, but did not commit it, and you see that you have some pending changes to be committed, you want to make sure that before you make any additional change, you check what was modified. And that will definitely save you a trouble or a, an issue if, if for some reason someone decided to Eliminate something, but it turned back. They didn't go according, didn't want to actually execute that change, but they did not uncommit it or, you know, or revert the changes. If you apply or commit, you're actually applying whatever someone else left behind that they did not commit. So you want to make sure that you understand how to do an audit before you go ahead and implement any future changes. And then obviously the backups, that should be mandatory. You're performing the full backups. Or you can also save local config snapshots. So there's ways to save snapshots. You can save a name snapshot, meaning that you can put a name and it's going to be a custom labeled snapshot or config file. Or you can just save the running snapshot or the current config as a snapshot. Every time that you commit, it will add a snapshot to the config database. So we're going to take a look at that. And also we're going to take a look at restoring a backup. So you have a backup file. You have a snapshot that you want to revert back to in case you did something and you did an oops. Everyone does that. You want to make sure that you can restore. We're going to do that procedure on this demonstration. And also we're going to revert. So the difference between restore and revert is that we're restoring a file from a known saved config. So either you exported a name snapshot or you have a local snapshot on the firewall. You can restore to that image. 
Revert means that whatever I did on the Palo Alto that became the candidate config that we're just pending for it to be committed, we decided we no longer want to go with that change. We can revert that and the Palo Alto will not have anything pending to be committed and you save a future issue. If someone decides to log in and perform a com another commit and they didn't realize there was something pending, they can break stuff and we have no idea what, was, what happened because someone else decided not to revert whatever they were intending to config. So this is also very important. So, okay, so let's go ahead and uh, review all this. And uh, after this, you should have a very, very detailed idea of how do you manage the configs on your Palo Alto firewall. Okay, so once we log in, we're going to go into device and we're going to go on to setup and operations. And this is where we have the configuration management section on our Palo Alto firewall. We have the revert, which we can revert to either a safe config or we can revert to the previous running config. And I'm gonna show you the difference between those two. So say for example, we went onto policies and uh, oh, let's take this example. So we have some net rules and we decided we no longer need this one. We go ahead and click delete. What we just did is we just modified the running config and we created a candidate config. Right now, the running config has the net rule number four. So the rule that I just deleted, the running config still has it because this is not live, but the candidate config does not. So let's take a look at the commit session and we should be able to see what is the difference between the running config and the candidate config. We'll click on preview change and it's asking us how many lines of config do you want to present on the screen? And in this case, because I just deleted one line, I should not need to, you know, put 20 lines. So I'm just going to leave it at 10. And so what you can see here is what we were discussing. We have the running config, which is the active config. And the candidate config is the configuration that once we hit commit, it will modify the session that you see here colored or highlighted. If we can see right here, we have a legend. So anything that will be added, in case I will add a new object, I will see this in green. So it will show highlighted in green on the candidate config because we're adding it to the running config. This is already on the running config. And because we're deleting it on the candidate config, you're not going to see anything once we hit commit. So we're removing all this information from the running config. Modify if something did not actually got deleted or added. We're just making changes. For example, we modify the IP address on the same object which is this destination not rule, you're going to see a modify. You're going to see from this address label or highlighted in yellow to the new configuration and the candidate side. Because we just deleted that destination not not long ago, we see before running config, destination NAT, and then after candidate config, we don't have anything. So you are going to see what you're going to actually impact. So you got to make sure that you take a look at this before you apply a commit that you don't know why it was pending so you can tell that it was pending because this actually got enabled so if there's no pending changes to be committed you're going to see this grayed out and you cannot click it once there's a pending commit change you're going to see this enabled so you want to make sure that you do a preview change and confirm that you have that you're sure that you want to apply those changes change summary it basically tells you what has been changed, what will be modified on the actual change once you commit. And it shows you the difference between candidate and running. And finally, validate commit, what it's gonna say is going to check if it's valid. If there's an error, it's gonna tell you, I am not able to do because of this particular issue. So you gotta basically fix everything that is telling you to fix before you can commit the change. And it's actually telling us that the configuration is valid because there's nothing weird on the config that you need to modify. And then finally, you know, the commit. Okay, so what we want to do before we commit, because we, we just removed that object, I'm going to do a configuration backup. We first, we want to save the name config snapshot. The difference between save name config snapshot and save candidate is that this will be exported or we stored in a name file. So you're going to create a custom file and download it and then you can export that one. If you want to save the candidate config, it will not create a custom file. It will just save on the candidate config file, which is the default section on the PA that stores that data. 
Let's go ahead and do a config snapshot. And we're going to label this destination removal. So we are making a configuration backup before we actually apply the new changes. So let me go ahead and print that removal. We can add the date. And it has been saved. So we're going to export that config. And in order for you to export what we just saved onto your local machine, you're going to click export name configuration snapshot and we'll select it here. And this is our guy. This is the one that we want to export. We just did a save name configuration snapshot. Press OK. And now it's asking us to download it to our local machine. Now we're going to save the candidate config. OK. And then we're just going to have a snapshot, which is this is the default location of the candidate config. If we want to export that, we can also export it. How we do it, we'll just go into export name configuration snapshot and we'll just select the running config and this will basically have that you know the latest running config before we apply the changes let's go ahead and apply the changes we're going to press commit also you can see here so in case you have multiple admins the configuration changes are actually attached to the particular admin account that actually performed the changes so you might not, if you're using a custom login or your own username and password, you're not going to have the same commits that any other user might have. So that is something to prevent someone from applying a config that we're not intending to apply. So we just apply the config and now we have the running config without the for NAT rule that we just removed. And we want to go ahead and revert the changes that we did. One way of doing it, it's either applying the config snapshot of the pre change that we just did, or we import the name config. So let's go ahead and first import the name file that we just downloaded from the Palo Alto, and then we'll delete it and we'll do a config import, uh, a config snapshot import so you can see the difference. Okay, so we go into import. In this case, we want to uh, look for the file that we just backed up. Uh, we label a file with the date and uh, the changes that we did. So let's go ahead and uh, import that file. We'll click here and then you can click browse, point the Palo Alto to the file that you just backed up with the export. So let's go ahead and click browse. And we have our file. Our file is the pre DNAT removal and we're just going to double click and we're going to import it. Now we're actually applying the backup file that we just exported with our own name okay we have it at saved and we now want to load the file that we just imported so let's go ahead and load a name configuration snapshot and this is our file right here and we'll press ok and now we have the config being loaded so let's take a look so we know that it's been applied and uh, we should be good now we have that rule back in place by downloading and applying the last save config before we committed the changes. Okay, so now I'm going to do it again, but this time I am going to save a snapshot. We're going to delete and then we're going to revert using the snapshot that we just saved. So we're going to go ahead and device. We want to save the candidate config. And let's go ahead and uh, do a new file. Okay, so now we have it. Let's go ahead back onto policies and we're just going to delete another one. Let's delete this one. Okay. Let me go ahead and commit. Okay. Has completed. Now that we don't have that rule, we just deleted it. We realize that we need to roll back. Very simple. Let's go back onto the device and we're going to load the name config snapshot that we just saved not long ago. In this case, will be removal to snapshot. We'll press OK. And now it's telling me that it's being loaded. So let me take a look here. OK, so it has been loaded. Let's wait just a minute and uh, take a look again. And if you see here, our log tells us that we just deleted that rule, but we applied the snapshot, so we should have the rule back. Let's go out into policies. And sure enough, we have it already. So that is how you make sure that if you need to roll back, you have a process in place and you understand how to work with configurations on your Palo Alto file. Okay, everyone, in this video, we're going to take a look at the maintenance recovery tool on your Palo Alto firewall. 
uh, every Palo Alto firewall has a maintenance recovery tool. And this is a very important tool that you need to understand and you need to know how to get to it in order to perform a critical recovery procedure in case your firewall either is not able to boot up or you need to restore it from factory because somehow it got locked by a previous administrator and you have no access in order to, you know, to perform any changes and sadly you got to start all over again by restoring that administrator password. So we're going to show you how to do that, how to get into the recovery tool in order for you to perform that deep uh, hardware troubleshooting and factory reset or restore firewall to a previous image and such. Um, so like I'm showing here on the slide, we can format this. So in case your disk seems to not be writing correctly, it seems not to be booting correctly, you might need to start all over again and you need to do a format on the disk. You can also repair partitions. So if you have a specific partition that is not acting or behaving correctly, you can go ahead and trigger a partition repair on that particular partition and you can have different sets of partitions like the boot partition, the log partition, etc. Like I mentioned before, we can do a factory reset uh, in case you need to wipe out the configs or say, for example, you're you're selling that appliance, you don't want to have anything as far as configuration stored there, and you're going to hand that to someone else. You want to make sure that your firewall is completely clean and wiped from scratch. Nothing has been saved. Nothing is still there lingering as far as all configuration. So you can do fact resets. Uh, there's cases where you need to be involved with Palo Alto TAC and they might request you to take error logs out of the uh, appliance and we also can do that review so we can take a look at those uh, event logs and see what's going on as far as a hardware perspective goes or from a hardware standpoint we can identify if an issue is happening and palo alto tac will definitely request you to export those configs and we might not have access onto the gui so this is the tool that you're going to be using you're going to be booting up the Palo Alto and then entering into maintenance mode. So we're going to review that. And also we can do a rollback of the config or the panel as image. So in case your new image is not able to boot, you can roll back to a previous image that was stored on the firewall. Okay. So it's very straightforward. The way that you go onto the maintenance mode, you got to be console um, serial. So you plug your serial console cable and then you boot up your firewall and then you're going to be prompted to enter into maintenance mode. And you have five seconds in order for you to type the main M A I N T word, press enter, and you should be able to get into the screen where it's going to ask you, do you want to continue booting normally? And in that case, you select the sysroot, uh, that's your normal boot uh, partition, or you want to get into the maintenance mode. And we're going to take a look at that, and we're going to go and select maintenance mode. And if everything went well, you should be presented with the maintenance recovery tool screen. So you're going to see the menu and all the options that you have in order for you to do some troubleshooting or recovery procedures. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, let's get into the maintenance mode on a Palo Alto firewall. Let's uh, take a tour and see how that goes. Okay, for this demonstration, I have my virtual Palo Alto and I am running a console onto it. So I'm gonna go ahead and perform a restart of the unit and we're gonna get into maintenance mode. So let me go ahead and press here. So we're gonna request restart of the system. We'll press enter, it's asking us, do you want to restart? We're gonna say yes and here we go. Now this is going to take like a roughly, I would say like a minute or like two minutes in order for us to get to that section. We're asked to type maintenance mode. So we're just going to wait for this and we'll come back. Okay. And we're presented with the menu that I was showing. We need to type very quick, press enter and we're in maintenance mode. So you saw, I just typed M A I N T and I got into the maintenance mode screen and now we can select if either we want to continue going onto the sys root, which is basically the default boot partition, or we want to enter into maintenance mode. We also have the maintenance other. In our case, we just need to select maintenance and uh, we're in the maintenance recovery tool. Press enter and we'll just wait now into this boot process and we should be into maintenance mode. Okay, and we're inside our maintenance mode and it's asking us to press enter to continue. We're going to press enter and voila, we're inside maintenance mode on this particular firewall. So let's take a look at what we have here available. 
we can select the first option is to entry a specific you know a request why we went into maintenance mode as uh we're not gonna do much with that system info we can get information from the current firewall the management ip so of the management interface we have our management ip is going to tell us also hey you're running this particular content version uh you're running the panel s a that one uh etc so you're going to get very general information about your firewall go back factory reset okay so if you need to wipe out the config out of the firewall you want to start from zero or in case you're handing that your decommission in this particular appliance, you can go ahead and perform a factory reset, which is just going to ask you what image do you want to go back into? If you have multiple images stored on this particular unit, you're going to be offered which image do you want to factory reset to? And it's going to wipe out everything and it's going to go and select and reinstall that particular image because we only have one A10. We're basically just uh, using this one. And if you press factory reset, everything will go if you see here we'll remove all logs all configuration from your unit and it's just going to go back in day zero anything nothing is configured and then you can start configuring everything from scratch okay let's go back go ahead okay okay very important so if we want to perform some repair actions on particular partitions inside your firewall you can get into the sck which is the disk check for this particular Palo Alto unit. So we can select what partition do you want to fix or you want to attempt to do some fixing and checking and just select if I want to select this one in particular, I'll press enter. If I want to select the primary boot partition, which is sys root, I can just select this one. I want to fix the pan config partition or my secondary partition in the unit, I can do so. And it's asking us, do you want to force fixing? And you can say yes, and then you can press enter and um, you're starting your partition repair. Okay, it's very straightforward. It's very useful. So in case your unit might not uh, boot up properly or in case your unit was not gracefully shut down, you might need to run a disk check and this is a great way to go ahead and do it log files so do you want to see log files on this particular unit you can select which type of logs files do you want to export in my case i have a base log repository on this unit which points to the sys root zero and this is the complete path in the linux distro that runs this particular firewall so you have all the logs that you have on the unit can take a look at the DACP client daemon or DACP client service inside the firewall and you can see uh, real-time logs on this particular unit okay and if for example you're inside the particular log and you want to go out this is basically VIM so you need to press uh, colon and Q and you're out okay so say for example we want to take a look at the HA agent log and there you go this is the system log for the HA service so this is going to show you if there's an issue on a hardware level on this particular box and you can export that information for PAC if you need to provide that information too so we're going to go ahead and uh, exit here and such so you have it it's uh, very powerful so in case your firewall is not able to boot and Palo Alto is asking you for those logs information you can export them from here press cancel real quick and I can also select in a repository to get that information sent to so if i have a, a particular tftp or scp server if you're doing win scp or a tftp server that you can point that to you can go ahead and export that particular logs from the maintenance menu and it basically uses the management interface to do that transfer so you got to make sure that the management interface is, is connected and is alive on the network so you can point the tftp transfer to okay so let's go back this image so if you have specific images on this uh, Palo Alto, you can select to either reinstall either one of them. So if you need to roll back into another image, you can do it from this particular menu here. Also, if you have a multiple running configs stored on the Palo Alto, because this is a new uh, VM that I just spun up for this demonstration, I don't have any running configs, but if you have multiple running configs that were stored as you know snapshots, you can select either one of them, press enter, and you can roll back to that particular one. Same with content rollback. If we had multiple updates of your content update inside the dynamic updates on the particular Palo Alto, 
you can select revert in case uh, you need to do so. IP address, I can change the management IP address from the maintenance recovery tool as well. I can run diagnostics if I want to. So in case I need to perform some deep troubleshooting or TAC is asking you to do some deep dive troubleshooting, they're basically gonna ask you to get into the maintenance recovery tool and execute those diagnostics. And finally, we can do a reboot. So you can see it has everything that you need as far as um, first tool in case of an emergency situation where your Palo Alto is not able to boot or you need to factory reset the complete firewall, you need to roll back to a old image, you need to roll back your upgrade and you can do it from here. So it's very, very important for you to understand and get familiar with this. And again, it's a matter of booting up the firewall. You're gonna get into that problem that's asking you, hey, type main in order for you to get to the maintenance recovery tool, press enter and you should be good to go. Hey everyone, in this video, we're gonna be exploring Panorama. And Panorama, it's Palo Alto's central firewall management platform. You have a bunch of firewalls across your entire site or across your entire organization, meaning you have site A, site B, site C, you have an office in New York, an office in Japan, an office anywhere in the world and you want to have consistency across all your firewalls, meaning that every single policy needs to be replicated across your entire organization. So every site needs to have the same policy and rules in place to be compliant with your security standard. So this is where Panorama comes into play. So Panorama, you basically add all those firewalls, all those devices onto the Panorama appliance or VM, and you can push policies across the board by just setting up one single policy and then you classify all those devices into a group and then apply the policy to every single device onto the group. So you're applying the policy into the device group and any member of that group will get the configuration. So the Panorama will basically manage your whole Palo Alto infrastructure from a single pane of glass. So you create a single address object and if you want to have that address object replicated into all the devices inside a particular device group, and we're going to discuss device group during this presentation, they're all going to get the config. So instead of going to every single individual Palo Alto making change, by just applying it through Panorama, Panorama will take care of uh, configuration committing across all your Palo Altos. Also, like we mentioned, we want to make sure that the policies are consistent we want to have the same rules across all your firewall environments. So you want to make sure that the firewalls are compliant with your security best practice in your organization. We can also trigger updates. So if we want to have all firewalls updated via Panorama, so we want to make sure that all firewalls are up to date on the same code, we can do it through Panorama. So it will be a global upgrade across your entire organization. And finally, but it's very useful to have a central monitoring all your Palo Alto firewalls. Because imagine if you need to, if you work with a security operation center and you have, you're managing multiple Palo Alto instances, you're not gonna have a particular session to every single firewall in order for you to see the monitoring and monitor traffic activity. You want to make sure that you have everything on one single pane of glass. And this is a great tool, or I would say this is a must tool, if you have a Palo Alto environment where it's composed of a lot of Palo Altos, you definitely need to have a central management platform. And Panorama basically gives that easeability, you know, making sure that your environment is consistent. Also, with Panorama, you can have a central policy table. So you have all your policies across site A, site B, site D, the same. So you know that any user that goes to any site on your organization, they're going to be enforced with the same policies across the board. We're not changing anything. Also, if you want to make sure that all your sites are mirrored from one particular master unit, or in this case, you have a Palo Alto, usually it's on the headquarters, so on your headquarters, that headquarter will be your master device. Every site will have a copy or it will basically mirror the configurations from the master. And you can select this on Panorama. You can basically say, okay, so I have the headquarters uh, Palo Alto firewall. I want to make sure that all my sites are the same. And this is where you select that master device. And then anything that is configured on that master device can be replicated to the other ones. Okay, let's take a look at our scenario. It's very straightforward. You have here a central panorama server or a central panorama appliance and it's running on the cloud and you can select any uh, cloud provider, uh, AWS, Azure, etc. We have our main site and this is this circle in yellow, which is in USA. We have an office in New York. We have two firewalls in this New York office. We also have a San Jose location, which is our headquarters. So we have a master firewall and we were talking about that 
a master device that it's going to be mirror across all the other units. So we also have an Italy location and we have two offices and it's on Milan. So in Milan we have office one and we also have another office in Milan, office two. So we have one firewall in office one, one firewall in office two. Same with New York, one firewall office one, one firewall office two. And finally, on the United Emirates, we have our Dubai location, and we have two offices in Dubai with one firewall on each office. And we want to make sure that if we make a change here, we have the same consistency across all the other Palo Altos. You don't want to log in to every single Palo Alto and make a simple config change, right? So you want to make sure that by just committing it on a central appliance, you can have consistency across the board. So if you make an address object, it's going to have the same address object everywhere on your organization. So all the Palo Altos will have the same address object configured. This is why it's very powerful. You definitely need to have this type of solution if you have an environment like this. You're not going to be logging in to every single firewall if you just make an address object and you're going to make a policy that is basically going to be the same across the board. There's going to be a lot of work involved and you might be forgetting about configuring something in a specific location. So this is where Panorama comes into place. You can have everything consistent from site A all the way to site C. And this is what we're going to see. We're going to see device group. And you can see here, I basically classified a country as a device group, and inside the country, I have two cities. I have the New York City and San Jose. Those can also be considered device groups. So I can have a New York device group, meaning that I want to have a policy applied to the USA. So I want to make a change in the USA, but only is going to be in the New York. So I don't want to apply a change to the USA, and then it hits the San Jose headquarters. You want to limit also the surface of where your changes are applied. And this is where device groups come into play. Let's take a look at uh, Panorama and let's configure those device group and let's do some exploring and uh, we'll go from there. Okay, so once logged in onto the Panorama unit, and in this case I am running a virtual Panorama box, just FYI, I am not running a license unit, meaning that I cannot add devices. In this demonstration, I'm going to show you how to do those device groups and it's a matter of adding every single Palo Alto onto the specific ones. So let's go ahead and uh, click on Panorama. So you can see here, this is a dashboard. It's pretty much the same as the Palo Alto itself. Only difference is it's going to involve configuring device groups, and then you should have the option to add policies and objects and such. So let's go ahead and uh, once we're inside the Panorama tab, uh, you're going to be presented with basically the same thing as the firewalls themselves. The only difference is you're going to see some sections that you're not going to see in the Palo Alto, which in this case is everything that is managed. It relates to the group of devices that you're going to be managing on your organization. So the first thing you got to do in Panorama is to add devices. So under the Manage Devices section, this is where you're going to be presented with the option to add individual firewalls. And the way that you do it is by adding a serial number. So if you want to know where that firewall serial number is, you, in this case, I have one that is licensed. So there's the serial number. So you go onto the dashboard, you log into a particular unit and grab the serial number out of the dashboard. That is a very easy way to get your serial number out of the general information uh, widget. We can grab the serial number and then you just copy it. Let's go ahead and copy it real quick and click here. You go and paste. And once you would press OK, we should have the device added. As long as the unit is able to talk outside and it can reach those firewalls, we should be good to go. But like I said, I am not going to be able because I am not licensed. So it's going to tell me that I am not able to add the unit. But that will not stop us from showing this demonstration. Let's go ahead and create those device groups like we mentioned before. So let's go ahead and click Add. We're going to start by creating the USA. So we're going to make the country device groups. Inside the country, we're going to add city device groups, and then finally the office itself. So let's go ahead and create the first one, which is going to be USA. And then you can add specific filters based on what you're looking for. In our case, we're just going to make the device group and we'll press OK. And by the way, all the panorama will have a share parent group. So the share parent group is like the root group. So if you apply something to the share, it actually applies to everything below it. And you're going to see this in a bit. 
Also, master device. This is where we select that firewall that's going to become the master device that every single site will replicate, will mirror the configuration. So it will take a look at what the master has, and then it's just going to replicate based on the settings that the master device has. So let me go ahead and uh, configure my country below the share group. So the parent device of this country will be shared. So everything inside share applies to everything. We'll press OK. And now you can see that we have share and inside share we got USA. And then let's go ahead and configure those two other countries. Press OK here. And you can see I did not choose share. And now we actually fall inside the USA group. We don't want that. We want to make sure that this is a country. It's not actually under the USA. So let's uh, click back. Let's change this to share. Press OK. And now we should have the right structure. Let's go ahead and add the final one, which is a United Emirates. We'll press OK and again, make sure that it's under share because that's the global group. And boom, we have our three countries under device groups. Now we need to add the individual cities on each country. So let's go ahead and select USA and we're going to click Add. I'm going to say San Jose and we'll press OK. So now we have San Jose under USA. Same with New York. We got to add New York now. And then we'll make sure that it's under USA, not under San Jose. So let me select USA. And now New York and San Jose falls under USA. Let's do the same thing with Italy and the United Arab Emirates. Let's click Italy. And we mentioned that we have Milan. And we'll press OK. Now we have Milan. Finally, the Arab Emirates. And we're going to create the Dubai group. And there you go. Now we have countries and cities under the share. So if I apply it something under share, it actually applies to everything that is below that. You gotta make sure that you know where you're applying the configurations to. Okay, so finally we have two sites in Milan. So we want to make sure that we can apply individually or as a group. So we need to create another device group and only add that particular office. So we're gonna say Milan Office 1 and then it falls under Milan. So now we got Office 1. And let's add Milan Office 2. Okay, we'll press OK. Now we got the two offices. And now we can basically select either if New York, we have two offices in New York, we can do the same thing here. Let me go ahead and create those offices. Now we got Office 1 and we got Office 2. And then make sure that it falls under New York. And now we got the offices in New York. Uh, San Jose, because it's a single file, it's a single office. We don't need to make it an office here. Dubai, we also have two offices in Dubai, so let's make sure we add both offices. And then we're going to say, and then we can also select the last one, which is going to be Office 2. Okay, and now we got both offices on Dubai. We got both offices on Milan, and we got both offices in New York, which belongs to the USA New York and we got Office 1 and Office 2 and we got the headquarters. We also have Dubai which belongs to the United Emirates and finally Milan which belongs to Italy and the two offices. So the purpose of this is to have each firewall belonging to each site added to this device group. So once we add those devices here we can then go into the device group and add them associate them to the specific device so to the specific device group. So once we do that we can apply policies globally, or we can apply policies per site. And this is why it's very powerful to make sure that we have this structure like this. And then finally, in San Jose, if we had a device, we can add San Jose as the headquarters. So you can see here under San Jose, I can grab a master device. So if I were to add a device under the summary tab, we can select the San Jose to be the master device that every single site will replicate to. And then once we have it here, we can also Grab in USA, and we'll say here also the master device will be San Jose across the board on all the device groups. Okay, so once we have that, now you saw that once I configure that, I got the two tabs that were not showing before, now they're showing. Now I can configure policies that are going to be applied across my entire organization. So if I click shared, it throws the policies across my units, all my sites. If I want to apply policies on Italy, so it only applies to Italy on my Italy firewalls, then I can do it from here. If I want to apply a policy on Milan, on this particular office, I can do it. And you see the idea. This is the structure that you want to have. You want to make sure that you have 
a structure where you can be very granular. So if I want to make sure that I want to make a change only in the USA, but I want to apply this change only in New York, I can then select this particular office and then add the policy. So if once I have a policy here, I can go ahead and add it. So let me go ahead and do a quick policy. And by the way, I'm going to show you real quick. So we have pre and post rules and default rules. Okay. So pre rules as are usually the rules that you are allowing stuff and they're going to be falling on top. On the top, if you see here on this particular icon, let me go ahead and zoom in a little bit so I can show you. Okay, let me scroll this down. Okay, so you see here on this icon, you see highlighted in green, and it shows the first two as the enable ones. So those are the pre rules. They're usually the allow rules. And then post rules are actually the, the nights. And then default rules are the rules that come with the Palo Alto uh, by default. So usually you want to make sure that you select the hierarchy of the policy. So if you want to make a deny rule, they usually fall on the post rules because they're going to fall below, but first allow anything on top. So you want to allow a specific traffic, but then deny everything else in the post side. Same with that, same with QoS. So everything that it's allowed and denied, it's added on top or on bottom. So let me go ahead real quick and we're going to make a uh, configuration on Italy. Let's do it even more simple. Let's go ahead and in Italy, I want to create an address. And this is an address that only belongs to Italy. So there's no point to add the address object onto any other side because it only applies to Italy. We got a subnet over there. And this subnet, it only applies to Italy. So there's no point to throw this across all my firewalls because this subnet is only relevant in Italy. And now I am going to make another change, but in this case, I'm going to add the Dubai subnet. So we're going to say Dubai, and then we're going to say, uh, this type 10, 20, 0, 0, 24. And this is Dubai subnet one. The thing is you want to make sure that it only applies to office one, because this is the Dubai for office one, but check this out. You see what happens? Now, because I actually applied it on global on the country, it actually applies to all my offices. So I'm going to have the same object across all my offices because I added that inside the United Arab Emirates device group. So it applies everything below it. So you want to make sure that if you're applying something that only applies to a specific office, you don't want any other office to have the same object. You then create this object on this particular device group. So let's do the object for office two. And you're going to see that it only applies to Office 2 and nothing else. Okay. And then we're just going to type here that IP. We'll press OK. And now we have the Dubai Subnet Office. But you can see it's only applying to the location of Office 2. It's not going to be global. So I'm not going to have this in the United Emirates Global Device Group. Nor I'm going to have it in any other country group. So. If I go onto Office 1, there you go. I don't see that object because it only applies to this particular location. That's why you want to have this particular structure so you're granular when you're applying changes. But I want to have a policy that is applied to every single firewall. So we want to go into Share. Share, everything below it will be applied globally. So I'm going to say Global internet policy okay i'm going to say source and i don't have any source i'm just gonna for this demonstration i'm just gonna do any any destination in this case any any you know what we want to make sure that you have that particular destination marked in but in this case i'm just gonna do any any so it's better off to do any any applications any service and i'm gonna say 445 so let's say i don't want to allow 445 to talk outside so I'm going to say TCP and we're going to say 445 and I'm going to press OK and now 445 actions and we're going to block it target and I can target to any device or I can target to a specific device group, right? So if I want to target to a specific device group, I can apply it to a specific device group and we're going to press OK and this applies everywhere. So everything that is below my shared group this policy will be applied to so everything will be applied to this particular group press commit and then i can commit to panorama okay so if i commit to panorama i'm not actually pushing the config to the devices i'm just saving it in panorama and then i can push it to the device 
Or I can do both. I can say, well, push it to Panorama, but also push it to the devices. I'm going to commit to Panorama. And it's actually showing me all the changes that I made. So I made those device groups. And I also created an object. And then I'm just going to apply it to Panorama. We'll press commit. And now it's going to be applied to Panorama. Okay, and that's completed. And right now, because I am selecting my shared device group, it actually applies to every single country. So you see how powerful the panorama is. So I can basically apply a global change across the board, or I can apply it to a specific region. So in Italy, you can see now that I have a global policy because I apply that in the share group. So if I go to any office, I should have the same policy because this is applied globally. If I select share group, whatever I configure here applies across all my sites. So you see how powerful that is? But say we want to apply it to a specific site and not everywhere. For that, we just need to select the specific device group. In this case, I want to, into the URI Emirates, I want to apply a policy. We're just going to click Add. And then I can create the policy and apply it to the particular site. And then we can say Dubai or UAE. And then we can say Source. We're just going to keep it the same way. I'm going to say allow. And now we have the internet for the United Arab Emirates. I'm going to say commit. And we should be good to go. Now I can have a specific policy applying only to the United Arab Emirates, but then everyone else will not have the same policy. So if I go back onto Italy, I should not have the policy. There you go. If I go to the USA, I don't have the policy. I only am applying the policy to the United Arab Emirates. And this is why it's very powerful. And it's something you definitely need to have if you have multiple sites. And you want to make sure that all Palo Altos are consistent. And so there you have it. Also monitor. So if you want to monitor a specific device group, I can go ahead and select that particular country. And I can see anything that's related to this particular site. If I want to go to a specific office, I don't want to see across my entire uh, region. I just want to see a specific office. I can then select. I can be very granular with it. So you want to make sure that you create this structure and you should be good to go to do a proper management. Same with the USA. If I want to see traffic only related to the USA, I can grab it there. And there you have it. So it's basically configuring step one, add your devices to Panorama. Step two, create your device group structure. So this is very important. So the hierarchy of your organization must be also detailed on this section and then start applying policies and pushing configs. And then there you have it. So if you want to see a context, so in this case, you want to see the dashboard related to Panorama, you can then filter to specific attributes inside Panorama. So anything that's configured, and you want to make sure that you don't see a bunch of stuff, you only want to see specific configurations, then you can filter in and out in, in this particular context. And then you have it. So also, if you want to do device deployment, so if you want to do upgrades, I can select specific sites where I want to do that upgrade. So I can say, well, I want to upgrade to a 110, but only in Italy as our first site. I want to make sure that it's stable before I move on onto my other sites. I can then select an upgrade per site. So it's very powerful. Again, as a summary, this is very powerful. It allows you to fully manage your entire infrastructure with a single pane of glass. So you can see it here. I am basically managing three countries and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven firewalls at the same time by just point and click. So there you have it, Panorama. There's a lot more to learn from it. I want to make sure that you're familiar with Panorama in case you need to deploy it. And it's very straightforward. Once you create that device group uh, structure, you add your devices and you start configuring across the board and you should be good to go. Well, we have reached the end of our video.